A woman mysteriously disappeared from her own home and her friends decided to go to the police. At first, it looked as if she herself had gone somewhere. But with each new clue, the case became more and more creepy. Eventually, investigators were able to uncover the mystery and the truth turned out to be quite frightening. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. In New York City, Mindy Schloss was born in 1955. She relocated to Alaska when she was 25 and attended a local medical school there before earning her degree. After receiving a degree in psychiatry, the woman accepted a position as a nurse at Fairbanks Hospital. Many patients in Alaska's remote areas were unable to travel to the hospital on their own, so Mindy and her co-workers would use all available means of transportation, such as boats and airplanes, to reach them even though the majority of the time she had to work in the field. She was passionate about her work and gave it her all. Mindy resided roughly 600 kilometers away from the Anchorage hospital. She flew to work, spent the week at a hotel, and returned home on the weekends in August of that year. Mindy, 52 years old at the time, flew back to work after spending the weekend in Anchorage. She regularly requested her best friend Jerry to drop by her house during her absence to feed her cat and give him the medication he required. Her friend called her on Saturday, August 4, to discuss the situation, but Mindy didn't pick up. It seemed odd that she still hadn't been able to reach her all day, so Jerry called a mutual acquaintance who also hadn't reached Mindy all day. Jerry initially believed Mindy had left. She claimed to be away for work, but the next day she remained silent. When no one opened the door when her buddy's friend drove to her house, Jerry used her spare key. At first inspection, everything appeared to be in order. The house was clean, and there were no indications of a struggle or any other negative events involving Mindy. Only after leaving did the jurors notice anything odd. The front door's doorknob was loose, so the woman had used the screwdriver to tighten the screws. She then left and went to work. Jerry called the hospital where Mindy worked on Monday, August 6th, after learning where her companion had vanished to. She never showed up for work, which was extremely out of character for her, and she didn't call any of her co-workers to let them know she wasn't going to be there. All of this suggested that the woman may have experienced something, so Jerry chose to call the police. When Jerry and the investigator visited Mindy's residence once more after the police had taken a complaint of a missing person, they were unable to find any evidence of a break-in. Nothing of value was also gone from the premises, ruling out the likelihood that a burglar had entered the woman's residence. Some of the prescriptions Mindy kept at home were those that required a prescription from a doctor. They were in high demand among drug addicts, so any burglar would have most certainly taken them. When they got into the garage, they saw that Mindy's car was gone. It was also highly odd that the woman only used her car to move around town and always took a cab to the airport. The detectives came to the conclusion that the woman had experienced something quite awful. A forensic team searched the home for any hints, but they came up empty-handed. The hypothesis of a kidnapping was improbable. The police believed that Mindy may have been in an accident. She frequently traveled through rural areas where the terrain was rather hazardous. People can have gone from a cliff unintentionally or became prey to wild animals. However, the authorities were not any closer to solving the crime as a result of this argument. Decided to start looking for people who, in theory, might be connected to her disappearance. They started by checking on the acquaintance of Bob Mindy and Jerry. The police were able to immediately ascertain that the man was working far from the woman's home on the day of her disappearance because to the man's want to assist with the investigation. The cops were unsure about the precise time that Mindy vanished. Since Saturday, the woman has been in touch. Experts examined her computer and found that the at 1.30 a.m., she used it for the last time. Police decided to ask the public for assistance later that day because they had no strong leads. They sent the missing woman's information to local TV stations and plastered leaflets regarding her whereabouts across the community. The following day, they started getting calls from witnesses, but the most of the leads were dead ends. People claimed to have seen Mindy in numerous locations, including in other states. These leads were never of any use. In the meantime, Bob and his co-workers made the decision to search the region where Mindy may have. The detectives tried a different approach and contacted the bank the woman used. 
They asked them to check to see if there had been any activity on her cards in recent days, and this is where a serious lead finally awaited them early Sunday morning, the day after Mindy went missing. Someone had withdrawn $500 from her debit card, the maximum amount allowed, and she had been out in the country quite frequently for berries or just out for a walk. Unfortunately, the search also produced no results. The bank's ATM video footage was promptly seized by the authorities who discovered a terrible scene. It turned out that an unidentified individual had taken the money out. They were unable to recognize him because of the scarf covering his face. Only until his face was hidden from the camera's view did he remove the bandana. The only option left to the cops was to wait until the man attempted to use some one person's card. The cops received another tip in the meanwhile. They discovered through Mindy's co-workers that she was preparing to, to remodel her house and had at one time employed employees. She and their boss had a disagreement on the reason for the work. Later, Mindy confessed to her co-workers that she was scared of him since he behaved suspiciously when he came to her house. Police checked on the man, but it turned out that he had a plausible explanation for why the woman vanished on that particular day. Another employee who visited her home on Friday about 7 p.m. was also questioned. The man was also uninvolved and he had no memory of anything already happening that evening. Within a short period of time, detectives had a the 500 charge on Mindy's card occurred again early in the morning, but this time from a different ATM, according to a new lead bank security report. The cops knew it was the same individual after reviewing the security camera, but there was something strange on the recording. The man took the cash out and walked away, but he soon went back to the ATM pushing buttons as he moved around it. He eventually left once more. After contacting the bank detectives, they learned what was causing his odd behavior. This time, the police managed to find a witness who drove up to the exact same ATM when an unidentified man came out of there, according to the witness. He got on his bicycle and rode away. It was a significant lead since most people don't remember the ATM taking the card away to prevent the theft. The real owner can get it back by going to the bank with his ID. Of course, this was not an option for the criminal, so he lost access to Minnie's account forever. This time, the police managed to find a witness. Detectives chose to interrogate everyone in the Mindy area because the available information was still insufficient to draw them closer to a clue. They inquired about any peculiar occurrences or suggested any suspect neighbors. Unexpectedly, a number of locals named a house that was close to Mindy's home. They claimed that there were always celebrations there. The locals were constantly making noise and upsetting the peace. The detectives got there and discovered that there were quite a few residents, but they were unwilling to speak with the detectives. A woman who lived just across the street from the house was the next place the detectives went. She claimed that she did not notice anything odd, but it was clear from the way she was acting that she was quite tense. The woman called the police station the following day and begged the detectives to meet, but not at her home. They met elsewhere and the woman told them a spooky tale. A man who lived across the street paid the detectives a visit not long before that. He claimed that police were patrolling the area and requested that she not let them know that he lived here. She heard someone strolling on her porch when she asked why he claimed to be on parole and did not want the police to know where he was at night. She noticed he was the same man when she peered out the window he walked around, peered into a few windows, and then walked away. Because she was so terrified, the woman made the decision to call the police. Josh Wayne, who was 27 years old at the time, was his name, according to the detectives. When they put him through the database, they discovered that he had been found guilty of murder. He had been suspected of killing a woman by beating her seven years prior, but a jury had found him not guilty. Josh spent three years in jail before being charged with tampering with evidence and given a six and a half year prison term. He was let go. He was immediately recognized as a key suspect by early detectives. When authorities started looking for Josh, they learned from his housemates that he didn't own a car and primarily traveled by bicycle. However, there was just one issue. Man has vanished. Without a trace on Thursday, August 9th, Police received a call from a local trucker who claimed to have seen Mindy's car in a parking lot close to the airport, giving them an unexpected new lead. He instantly recognized the automobile after seeing its photo in the newspapers. When detectives arrived on the site, they were able to verify that the car was actually Mindy's. 
They also observed that a nearby building had a surveillance camera directed at the parking lot, so they asked for a recording. It displayed a man operating this vehicle into on August 4 at 12.30 p.m. He exited the parking lot and appeared to wipe off his fingerprints by wiping down the door handle. Regrettably, the clarity of the camera prevented use from seeing his face. Although it took some time to analyze the samples and there was no assurance they would be helpful in the case, CSI was able to recover some samples while searching the car for prints or signs of DNA. Mindy's purse was on the passenger seat, which might have been a sign that she had been in the car with the offender, alive or dead. Using cutting-edge analysis technologies, they are now obtaining the desired outcomes. A search dog strategy was chosen by the detectives. Since Mindy had been missing for a week, few people thought this concept would work, but they had run out of ideas and turned to filming dogs. The service both Mindy's car and the ATMs, where the unidentified man had withdrawn cash, were visited by the dog. Three streets away, at the woman's house, the dog followed the route and started walking down the street. She smelled the front door and went straight to the residence that Josh Wayne had formerly occupied. When the service dog pointed straight to the fact that Josh was in Mindy's car close to her house and those ATMs, the detectives, who up until that moment had not believed in the search dog concept, were taken aback. The exercise was repeated the next day by the police with a different search dog. The outcome was the same. The dogs made it to Josh's house after walking the entire distance. The detectives chose not to waste their time investigating, even if it was not unqualified proof that would be accepted in court. They proceeded to the suspect's home after obtaining a warrant for his arrest. But the man hadn't been there for days. After inspecting the building, they discovered the jacket that the mysterious man had been seen wearing on the security cameras by the ATMs. A cash withdrawal slip from Mindy's card was also discovered in the jacket's pocket. They then came across a woman's gold watch and showed it to Jerry right away. The watch belonged to Mindy, the woman said. In order to compare the DNA samples discovered on the, the tests from items from Mundy's home matched, proving that Josh had been in the automobile that belonged to the missing woman. The police were concentrated on apprehending the culprit because the evidence was already significantly more serious. His name was on flyers that were distributed around the city, and they even rented a number of billboards. Detectives said that it was one of the biggest manhunts ever conducted in Alaska. Nearly all law enforcement agencies were involved in the investigation, and at one point locals reported any questionable material. Point after the police revealed ATM camera images, Lisa, a lady, approached them almost immediately. She claimed she had previously seen Josh and was certain he was the person in the picture. The fact that the police did not identify the primary suspect is what matters most in this instance, but what happened next is what made the case turn. Josh's second friend turned up at the police station with a confession. She had been driving him about town for the previous week to assist him get around. He left his bag in the back seat one day, and the teenager and her mother peered inside, where they discovered a phone in the gallery and several more ATM receipts. They also discovered a picture in which Josh is allegedly brandishing a gun for the police. Detectives were already concerned that the suspect may attack someone else while they were looking for him, and now that they knew his phone was also armed, their concerns were only raised. The officers pleaded with Josh's girlfriend to go with them and meet them with a tape recorder so they could record Josh. They would try to persuade him to discuss what he had done to Mindy, but the girl was too terrified and soon refused. She was compelled to participate despite her will nevertheless. On September 2nd, Josh showed up at her house and started yelling at her to give him her backpack. She had to quickly come up with an explanation after realizing she didn't have the backpack since the young woman had delivered it to the police. The young woman declined Josh's request to be taken somewhere far from here where he could escape the cops. She offered to let him remain at her house, but Josh fled since he felt uneasy. She decided to follow him covertly in her car and call the detectives along the way after realizing that she would now be safe until the cops caught the man. Josh eventually arrived at the residence of his friend and entered. Police SWAT and the FBI had already started to arrive on the area by that point. Everyone was concerned that the suspect would not give himself up without a fight, and utilizing force, those concerns came true. Josh held two persons hostage who were also there in the home. 
but after several hours of negotiation, a lawyer was able to persuade Josh to let up. He rarely spoke to the authorities during the interview, but the detectives were slow to accuse him of killing Mindy. Josh was only charged with swiping Mindy's bank card because at that point, they already believed the woman was most likely dead, but they couldn't prove it without her body. As a result, the FBI agent decided to get crafty. He recounted the accusations made against Josh and said they were all false. When Mindy went to the police to report the card theft, the investigator said that they had evidence that he was the one who had taken the money from someone else's card. The suspect became upset when he heard this and questioned what games they were trying to play with him. The FBI agent was ultimately persuaded by Josh's response that Mindy had been murdered, but the police still needed to locate Mindy's body in order to accuse Josh of the crime. They had no possibility of locating Mindy's remains if they became buried in the snow because it had started snowing early in that region. About a hundred miles away from Anchorage, in the vicinity of the town of Wasila, an electrician called the police on September 13th. He saw a woman's body in a wooded area and knew it was Mindy at once. The lab's experts verified that the deceased was in fact Mindy. The woman had been shot in the back of the head according to the medical assessment, and her body had been burned to death. When the bullet was found, it was discovered that Josh had been captured using the same firearm that had fired the shot. The only thing left for the cops to do was to reconstruct the sequence of events that resulted in Mindy's demise. The specialists continued to search every square inch of her home for signs of Josh's presence in the interim. It was incredibly challenging to perform, they had to gather almost every hair from Mindy's home's floor and test it in the lab. Months passed, but ultimately was successful in locating a hair that belonged to Josh. The detectives now had concrete evidence that the suspect was present in the victim's home on May 18, 2008, ten months after the murder, thanks to DNA tests that had proved this. Josh's ex-girlfriend Lisa, who had recognized him from a picture of him next to an ATM, declined to appear in court which created an unusual situation as the prosecution gathered witnesses to testify against Josh. She frequently visited her ex-boyfriend incarcerated, and the duo once declared their investigators were surprised by this turn of events because they had intended to help Mary, but they soon recognized what was going on. Family members are not allowed to testify against one another under the U.S. Constitution, and Josh likely persuaded Lisa to marry him for this reason. There was just one issue. The marriage was quickly deemed null and void after it was consummated. Marriages between inmates were forbidden by the estate law. However, the investigators questioned Josh's extreme behavior in protecting Lisa from interrogation and testimony. Was it actually? Investigators tried to talk to the young woman but initially were unsuccessful. However, eventually Lisa herself contacted them and claimed that Josh confessed to her about the murder during one of her visits to the prison. According to Josh's story, there was a party at his house on Friday night, and Josh, who had no other means of support, decided to sneak into the house next. The young woman was likely aware of a lot more information. Josh flung open the door to the home and started looking around for valuables. He suddenly understood that if he continued to let Mindy live at this point, he would not be able to avoid going to jail. He seized the woman, led her to the restroom, and bound her hands since he didn't want to go back there. The criminal then went to his house to grab a gun, while also taking a few useful items to utilize in the kidnapping. He wrapped her legs in sacks and duct taped them before going back to Mindy's house. He then brought the woman to the garage, put her in his own car, and drove out of town, leaving no trail. After a half hour of driving, he pulled off in a wooded area and took Mindy off the road, where he killed her. Josh then left her home after cleaning and vacuuming the carpet. The trial didn't start until the following spring. In exchange for Josh confessing to killing Mindy and another lady seven years prior, the prosecution agreed to drop the death penalty. Josh concurred because the goal was to resolve two prominent cases simultaneously. Consequently, at the reading of the sentence, he was given a prison term of 99 years without the possibility of parole. Josh sobbed, but at one point the judge called him a coward for stealing the lives of two ladies, which caused things to get hot. What about the man I killed? yelled the criminal as he leaped to his feet. Right now, his before he could continue speaking, attorneys seized him and put him to quiet. Until Josh himself gave authorities a fresh agreement in 2014, those yells kept the detectives busy for five long years. 
he consented to tell the truth about killing three guys in exchange for being moved from a local to a federal jail. Given that the criminal's request was so trivial, it appears that the standards were much higher there. The government agreed. Josh claimed that in 1994, when he was just 14 years old, he killed one man in Anchorage. In 1999, he committed murder and killed a third man. The first two guys had been recognized a year later, on the same day he killed the woman, but the third man's name is still unknown. Josh was definitely engaged in the killings, but the real concern for the investigators is whether he has any additional crimes to his credit that he is keeping quiet about. In any case, the authorities were able to permanently cut him off from society and stop the other murders that were certain to occur. Share your opinion on the story in the comments and don't forget to like it if you like the video. Thanks for watching. In this video, we'll discuss crimes perpetrated between 1996 and 2014. Despite the wide time span, all of these crimes had one thing in common. They were all committed along Virginia's Route 29, a major thoroughfare. The police looking into these crimes made several attempts, some of which were successful, to connect the incidents in some way. Some of the criminals referenced in this video may have already come up in separate investigations, though. Here, we'll try to look at the events from the standpoint of several offenses. In 1996, more than 20 women went to the police and said they had all been chased by a man in a pickup truck on Virginia's Route 29. He would communicate an issue with their automobiles and flash his headlights. A white male between the ages of 35 and 45 with reddish-brown hair who was driving a pickup vehicle was characterized as this individual. He earned the moniker Route 29 Stalker, 25-year-old Alicia Reynolds. Alicia Reynolds said her husband Mark Farewell on March 2, 1996, at half past seven in the morning in Baltimore, Maryland, and left for Charlottesville, Virginia. She had a meeting with her mother scheduled for 10.30 a.m., but she had nearly 150 miles to travel. She held off till 11.30 a.m. Alicia's mother contacted her husband Mark, but did not hear from her daughter. Mark informed her that Alicia had departed four hours prior, and that by that time, even without rushing, she should have arrived. After making the decision to call the police, Alicia's car was eventually discovered at 6 p.m. on the side of Route 29. Despite being close to Culpeper, Alicia was nowhere to be found. When the car was inspected, there were no indications of a crime, and afterwards, specialists said the car was mechanically fine. What caused the young woman to leave her automobile unattended is unknown. An inquiry was launched. Soon, witnesses who had observed Alicia conversing with a man in a blue pickup truck on the side of the road were located. The alleged first victim of the stalker on Route 29 is Alicia Reynolds. All the women who had been pursued by the man in the pickup truck before she vanished and who hadn't previously recognized they were in danger came forward to the police and related their interactions with the unidentified pursuer after she vanished. It was discovered that three other ladies had previously dated in addition to Alicia. Two of them were delivered to their destinations in the pickup truck, but the third woman, Carmelita Shomo, was not. Sadly, no picture of her could be located. A week before Alicia vanished, Carmelita stopped at his request. She saw someone flashing their headlights at her in the rearview mirror as she was traveling home from work on Route 29 that wet night. She stopped and the pickup truck's driver followed suit. She was said there were sparks as the man approached her after getting out of his car. He then offered to give her a ride home and she consented, telling him that it was coming from underneath her car while she was driving and that it might be unsafe to keep using it. The pickup truck stopped on the side of the road after a brief trip and the woman was then attacked. Despite having a fractured ankle, she was able to get out of the pickup truck and draw the attention of oncoming traffic which startled the driver and caused him to speed away. However, Carmelita, an immigrant with poor English language, reported the event to the police. At that moment, no steps were done to identify the pickup truck driver due to the police officer's dismissive attitude and lack of respect for her word. Despite the efforts of law enforcement, the police were unaware that their incompetence would eventually result in a tragedy for the Reynolds family. Two months after going missing, Alicia was not located. Her body was located 15 miles from where her car was found in a forested location. 
Laura Winans is 26 years old, and Julianne Williams is 24. May 1996, the same month that Alicia Reynolds' remains were found again, saw the father of Julianne Williams call the police on May 31st to report his daughter missing. She hadn't arrived at the appointed time since she and Laura Winans were on vacation in Shenandoah National Park. They were last seen extending their stay at the campground on May 24th at around 5.30 p.m. Following the police report, park rangers found the two women's bodies the following day. They were both killed by incisions to their necks and the binding of their wrists. Authorities gave May 28th plus or minus 30 hours as the date of death. It was discovered that there had been no sexual activity before the victim's deaths, and their possessions were still in their tent. We shall return to this incident later. This motiveless crime baffled detectives, and the authorities were unable to crack the case right away. Sophia Silva, 16, is a teenager. On September 9, 1996, three months later, 16-year-old Sophia Silva vanished from her yard in Spotsylvania County without leaving any evidence of a struggle. Numerous searches. Sadly, it didn't produce any results. Her remains was discovered in a King George County Creek a month later. The test found that Carolyn McDaniel was 20 years old and that Sophia Silva had also experienced sexual assault before to her death. 20-year-old Anne Carolyn McDaniel left her home in Orange and vanished 12 days after Sophia Silva was kidnapped. Occasionally, hitchhiking was something Carolyn McDaniel enjoyed doing. She was last saw hitchhiking on the road on September 20th, 1996. Her burned bones were discovered two days later, located in Culpeper County, only 15 miles from the location of Alicia Reynolds' body. Katie Lisk was 12 years old, and Kristen Lisk was 15. Despite the police's best efforts, Seven months had gone since Anne Carolyn McDaniel's death was discovered, and none of these crimes had any solid suspects. In the meantime, Spotsylvania, where Sophia Silva was kidnapped on May 1, 1997, was shaken by a fresh incident. Kristen Liskey, 15, and her sister Katie, 12, went missing. The girls would typically contact their father when they got home from school because he was at work at the time. On this particular day, though, the father didn't hear from his girls, so he began making calls home. He went home right away because there was no response. None of the nearby residents had seen the girls, and they were nowhere to be found. The girls had come back, as shown by the bag with their school books that had been placed on the grass. But something had transpired since I got there. In the wake of it, a police report was made, and some 1,500 people joined the hunt for the girls. Their bodies were found in the South River, 40 miles from their house, five days later. The test revealed that drowning was the cause of death. Strangely, the water discovered in their lungs was probably clear tap water, much like in Sophia Silva's case. In their last moments, the girls' sexual integrity had been compromised. The types of crimes and some supporting evidence shown that a single person was responsible for these crimes. A Canadian visitor was riding in Shenandoah National Park on July 9, 1997, when she heard the sound of an approaching automobile. She was expecting the car to drive past, but it didn't. She noticed that the car was approaching her in an odd manner. The pickup truck's driver tossed a soda can at her before getting out and ordering her to take off her clothes. The woman tossed a water bottle at him and used her hands to block his path as he approached her. He tried to drag her into the car, using the bicycle as a barrier. But when he realized he couldn't, he got back in the driver's seat and tried to run her over. Being discouraged by yet another failure, she managed to hide behind a downed tree. The woman saw it as hell when a ranger just so happened to be walking by. He immediately radioed a description of the vehicle, a blue Chevrolet truck, and the person who was arrested as they were leaving the park. The culprit was identified as a 28-year-old man. On April 10, 2002, Daryl David Rice received his sentence of 11 years and three months in jail after pleading guilty to the attack in March 1999. In relation to the instances of Laura Winans and Julian Williams, Rice was charged. To refresh your memory, the young women's deaths were reportedly expected to occur around May 28, give or take 30 hours. 
It was discovered that Rice entered the park at around 8 o'clock in the evening by reviewing surveillance camera footage from that time. Dated May 25th, he returned to the park the following day at 5 hours p.m. and was seen on camera visiting the park on June 1st, 1996, the day the young women's bodies were discovered. Rice knew he would likely receive the death penalty, so he hired a strong defense team that eventually had the accusations against him withdrawn. A hair discovered on the sticky tape, used to bend the young woman was later determined through new DNA testing technologies to not belong to Rice. He was cleared of those charges in April 2004 due to insufficient evidence. But Rice's legal struggles were far from ended. The blue pickup truck he was driving when he was stopped belonged to his father, who resided close to Highway 29 in Virginia and was accused of being the Route 29 stalker. His attorney expertly handled the problem once more. When Rice was named as the attacker during the 2005 trial, Carmelier Shomo, the woman who had successfully resisted the attack and broken her ankle in the process, pointed to a completely different person when she was shown photographs of men for identification prior to the trial. Years ago, in the middle of the night, the defense was able to sow a seed of doubt in her mind, making her wonder if Rice was the criminal. The defense team successfully exploited this uncertainty, which led to the charges being dropped. Additionally, there was no evidence linking Rice's actions to the Alicia Reynolds case, which is regarded as an incident involving the Route 29 stalker. Cases of harassment on the highway were only seized following Reynolds' disappearance. Additionally, nothing suggested Rice's involvement in the incidents in question, Spotsylvania and Orange. Despite numerous circumstantial evidence that the Route 29 stalker was in fact him, it was impossible to prove. As a result, the identity of the driver of the pickup truck that scared women is still unknown. Even with the given prize, the police made a concerted effort to solve these crimes, but they were unable to come any closer to the offender. 15-year-old Carol Robinson was at her friend's house on June 24, 2002, in Columbia, South Carolina, while an acquaintance showered. When a man with some pamphlets in his hands approached, Kara was watering the flowers in front of the house. He requested that Kara give her parents the items. He held a gun to her neck as she walked up to him and told her to get in his car. When he brought Kara to his house, she was chained and repeatedly forced to have sex while the kidnapper was fast asleep. Kara was able to free herself, make her way outside, and eventually find a police station. She had been held captive at the station for 18 hours. Everything she recollected helped the police find her abductor, but by that point, he had managed to escape. The perpetrator was identified as Richard Mark, 38, an honorable man who appeared to be just like everyone else. Mark is a former member of the military who is married and works. He had left the Navy in 1987 after being exposed to a 15-year-old girl and her three-year-old sister, it was learned. For this offense, he was given a three-year sentence with probation. He was captured by the police in Sarasota. Ivana made the decision to commit suicide after realizing he had no other option and was marked by a gunshot and a burst of light. It was determined that he was involved in the cases of Sophia Silva, Kristen, and Katie Lisk. After inspecting his home and comparing the available evidence, the threads on the corpses of the ladies were an exact match to the strands on his bathroom carpeting. It's unbelievable, but forensic specialists were able to locate Kristen Lisk's fingerprints in the car's trunk five years after the crime. DNA testing. By examining the facts, it was finally determined who killed Sophia Silva Kristen and Katie Lisk and it was also shown that his early life had a big impact on who he would become. When Mark was six years old, his father Joseph was giving him a bath and water went into his eyes, causing him to scream. Mark's father Joseph was an alcoholic and his mother was openly having affairs with other men. Joseph was enraged by this and though the child at the time claimed that his father intended to drown him. Family members claimed that Joseph also drowned, leaving their dog's Mark right in front of him. The pattern of his subsequent crimes is thought to have been influenced by this event, drowning his prey, 
Additionally, he was looked into for possible connections to the incidents on Route 29 and the Alicia Reynolds case, but none were found. Reports of the Route of 29, Stalker ended once the witnesses were dead, and Rice was incarcerated serving his sentence. But soon after, girls started reporting it again. Started vanishing once more in Virginia in 2005. An unidentified 26-year-old woman from Fairfax, Virginia, was being carried into a wooded area after being attacked from behind on Rock Garden Drive while she was returning home on foot from a nearby store. Dark and poorly populated, it was already. She fought back vehemently and shouted, but the attacker eventually overwhelmed her around 10 p.m. He coerced her into a sexual act before starting to choke her. Thankfully, a bystander who was nearby heard the woman's cries and ran to help. The attacker made it away and the police were able to collect a sample of his DNA. They also produced a composite sketch, but they were unable to capture him using this information right away. On October 10th, 2009, Cassandra Morton, at age 23, was in Lynchburg. Cassandra Morton, age 23, vanished. She was last spotted on Park Avenue, which is located in Lynchburg's downtown. The only information the police could find when her family reported her missing was that she got into a black car with someone. Her remains were discovered six weeks later. Her body had been strewn with rocks by a passerby who had just passed by the last spot she had been seen. 20-year-old Morgan Dana Harrington was last seen in Lynchburg seven days after Cassandra Morton vanished. Morgan Dana Harrington, age 20, vanished in Charlottesville, a nearby city 70 miles distant. On that terrible day, October 17, 2009, she was a student at a technological university. She and her pals went to see Metallica perform. When his opening band was on stage, she informed her friends that she would use the bathroom and then come back. Her pals were concerned because she had been gone for a while. When they called her at 8.48 p.m., she replied that she was outside the arena but was prohibited from entering due to the no re-entry rule. She also indicated that she was going home, but nobody seemed to think about how she would get there for some reason. No one can figure out why she left the arena since she never came back. She said that she needed to use the restroom, yet there are facilities inside the arena. It's still unclear how she got outside, or either it is genuinely unknown, or it is kept quiet for image purposes. Her wallet and phone were discovered the following day in a parking area close to the arena. Two months later, on January 26, 2010, witnesses were located who had seen a young lady who resembled Morgan Harrington voting at a nearby bridge. A farmer in Albemarle County, 10 miles from the arena where the performance was held, found her bones. Later, the daughter's parents admitted that she was coerced into having a sexual encounter in the final moments of her life. Samantha Ann Clark, 19, vanished in Orange on September 13, 2010, when she was 19 years old. When Samantha left the house at 1.30 a.m. on the day of the incident, her mother Barbara was working the night shift. Her younger brother, who was 12 years old, stayed at home with her. He called his mother to let her know Samantha had left. When Barbara got home the next morning, she found her daughter's pajamas lying on the bed indicating the teenager had changed before leaving. Admonish Samantha about threats he'd heard from friends. At the time, Taylor was not connected to Samantha Clark's disappearance in any way that the police could discover. The investigation came to a halt since the phone calls were insufficient to support any charges. Age 19 for Saga Smith. Saga Smith, 19. Vanished in the same Charlottesville three years after Morgan Harrington went missing there on November 20th, 2012. She informed her roommate of her plans to that particular day as she was leaving her home. No one saw her again after that. The name of the guy she was meant to meet, Eric McFadden, was discovered by the police. He admitted during questioning that he was scheduled to meet with Sage, but that it never took place because he had other matters to take care of while the police were determining their next course of action. Alexis Murphy, 17, left her home in a truck close to Lynchburg, approximately a 30-minute drive away, while McFadden departed. 
She and her dad had made a deal that she, she had never broken the rule that she had to be home by midnight. The first time Alexis didn't arrive home by midnight was on August 3rd, 2013, and her grandmother instantly recognized a problem. The calls went to voicemail, so they were unable to speak with Alexis on the phone. Alexis was well-liked on social media and had many of friends. In an effort to locate Alexis, her parents contacted anyone who may have seen her on the day of her disappearance. This effort helped crack the case, attracted a lot of social media attention, and was featured in national news. People talked about the path Alex was scheduled to take via the notorious Route 29 from the shipment to Lynchburg, a movie theater in Charlottesville, Virginia, 40 miles from Alexis's house, and in the other direction from Lynchburg where she was headed, was where her white Nissan, which she usually traveled in, was discovered three days after she vanished. Although the area was cordoned off, forensic specialists could find no evidence of a crime in the car. One was made in the investigation. Surveillance footage from the Livingston Liberty gas station provided a breakthrough in the investigation. Detectives carefully reviewed the video, which was captured on Saturday, the day Alexis left her house for Lynchburg. A slim-built man who held the door open for Alexis as he entered the building caught their attention in particular. The cashier who worked that day admitted to the police that there had been a brief exchange between the man and the cashier also clearly remembers a Daffy Duck tattoo on the man's neck and the fact that he was driving a camouflage SUV after Alexis had paid and left for her car. The man exited the petrol station first, and Alexis followed shortly after, according to further analysis of the video. However, given that she was traveling in the direction of Lynchburg, this might have been a coincidence. Another video clip of the same person was obtained by the police. It was taken by a camera at an adult business in Charlottesville one hour before he at the petrol station appeared. He bought a movie from the selection offered at those shops, but the key finding was that Randy Taylor was indeed the man who had made the purchase. On the night of her abduction, Samantha Clark had received a call from the same person. The whereabouts of Randy Taylor was promptly discovered by the police. Only 1.5 miles separated him from the gas station and his mobile home. A search warrant might be obtained thanks to video evidence showing Alexis Murphy and Randy Taylor interacting on the day of her disappearance. Anything that might be connected to Alexis's disappearance was taken by FBI officers. Inside the trailer, they discovered three items that were particularly noteworthy. Black hair, a severed artificial nail, and an earring stud. In close proximity to Randy Taylor's porch, within 20 meters, they discovered a broken phone that was also taken in for inspection. Within two days, the outcome is showed that it was Alexis Murphy's phone. Analyses proved Randy Taylor's connection to the missing girl. The earring, nail, and hair that were discovered in his home belonged to Alexis. Alexis Murphy was still missing 11 days after she vanished, despite the fact that Randy Taylor had been taken into custody. When Taylor arrived at the courthouse, he was accused of kidnapping. Taylor began to speak when he recognized that the police were looking for information that would implicate him in both the kidnapping and the death of the missing young woman. However, his statement was now what everyone knew. He said that day Alexis was in his trailer as expected, but she wasn't there by herself. She was there with a black man named Damien Bradley who had dreadlocks. The authorities found evidence that Alexis and Damien Bradley had indeed interacted online and met in person. They visited Taylor's trailer, according to Taylor, to sell plants they were growing, and they had a beer. Taylor utilized a physical struggle between Alexis and her friend at some time to explain why Alexis's DNA was found in the police investigated Damien Bradley's alibi and discovered that he was in another state at the time. It seemed as though Taylor was merely attempting to place the responsibility elsewhere. In the meantime, FBI officers went back to the trailer for another push, and it worked. They discovered Taylor's t-shirt, which was worn the day Alexis vanished, and was now wrinkled below the couch. Eyelashes and hair extensions that are frequently used as extensions were wrapped within. After inspection, it was discovered that the eyelashes and hair were 
these pieces of evidence were sufficient to accuse Randy Taylor of both the kidnapping and the murder of Alexis Murphy on May 8, 2014. Randy Taylor was given two consecutive life sentences in July after being found guilty on all counts. Taylor said he would divulge the whereabouts of Alexis's body if his two life sentences were lowered to 20 years in prison in response to Alexis's family, eliminating any remaining concerns regarding his role in the young woman's abduction. Declared that they would not engage in negotiations and would never give Taylor the chance to escape and hurt someone else. Before Alexis Murphy's family had any prospect of being able to say goodbye to her, nearly six hard years had gone. Human remains were found on private land on December 3, 2020, and on February 5, 2021, it was determined that the bones belonged to Alexis Murphy. Although Taylor was said to have disclosed the location of the remains, no agreements were made with him, and his sentence is still in place. It's important to note that Samantha Clark's case, who aired in 2010 and was tied to Taylor, was reclassified on January 15, 2021, and is now being handled as a homicide investigation. On September 13, 2014, Hannah Graham, an 18-year-old student, vanished from Charlottesville. She was last seen in the early hours of the morning at a mall. Extensive searches involving more than 1,000 volunteers were carried out a week after Hannah vanished, but she was not discovered. She was seen on surveillance video and the police found it. Jesse Matthew, 32, was recognized as the individual seen with Hannah in the video recordings. His flat was searched, but he wasn't taken into custody. He was named as a suspect in Hannah Graham's kidnapping four days after that. When a warrant was issued for Matthew's arrest, he had already left. The following day, he was captured in Galveston, Texas. He was thought to be planning to flee the nation and travel to Mexico. On September 29, 2014, it was revealed that information gathered during Morgan Harrington's case linked Jesse Matthew to her death. Remains were discovered in Albemarle County on October 18, 2014, and they were eventually recognized as Hannah Graham's. Notably, these remains were located within five miles from the location of Morgan Harrington's remains. Matthew was charged with Hannah Graham's kidnapping on February 10, 2015, and on September 15 of that same year, he was also charged in connection with the Morgan Harrington case. However, it was later discovered that Hannah Graham and Morgan Harrington were after a month of study. A number of Jesse Matthew victims fled Liberty University in Lynchburg after one of the female students accused him of rape. He was able to avoid punishment nevertheless, since the complainant abandoned the allegations. After enrolling at Christopher Newport University in Newport News a few days later in January 2003, Matthew was once more the target of the same accusations. The victim again retracted the accusations after the university police looked into the issue. Matthew, from January 15 to October 15 of 2003, I attended Newport University. There were two missing ladies during this time. The fate of Without a Trace and their locations are still unknown. No evidence linking Matthew to their cases or the Cassandra Morton case was discovered, despite the police's investigation into any possible connections between their disappearances and Matthew. With this knowledge, there is only one question that can be asked. If the police had done their job properly, and both colleges where the complaints were made, at least two lives would have been saved if Matthew had persevered in the cases without worrying about damaging their image. In Charlottesville, Matthew started working as a cab driver in 2005. It's important to note that in the same year, a woman traveling home from work in Fairfax was attacked. In the Fairfax case, Jesse Matthew was charged with three counts of kidnapping, and the police were able to get a DNA sample from the culprit at the time, which has since been found to match Jesse Matthew's DNA. First off, he was found guilty on all three counts and given a life sentence for each one on October 2, 2015. In addition to the three life sentences he has previously been given as of this writing, in the instances of Alicia Reynolds and Morgan Harrington, he was sentenced to four further life terms for each of those crimes on March 2, 2016. The positions of Sage Smith, Carolyn McDaniel, Samantha Ann Clark, Laura Winans, 
and Julianne Williams are still available. It is challenging when you look at these faces. It is difficult to think what additional horrors they may have kept buried in their closets, and it is much more difficult to comprehend the suffering they have caused the victims' loved ones. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. Yo. An 18-year-old woman went to another city in her car before going missing. The young woman vanished without a trace, and a week later, her body was discovered in a river. The police had no suspects, and her car wasn't located for years. It wasn't until 14 years later that the young woman's family discovered the horrific reality. The small American hamlet of Covington, Tennessee, is where Lisa Kimmel was born on July 18, 1969. Her parents soon welcomed two more children, and in 1972, the family relocated to Billings. The girl stood out from a young age for her. She worked part-time at a nearby restaurant and assisted her parents in caring for their younger sisters, demonstrating independence and tenacity. Because of this, she acquired a brand new Honda CRX before high school graduation. Little Miss, as she was frequently referred to by her parents and sisters, was added to the young woman's license plate and this plate would play an important part in the overall plot. Despite the opposition of her parents, Lisa chose to continue working at the restaurant after graduating from high school in 1987. The young woman planned to pursue a profession in her chosen field against her parents' concerns. They wanted their daughter to attend college. They ultimately decided Lisa would work for a year and still think about attending college. Soon after graduating, Lisa was presented with a management post but she was already in another city. The young woman worked at a huge chain restaurant called Arby's alongside her mother, who was the regional manager there. She was expected to relocate to the Denver suburbs, nearly 900 kilometers away from her home, and run a restaurant there. It was a significant assignment for the 18-year-old, who had just graduated from high school, but Lisa embraced it without hesitation. Her mother also visited Denver frequently for work, and they saw each other virtually weekly. The young woman occasionally drove herself to her family's home in Billings. Lisa worked at a restaurant in the city of Aurora. She moved in promptly, rented an apartment, and was generally enthusiastic about her new situation. She met several new friends. She started dating Ed a few months later. He lived 800 miles distant yet frequently traveled to Aurora. On March 25, 1988, a Friday, Lisa was getting ready eagerly for the weekend. For the weekend, she had numerous plans. To finally reveal her boyfriend to her family, she planned to travel to Billings with him. He resided in Cody, Wyoming, close to where she was traveling. Lisa had intended to pick him up and accompany him on their journey. At around 4 o'clock, she left Aurora. After traveling roughly 400 kilometers, she had about 7 hours to drive to the boyfriend's place. Lisa reached Douglas, Wyoming. Apparently, she was rushing since at 9 o'clock at night, a police officer pulled her car up for speeding based on his radar readings. When the police issued Lisa a dollar one hundred twenty fine, she was traveling at a speed of roughly one hundred forty kilometers per h. According to state law, she was supposed to pay the money to the officer immediately. The policeman advised Lisa to use the closest ATM close to the road to get the money, since she didn't have that much on her. When they arrived, the terminal did not accept Lisa's credit card. The culprit, who was unable to pay the fee, was detained by the police officer. However, he released Lisa on the condition that she mail the check to the neighborhood police station. It took the young woman roughly four hours to get from Douglas to her boyfriend's residence by automobile. She didn't wait for her that evening, and by the time Ed got up at around 7 a.m., he had fallen asleep. Lisa was still missing at the time. He had no means to reach her because there were no cell phones. Instead, he began making calls to the two state's police departments Inquiring as to whether anything had transpired, he provided information regarding Lisa and her vehicle. Despite accepting the information, the police decided not to open a case of a missing person. This was due to Lisa's age, 18, and the fact that too little time had gone since her disappearance. After a few more hours, he continued contacting their mutual friends, but none of them picked up. They were aware of her disappearance. He then attempted to reach Lisa's parents, but they weren't at home. He also contacted Lisa's boss. When they returned hours later, their phone was ringing nonstop. To find out if they had heard from their daughter, 
Other persons made simultaneous attempts to contact them. The parents initially believed Lisa had simply been delayed and was still traveling. It was difficult to believe that anything could have occurred to her, given that she had previously taken this path numerous times. However, time went by and she was still missing. By that time, her parents had called Ed and invited him to visit them. In such disturbing circumstances, Lisa's long-planned first encounter took place without her, and two days later, the young woman was still unreachable. The law mandated a 72-hour waiting period before reporting a missing individual. The parents made the decision to begin their own search rather than wait impassively. A small aircraft pilot was contracted by Lisa's father to fly over the area where the young woman was. He hoped this would assist him find where her automobile was supposed to be, but the search was fruitless. Along some of that road, the father also drove his car, but he was unable to spot Lisa. The family continued on after that. The girl's parents called a friend of theirs who was a private investigator and had previously worked for the police. He was able to persuade the neighborhood police agency to accept an early missing person complaint because of his contacts. Sadly, they found no leads, so the police were called right away. Although it was discovered that Lisa had been stopped by their patrol officer the night she vanished, her whereabouts were still unclear. There was just one thing that was certain. Between Douglas and the town of Cody, the young woman in the car had vanished. The area along that path had been searched by the authorities, but there is one major issue. There are hundreds of miles worth of farmland, woods, and mountains involved. To cover the entire area, it required months of labor and thousands of workers. The search on the ground therefore made little or no progress. On the morning of April 2nd, eight days had gone when a guy dialed the police. He claimed to be river fishing close to Casper, Wyoming. He once recognized the body that was submerged face down in the river. The fisherman immediately assumed it was her since he had just heard on the radio that the police were seeking for a missing young woman. When detectives arrived on the scene, they pulled the body from the water and confirmed that Lisa was indeed the decedent. Medical professionals examined the body and made a dreadful discovery. Lisa passed away just two days prior to her body being found, so investigators had to figure out where she had been hiding out for the entire time. It was later confirmed that the young woman passed away about six days after going missing. The death was initially believed by the authorities to have happened roughly five hours after she vanished, which later caused misunderstanding. Doctors also found multiple stab wounds and contusions on the young woman's body, concluding that she had been abused while still alive. It appears that she had been thrown into the sea from a bridge while she was still aware. Later, when blood was discovered on the bridge, police corroborated this claim. Medical professionals eventually removed biological material from the victim's body, which was discovered to be a sample of male sperm that appeared to belong to the murderer. It was submitted to a lab, but at the time, DNA analysis technologies were quite limited, and the neighborhood lab lacked the tools essential to recover the offender's profile. Detectives came to the conclusion that the murderer was probably a local person who lived close to the river because of the... The young woman had been thrown from a bridge that was in a wilderness location that was far away, had been abandoned for a while, and required turning off the main road into a country road in order to access. Because of this, the police reasoned that only someone who was familiar with the area could have picked this bridge as a place to dump bodies. The detectives concentrated on finding Lisa's automobile because they thought the murderer had drove it somewhere and that it would contain more clues, but the car was never found. They were unable to locate it since it appeared to have dropped into the ground. In the hopes that someone would have useful information, investigators extensively disseminated information about the case to the general public. A lot of people came forward when the case was widely covered on television, and an odd thing started to happen. The police received over a hundred calls in total. People claimed to have spotted Lisa and a Honda CRX with Little Miss license plates. Only these witnesses were from various states and occasionally even from Canada. The cops believed that appeals were more persuasive. Several days following Lisa's abduction on March 26th and 27, five different witnesses asserted to having seen the same car with the license plate, Little Miss being driven by a young woman who remarkably resembled Lisa. The young woman had to go to work on Monday, and she would never have missed it, so it's difficult to believe that she stayed in the Casper region for a few days for whatever reason. 
and didn't feel the need to call her family. One eyewitness reported seeing a male. Despite making many inquiries, the police were unable to verify that the man was actually seated in the car with Lisa. Seven photographs of the claimed individuals seen with Lisa were compiled by the investigators, but none of them were useful for the inquiry because the descriptions were too varied to single out any one man. The statements of each witness were investigated by the police. They acknowledged that the murderer may have been behind the wheel of Lisa's automobile, but they could find no logical explanation for how Lisa could have spent the weekend driving about without phoning the perpetrator. Apparently, one of the witnesses saw the killer actually drive Lisa's car to hide it, while the rest of the testimony is either incorrect or outright fraudulent. Parents can call 911 from any nearby payphone. Falls Police later discovered that numerous similar automobile types were registered nearby, and it's possible that witnesses saw them while the investigation was going on. Numerous suspects were named by the detectives, but it was later discovered that none of them were connected to the case. Police received a new information six months later. Someone had pinned an envelope to Lisa's clothing, a grave with a letter on a man's behalf. It was stated that he regretted Lisa's passing and described it as a devastating loss. Stringfellow Hawk, a figure from a well-known TV show at the time, signed the letter. The note didn't initially appear to be odd but every member of Lisa's family and circle of friends immediately denied any involvement. In March 1989, exactly one year after Lisa's passing, the police consequently reasoned that it might have been left by the killer. Disappearance information about the case was presented on a well-known television program about unsolved crimes. The police received numerous tip-off calls due to the fact that it was watched by millions of people across the nation. Detectives from the area had to put in extra time and manpower to confirm them. The volume of tips and leads that the neighborhood police station received after the episode aired, in the opinion of Lisa's parents, was too much for them to handle. They wanted the FBI to investigate the death of their daughter for this reason, but Sheriff Ron Ketchum was very opposed to the concept and declared that he had no plans to abandon the lawsuit. Nevertheless, a year later, with the backing of higher authorities, Lisa's parents were still able to enlist federal detectives in the case. They got involved in the inquiry and sought to collaborate with the sheriff, but he refused to do so or even answer their calls. The investigators were now able to examine a DNA sample from the victim's body at a federal lab because of the FBI's participation. The sample was matched to that of Lisa's boyfriend, and they didn't match. The detectives decided to be absolutely certain, even though he had never been considered a suspect before. They then made the decision to investigate the patrolman who had stopped Lisa just before she vanished. Although detectives acknowledged that he might have filed Lisa and attacked her later, he possessed a recording of a discussion with the young woman that showed him bidding her farewell. The cop gave his DNA sample right away, and it did not match that of the murderers. After a local radio station broadcast a show about Lisa's murder, the next unexpected tip was received. We're called by a witness who claimed that he had witnessed Sheriff Ron Ketchum stopping the young woman in the road on the day she vanished, and there were some pretty suspicious moments at play. The sheriff opposed the FBI's involvement in the investigation and never claimed to have stopped Lisa that evening. Then, exactly two years after Lisa's death, a guy abruptly left the police and made an attempt on his own life. When detectives questioned him, he was able to recover and was receiving psychological treatment. Ron, however, entered a not guilty plea and declined to give a DNA sample. The investigators started to take him seriously as a suspect because everything about him seemed suspicious. But when they were prepared to get a court order for a DNA sample a few months later, the man did offer one himself, and it did not match the killer sample. It's unclear why, if he was unrelated to Lisa's death, the sheriff was behaving in such a peculiar manner. His co-workers noted that he had always been a complex individual who had experienced Vietnam. Thus, before the young woman vanished, he was acting in this manner. The cops eventually ran out of solid leads. They published more information about the case in 1992, 
in the hopes of locating other witnesses. The primary account of the inquiry suggests that there may have been many offenders. Most likely, one man abducted and killed Lisa, but someone else assisted in getting rid of the car. The possibility of the young woman being abducted at a traffic stop at a petrol station or someplace else was also considered by the investigators, but it was ruled out. Prior to these occurrences, the young woman was very cautious, and Lisa picked her up after his car stalled on the road and another driver stopped to assist her. Because she was aware of the potential danger, the young woman did not step out of the car and merely slightly dropped her window to speak with him. The case remained unsolved for an additional 10 years because the authorities were unable to pursue any fresh leads. They didn't experience their long-awaited breakthrough until July 2002. The neighborhood's police force reopened the, the killer's DNA sample, was the first thing entered into the FBI database during the inquiry. It wasn't used in mass across the nation until the late 1980s, and even then, it wasn't around yet. When they finally added a sample from Lisa's body, detectives discovered a match right away. The sample belonged to Dale Wayne Eaton, 59, who was incarcerated at the time. In 1997, he had been detained for using a weapon against a young couple and their young child when they were traveling through Wyoming. Wilderness. Dale drove by and stopped to assist as their car stalled. We offered the family a ride to the closest service station, which allegedly belonged to his brother, after he examined the car and indicated there was no way to fix it immediately. After agreeing, they boarded his van. Dale declared he was exhausted and needed to sleep a short distance later. He climbed into the rear of the vehicle and asked the woman to take the wheel. He grabbed his rifle and motioned for the woman to get out of the car and onto a country road as soon as it moved. The woman violently twisted the wheel, knocking Dale off balance and causing him to drop his weapon. When they exited the vehicle, the assailant reached for a knife, but the family's father quickly reached for the rifle and struck Dale with the buttstock. After that, the family climbed into his van and headed to the neighborhood police station. Dale was apprehended by detectives after they drove to the spot and found him nearby. Due to the numerous mental impairments that were discovered during his trial, they decided to put him to a closed rehabilitation center rather than imprison him. According to the authorities, he would stay there for a number of years during which he would receive assistance in moving on with his life, finding a job, and other things. After a few months, he managed to escape, for which reason he was apprehended and given a five-year prison sentence. What matters most in this situation is that Dale's DNA was collected before he was imprisoned and submitted into the FBI database. This led to the Lisa Case's investigators ultimately finding a match. He lived nearby and was 43 years old when Lisa was killed. Law enforcement investigated Dale's past in that area and found a long list of crimes he had committed. At the age of 16, he committed his first significant crime. Dale offered to help the woman take the watermelons he had just sold her home. The woman looked at the watermelons after they arrived and noticed they were rotten. After a lengthy altercation in which she refused to pay for them, Dale stabbed her and then ran away. The following day, the man was taken into custody and the court ordered him to receive treatment. He was identified as having many moderate mental illnesses. Following treatment, he kept switching employment since he couldn't establish himself in any position. He eventually got married, and the two went on to have three kids. The couple's 15-year marriage was miserable. They fought frequently and separated. He relocated to Moneta, a city only an hour's drive from Casper, in 1996. There, his in-laws had a bus converted into dwelling and numerous unfinished constructions on the property. Dale made himself at home there. Except for an occasional tiny bed, there were no living quarters in that bus. To take a shower, he would travel to a neighbor's home. Because of this, Lisa's body had DNA from a seasoned serial offender, but authorities weren't ready to arrest him because they needed more proof. Officers showed up to the precinct where he formerly resided. Nearby, a number of neighbors lived and one of them gave the detectives an intriguing tale. Around the time Lisa vanished, Dale allegedly dug a sizable hole on his property and declared he was going to put, but that never happened, in a septic tank. When the lot was dug up, 
the detectives discovered Lisa's automobile with Little Miss license plates. With all of this information in hand, the police began to work gathering the evidence they would need to successfully prosecute Dale. They knew they would have plenty of time while he was inside because Dale killed the man who shared his cell with him. He was finally charged with Lisa Kimmel's murder in April 2003. The lawsuit proceeded because the man refused to admit guilt. The prosecution called Dale's other cellmate to testify, saying that the man confessed to him about Lisa's murder and gave him all the details the young woman allegedly saw him on the side of the road, stopped, and agreed to give him a ride. At one point, Dale allegedly started to molest her but was rejected. Then he pulled a gun and ordered her to his house where Lisa was killed. But nobody accepted this explanation. Lisa's parents warned her against picking up a hitchhiker in the middle of the night in a remote location. Dale had a motive to lie. Either he told his cellmate a lie, or he made it up himself to get his sentence reduced for testifying. The investigation reveals that was not the case. Lisa most likely stopped at a petrol station before Dale attacked her there. Between Casper and Dale's house, they even mentioned a certain gas station by name. Lisa had to pass it on her way there. Cody Dale probably got into her car and used a revolver to compel her to drive to some isolated spot because he frequently drove there to use the public lavatory. Then, he brought her back to his station and held her in the bus because he had no water on the site. He took her to that bridge a few days later, stabbed her multiple times, and then threw her into the sea after deciding to get rid of her. Additionally, experts compared Dale's handwriting to that of the note placed on Lisa's grave. They discovered a lot of similarities, but despite the difficulty of calling it evidence in court, Dale was found guilty thanks to DNA evidence found on the body and the car that were both on his property. Even the lawyers were aware of this and made an effort to have their client not receive the death penalty rather than an entire acquito. They cited the mental disorders that prevented him from accepting full accountability for his deeds, but in vain. Dale was given the death penalty when the jury found him guilty. Then Lisa's parents sued him in a civil case, which was approved by the young woman's parents, along with the fire department, destroyed all of the buildings on the land where they were located, after the court ordered that Dale be removed from it. Since Lisa's conviction, this occurred on her birthday. In 2010, the court accepted the appeal and scheduled a fresh hearing despite Dale's attorney's repeated attempts to have the death penalty revoked. The appeal was approved on the grounds that the court erred in imposing the penalty. In addition, the evidence of Dale's cellmate was seized upon by the defense team to take into account the offender's significant childhood mental disorders and developmental deficiencies. Although the man's testimony may have been made up and the jury was not informed, that he had been promised a lighter sentence as a result. There is still little chance of the sentence being completely overturned. The death penalty is unlikely because Dale is still incarcerated and is currently 78 years old. In this entire narrative, there is one more point worth highlighting. In the neighborhood where Dale lived, there have been a number of unsolved homicides and mysterious disappearances of young women. Despite the lack of available proof, the police acknowledge that Dale could have been the murderer. His entire life shows a definite propensity towards crimes in Syria. This suggests that Lisa Kimmel wasn't his only victim. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it. Thanks for watching. The student got off the bus and was nowhere to be found. Without a trace, her body was found in a field the next day. The police looked for the killer for 39 years but it was not until 2019 that they were able to find out what really happened. We will tell you what happened. Helene Sinsky. Helene Przinsky was born on April 6, 1958, in Huntington, which is near New York City. She was the youngest of three children. Her older brother and sister were 12 and 9 years old, respectively. The girl grew up with love and care, got along well with her older relatives, and was a positive, bright person. When she was 14, her father got a job offer, and the family had to move to the small town of Hamilton near Boston. There, she went to the local school and developed a passion for after high school. She went to Wheaton College, which was 110 kilometers from her town. It was close enough for her to visit her family often, 
and it also had a great writing program. Helen got used to being a college student quickly. She did well in school and was involved in college life. Eventually, she got a chance she was excited about. She was going to do an internship at a radio news station in Denver, even though the city was more than 3,000 miles away from our college. Helene was excited about the opportunity. In addition, her uncle and aunt lived in Denver and agreed to take her in for the internship. She also went with a classmate who studied journalism in January 1980. Helen, then 21, flew to Denver and began working at a radio station. Every day she had to take the bus from the office to her home. The trip took about 30 minutes after which she had to walk several miles. On January 16th, she left the radio station as usual at 6 p.m. and went to the bus stop. The only thing was that she never showed up at home. Her aunt immediately began to worry because Helen had always warned her before. If she planned to be somewhere late, the woman waited a few hours but at half past 11 she decided to go to the police after all investigators had already begun a search immediately fearing that her disappearance might be connected to a recent string of attacks on women in the area. They calmed the area along Helen's route all night, but could not find her in the morning. A woman approached the police she was driving her car through a suburban area of Denver with her children. At one point they noticed someone lying in a field near the road. The mother stopped. The car walked closer and saw the body of a young girl with no signs of life. The police arrived on the scene and immediately identified Helen. Her clothes were partially missing, her hands were tied behind her back, and all her personal belongings were also missing. Later medical experts determined that the girl had been stabbed nine times and abused. The death occurred between 8 and 10 p.m. A person who saw Helene get off the bus at 5.30 was able to be found by the cops. She had several kilometers to walk from the bus stop, and it appears that the perpetrator attacked her at that point. Law enforcement agencies surveyed the area near where the body was found, but they were unable to find almost any clues other than shoe impressions, presumably size 44, that led from the road to the body and back. By then, medical examiners had found biological material on the victim's body and clothing that appeared belonged to the killer, except that in those years it could not help the investigation because the science of studying DNA was only at an early stage of development. But the samples were sent to a laboratory for storage, hoping that they would help identify the perpetrator in the future. Police turned to the public for information using newspapers and local television they tried to find witnesses, who might have seen Helen that night. Soon they were approached by a woman who at about 10.20 p.m. saw a man near the field where the body was found. He was standing on the side of the road next to a car. Unfortunately, it was dark outside at the time, and the woman could not get a good look at the man she provided the police with, only generalities that could not help them in any way. Then the detectives took a very interesting step with the consent of the witness. They invited a hypnotist to the station, and the woman was able to remember more details on the basis of which it turned out to draw a portrait of this unknown man. It is hard to say whether the hypnosis session really helped the investigation, but the fact remains that at that time the police had nothing but this drawing, but they could not find a single suspect, and the case froze for years Helen's college diploma was given to her after she died as a way to remember her. The school also named an alumni award after her because she was always involved in college life. The investigation was not reopened until 1998. Eighteen years after the murder by then, technology in the field of DNA research had progressed markedly and researchers had entered samples of biological material into the FBI database. Unfortunately, no matches were found. This meant that the perpetrator had no previous criminal convictions, at least not since they began taking DNA samples from convicts 15 more years past. And in 2013, the local police department created a unit to handle unsolved cases. They reopened the investigation into Helen's murder, but no new leads could be found. A DNA sample from the victim's body never showed up in the FBI database. This meant the girl's killer had not come to the attention of the police for other possible crimes all this time. Throughout all these years, Helen's relatives and police were not the only ones trying to find the truth. The girl's high school friends with whom she was in the choir took an active part in the investigation. Decades after her murder, they continued to press detectives to review the case regularly. They also gave interviews to get the story out to the public and distributed flyers about Helen's murder along her bus route. In 2017, the case was reopened again, and this time the detectives had much more to go on by this point. 
forensics had begun to make extensive use of genetic genealogy by which the perpetrator's identity could be deduced through his relatives. Of course, this was a very complicated and time-consuming process. Moreover, this method worked only in the case if the relatives of the DNA possessor were in the publicly available genetic databases. There are several of these, and they are mostly used to search for family members in 2018. Police turned over available DNA samples to the Parabon lab, which had already helped solve hundreds of similar cases. Experts looked at about 3,000 matches, including even distant relatives of the alleged killer. They had to get rid of people who did not fit the age range or could not have committed the crime for other reasons. In the end, they decided that the person with the DNA was probably the son of a woman named June Estes, who was dead at the time. The problem was that she had four sons, but the lab was only able to identify two of them. They were 10 and 11 years old. A year went by before something unexpected happened. A woman named Jessie put her DNA sample into a public database, which was the best way to find criminals. Experts at Parabon saw that Jessie was a close relative of Helen's killer and contacted her. After a more detailed DNA test, they found that Jessie's third cousin was the killer. Detectives asked the woman for information about her family to finally find the suspect. Immediately after uploading her data into the database, the woman began collecting information about her family tree and asked both of her parents to enter their DNA into the database. Through this, experts at Parabon determined that the killer was related to Jesse on her father's side. Unfortunately, the search for an answer will drag on for several more months. Expert detectives and Jesse's family worked together to get closer to the owner of the DNA from the murder scene, and soon it finally happened. The cops were able to reach a relative of June Estes and he gave new details about her older sons. It turned out that the woman suffered from mental problems, and after her next breakdown, her father took the boys and took them to another town. Their names were William and Curtis, and the detectives were to find out which one of them was the killer. The answer was not long in coming. The Cavs immediately discovered that William had been incarcerated multiple times, and his DNA sample was entered into the FBI database in 2010. Given that the sample from Helen's body has been run through that database repeatedly since then, William was not the killer. The downside of this database is that it only shows a full match, not a partial match, even when brothers are involved. 39 years after the murder, the police had a prime suspect named Curtis White, who also went by the last name Clanton. It turned out that this man had a long criminal history. When he was 18, he knocked on a woman's door and asked to use her phone. Once inside, he grabbed a knife and abused the victim before running away. He was quickly caught and sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he was released after only four years because he was defended. Curtis moved in and got a job as a gardener in the area where Helen was killed. He later moved to Florida, which is where the officers went to look for him in 2019. Curtis was 62 years old at the time and worked as a trucker. Before charging him with Helen's murder, Investigators wanted more hard evidence. After a week's surveillance, they got a hidden DNA sample from him, but it wasn't enough. Followed to a club, he confessed to a brutal murder, life sentence granted at 82. Victim's family found closure after almost 40 years, other cases possibly linked but unproven. Justice served partially. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you like it. Thanks for watching. In June 2000, 15-year-old Leah Freeman vanished, leaving a small town in shock. With rumors swirling and a distraught boyfriend, Nick McGuffin, desperately searching, the police investigation took unexpected twists. Witness testimonies, concealed evidence, and advanced DNA testing would lead to revelations and suspicions. Dive into the mysteries and uncover the truth behind Leah Freeman's disappearance in this video. At 10.15 p.m. on June 28, 2000, the Courtright home received a call. The phone was answered by Corey Courtright. Nick McGuffin, Leah's 18-year-old boyfriend, was the one who inquired as to her whereabouts. Nick had picked up Leah from their house about 4 p.m., which caught Corey off guard. Little did she realize the difficulties she would face in the future. Nick McGuffin, who was three years older than Leah Freeman, went to the same school as her. The two young people finally began dating after becoming acquaintances at some time. This alarmed Leah's mother, Corey, who had learned that her daughter and Nick shared more than just a spiritual bond. 
they also had a physical one. Around 4 p.m. on that day, Nick drove up in his vintage Mustang to pick up Leah. Leah bit her mom by before leaving in the car. The young pair enjoyed listening to loud music while driving. Nick claims that he dropped Leah off at the home of her closest friend Sherry at around 7 o'clock. They agreed that he would pick her up from there at 9 o'clock, but when he arrived there, Leah was gone, and the guy Leah was staying with told him that they had gotten into a fight, which caused Leah to get furious and leave. Leah was nowhere to be found when Nick started driving around the streets looking for her. Nick encouraged Corey not to worry and reassured her that he would locate Leah and bring her home at around 7 a.m. as their chat came to an end. On June 29th, still waiting for her daughter to come home, Corey called Nick's house to inquire about her whereabouts. Shortly after they reported her missing to the police at the station, Nick was shocked because he thought she was at home. Leah climbed into the car with Nick, and Corey recalled the moment she last saw her daughter. He claimed that after speaking with Leah's mother on the phone, he kept driving around the city looking for the teenager, substantiating his allegation that Nick had been stopped by the police twice the day before, owing to he was pulled over by the police on several occasions, all of which he stated he was looking for Leah. He asked his buddy Kristen Steinhoff for assistance after being stopped for the second time owing to a problem with the car. They then drove around the city for nearly an hour in her car, but it did not work, and they went their separate ways. According to Nick, he then made the decision to walk close to Leah's house once more. Around 2 a.m., I noticed a light inside of her. He went back to his own house with peace of mind, assuming she was already there. Starting with his friend whom he had left Leah with the night before, the cops started looking into what Nick had disclosed. Sherry corroborated Nick's account by stating that Leah had visited her home yesterday, but fled following their disagreement. Sherry explained that Leah wanted to go for a run, but her mother wouldn't let her since Leah often gets in trouble for asking to go for a run. Nick picks her up, sending her home alone. Leah heard her friend and her mother having this chat, became offended, and left Sherry's home right away. Sherry claimed that she attempted to stop Leah, but that she was enraged and continued to leave. And while Leah was at Sherry's, Nick spent time with his friends at a nearby lake, according to his friends. Later, the authorities produced evidence indicating the young people had met there with a purpose, and Nick's involvement was a key factor in their plan. Leah loathed him and their disagreement very much. Kristen, a friend of Nick's, also corroborated his claim that they were looking for Leah in her car. There have never been any high-profile crimes in Kokio, a little town with a population of just under 4,000. The disappearance of Leah Freeman raised a lot of controversy in the neighborhood. When Leah left her friend's home, the police looked for any witnesses who may have seen her. It was discovered that she was last observed alone in a downtown area close to her school. It's possible that she was on her way home, but it has now been discovered that she never arrived. Leah's mother disputed the police's assertion that her daughter had simply run away from home, saying her daughter had no justification for doing so. Nick's home and car were the subject of search warrants issued by the police. The only noteworthy discovery of the car search was the missing lining in the trunk. Otherwise, it was absolutely empty and devoid of any tools or a spare tire. The detectives found nothing of significance in the house. His father, Nick Nick, began to understand that he had changed from my witness to the only suspect during the interrogation when it was stated that everything had been taken out because of a fuel leak. Nick attempted to disregard the accusations that he was somehow connected to Leah's abduction as he kept looking for his loved one by distributing flyers bearing her picture. Three days after Leah Freeman vanished, something happened that caused the police's perception to shift away from the idea that the young woman might have been abducted. The woman had fled. Near the school where Leah was last seen, a man who worked at a nearby vehicle service business approached the police. He recalled that on the night of the young woman's disappearance, he had been working late and was about to leave when he saw a shoe by the roadside that looked like one of his kids' sneakers, which they occasionally brought to his business. He took it home after picking it up. The father didn't recall anything until Leah's disappearance caused a stir. He turned it over to the police after assuring them it wasn't his children's. The footwear belonged to Leah, according to the young woman's family, who confirmed this. It was discovered on Northern Elm Street close to the local school and cemetery. Her right foot belongs in the sneaker. It was Leah Freeman's shoes, according to the results of the forensic investigation. 
A week later, something was found that clearly suggested the missing young woman had suffered a terrible fate. In the, the second sneaker Leah owned, it was in the Hudson Rich area, about 7.5 miles from where the first sneaker was discovered, on an old logging road, a remote location where one might easily conceal themselves from prying eyes. A forensic examination of the sneaker revealed dry stains of a dark red hue that contained Leah Freeman's biological material. Leah's mother claims that the police didn't start treating her daughter's absence seriously or stop thinking her a runaway until the sneaker was found. Were organized by the police to search the area after a second shoe was discovered. On August 3, 2000, five weeks after Leah Freeman vanished, one of the search teams detected a strong stench and found her body. Leah's mother, Corey Courtright, had been holding on to the hope that her daughter would finally return home. In the vicinity of Lee Valley Road, it had been hurled over the brink of a narrow brook. The area was very forested, and there was no one there. If not for the potent stink, the body might have remained unnoticed for a lot longer. The murderer had picked a decent location nearby to conceal the body. The prolonged exposure of the body to the high temperature caused extensive decomposition, making it impossible for investigators to collect any usable evidence. Another factor was the local police's inexperience with such investigations. The map reveals the following. Leah was last seen close to the school, not far from where her right shoe was discovered. The body was recovered 2.5 miles from the place where the left sneaker was found, which was located 5 miles from the right one. The cops were further perplexed by the body's detachment from the shoes. As a result, after the body was discovered, the inquiry stalled rather than making the anticipated progress. The police were reticent to divulge anything, and it was clear from the lack of any arrests or charges that they had no solid leads. Meanwhile, rumors started to circulate in that despite the fact that the young man appeared to be grieving over his loved one's passing, most people in the small village of Coquille think that Leah's boyfriend, Nick McGuffin, was involved in everything and was concealing something. The majority of people accused him. As they had no other suspects, the police again called him in for interrogation. Despite their pressure, however, there were no breakthroughs in the investigation. It became clear that the investigation had reached a standstill a year later. Police did not have any fresh suspects. Nick. After another six years passed, the small town that was shaken by the high-profile crime slowly returned to normal. In 2007, Nick's daughter was born, and society started to accept him again. However, for Leah's mother, Corey Courtright, life seemed to have stopped the day she lost her daughter. She never stopped reminding the local police chief about the unsolved case eight years later. The detectives were unpleasantly surprised to find that the evidence gathered in 2000 was dispersed, and some of it was completely useless. Witness testimonies from that time were reviewed, and dozens of people were interviewed once more, including Kristen Steinhoff, Nick's friend. Mark Daniels took over the Coquillo police, and he gave the case a fresh perspective by assembling a team of specialists from across the state. Her remarks on the night of her disappearance were different from what she had claimed eight years prior. She recalled how Nick visited her home that evening about midnight, and the two of them had a cigarette. Nick then began kissing her, but it didn't last long since she objected. Nick McGuffin was called in for additional questioning after her testimony, rekindled earlier suspicions about him. Kristen's testimony was corroborated, and he acknowledged that what she had stated was accurate, but he had been reluctant to do so in 2000 when the police had publicly suggested that Leah might have the most surprising development was the appearance of a witness years later, who claimed to have seen Leah and Nick after she left her friend's house. Leah was only 15 at the time, which could have provided a motive for Nick to commit the crime, and could have landed him in jail. Leah Freeman's body was discovered on August 23, 2010, ten years after she passed away. Her boyfriend Nick McGuffin was taken into custody and accused of being the cause of death. The prosecution used the testimony of two witnesses during the trial. Leah and Nick were allegedly seen by a witness at nine o'clock. The day she vanished, close to the establishment where the first pair of sneakers was discovered, Nick allegedly tried to drag Gila into a car as they were shouting. According to the prosecution, it was at this time when Nick allegedly hurt Leah, as evidenced by the stains on the shoes. Someone who claimed to have had an argument with Nick in 2002 
and that Nick had threatened to treat him the same way he treated Leah was the second and most significant witness. This accusation was understood as this witness was the ex-boyfriend of the young lady Nick subsequently married, which would have influenced his testimony, but the prosecutor ruled out the likelihood of prejudice. Nick McGuffin refused to confess guilt, but in the absence of any tangible proof, he only had the testimony of witnesses. Nick McGuffin was found guilty of Leah Freeman's involuntary manslaughter by ten of the jury's twelve members. When the verdict was revealed on July 19, 2011, eleven years after she passed away, he received an eleven-year prison term. The mother experienced her first moment of comfort upon learning that the person who had kidnapped her daughter was now in jail, but the narrative doesn't end there. In 2014, Nick McGuffin's relentless insistence on his innocence and his prolific letter writing to multiple human rights organizations produced results. One of these organizations became interested in his case, and Jazz Parakow, his new attorney, started looking into the facts and witness accounts that had led to the guilty conviction. As she learned, in addition to the, the police concealed vital information that would have impacted the jury's verdict due to the lack of tangible proof connecting Nick McGuffin to the killing of Leah Freeman. The fact that Leah's clothing contained traces of gray automotive paint that did not coincide with the hue of Nick's car during the trial was kept a secret. Although it was stated that the Mustang's interior had been completely cleaned when it was originally checked, pictures from that time clearly showed otherwise. Witness statements disputed the prosecution's witnesses' assertions that I witnessed Leah and Nick fighting outside the school at around 9 o'clock, but these unreported testimonies claim they weren't brought up in court. Leah was seen by witness Nick Backman at 9 o'clock. Leah was out on her own that evening while he was at an ATM. Additionally, the authorities seized the ATM videotape, which showed that his meeting occurred at precisely 904 p.m. In the ten years between the discovery of the corpse and the footwear and Nick McGuffin's arrest, during which time technology advanced, one of the most serious instances of police professionalism occurred had significantly progressed, especially in the area of DNA testing. As is well known, one of the sneakers identified as containing Leah Freeman's biological material in 2000 had significant crimson stains. The police mysteriously chose not to send the footwear for more examination after 10 years and the chance to learn more using new technologies. This decision ultimately had a big impact on Nick McGuffin's life. The attorney got in touch with the lab that had tested the shoes in order to request a copy of the original DNA analysis result in 2000 and was shocked to learn that, in addition to Leah's DNA, his DNA had also been discovered on the footwear. However, the male DNA was so minute that at the time, technology could not further identify it, and its discovery was no longer mentioned anywhere in the police records. Nevertheless, the police decided not to conduct a further investigation in 2010, despite having all the available options. The footwear were submitted for re-examination in 2017, thanks to Nick's defense, and the results showed that both male and female DNA was present. However, the detected samples were so small that it was impossible to obtain comprehensive information for comparison with the FBI database. They could only reveal similarities when compared directly to the DNA of the person who left them. The sneakers, both inside and outside, did not belong to Nick McGuffin. Nick McGuffin's guilty judgment was reversed on November 29, 2019, and his case was given back to the prosecutor who had been in charge of it during the 2011 trial. The prosecutor claimed that simply because McGuffin was found guilty was overturned, doesn't mean he's innocent given that Nick had already completed nearly all of his 11-year sentence and the new evidence. The prosecutor chose not to pursue a new trial against him. On December 17, 2019, Nick McGuffin was released from prison. He now intends to hold the authorities accountable for erasing 10 years from his life. The investigation into Leah Freeman's killing is still ongoing, but possibly new techniques will one day be developed that will allow for a more precise identification of the murderer. Mom Corey Cartwright is still of the opinion that the individual is Nick McGuffin. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it, thank you for watching. The police started looking for a girl who had spent the night at her friend's house before she vanished without a trace the next morning. Her bedroom window was wide open and all of her belongings were still there. 
No one suspected the dark secrets that would soon come to light in the small town. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Amanda Lenka was born on June 7, 1991 in Tennessee. She grew up in a big, loving family with many brothers and sisters before moving with their parents to Spring Hill, Florida. She loved spending time there because she had many friends there. White Cloud was a quiet, peaceful town with a population of only one 400 people. Most of its residents knew each other, children played without adult supervision, and no one worried about their safety. Amanda was passionate about dancing, writing poetry, playing multiple musical instruments, and being a very positive child. During school breaks, she always went to her grandparents' house in that town. On June 20th, Amanda spent the night at the home of her best friend. They chatted, had fun, and went to bed late. The next morning, her friend woke up and discovered Amanda was not in the room. The bedroom windows were wide open. She went to the kitchen and looked all over the house, but Amanda was nowhere to be found. Amanda had just completed the seventh grade of middle school. She spent the entire summer in White Cloud with her friends, went for walks, and enjoyed her vacation. Belongings, such as clothes and a backpack, were left in the bedroom. When the friend reported Amanda missing to her parents, they called her grandparents, walked several blocks, and called the parents of Amanda's other friends, but no one had seen her. Then the relatives decided to contact the police because they realized that Amanda could not have left without notice, especially in just her pajamas. First, investigators spoke with the friend of Amanda, who claimed that she did not see Amanda L., the girl's friend's parents, as well as her brother and sister, were in the house at the time of the disappearance, but none of them heard or saw anything. Police also tried to find witnesses who lived nearby that night, but they came up empty-handed. On the first day of the investigation, the investigators came to the conclusion that the girl had likely left home on her own initiative and run away. This version outraged Amanda's relatives, who insisted that the girl had no problems at home and was happy to spend the entire summer in White Cloud. In addition, they pointed out that the girl left all her things including clothes in her friend's room and that five people did not hear anything. It was difficult to imagine a scenario in which Amanda could have been abducted without waking up her friend who was sleeping just a meter away. When word of Amanda's disappearance spread throughout the neighborhood, the police received numerous calls from witnesses who claimed to have seen a similar girl in various locations, which only increased the detective's certainty that Amanda had fled her home. Unable to confirm any of these leads, the investigators decided to check the girl's computer in the hopes of finding some information that could aid in the search. They discovered pertinent information. Although there were inconsistencies, these correspondences made no mention of a potential meeting and were about routine, everyday matters. The investigators still believed they had enough evidence to confirm their suspicions at the time. However, word of Amanda's correspondence with a particular man quickly spread among the city's residents, leading many to believe that she had run away to meet him. Because of this misunderstanding, the investigators did not really use the full scope of their resources. If they had officially classified this case as a kidnapping, they could have enlisted the FBI and other agencies in the investigation. Instead, they chose to focus on the case themselves. Meanwhile, Amanda's family was posting flyers and giving interviews to various media outlets, insisting that Amanda could not have fled on her own initiative. On July 5th, mushroom pickers went to a forest about 10 kilometers from White Cloud, where they discovered a human body and reported it to the police. Investigators arrived at the scene and immediately recognized the body as Amanda because she was lanky and wearing the same pajamas she had disappeared in. Despite their half-hearted search for her, they never found any serious leads on her possible location, and the investigation dragged on for several weeks, confirmed her identity, and discovered that Amanda had died the night of her disappearance after suffering multiple blows from a heavy object. Investigators came to the conclusion that the victim had been killed elsewhere before being brought to the forest, but they were unable to find any significant leaves, so they decided to speak to everyone who knew the girl. Over the course of the following few days, police interviewed about 400 people, or nearly one-third of the population of White Cloud. However, since the young man with whom Amanda had communicated online had the word killer in his nickname, they decided to take another look at him. While this did not produce any answers, the police also decided to consider the possibility that the victim actually went to meet him and was killed there. However, 
This theory still had many flaws. For instance, there was no evidence to support the idea that the girl would have gone to meet someone in the middle of the night while wearing pajamas, and there was also no evidence that the, in an effort to find some new leads, detectives decided to examine all of Amanda's possessions, which resulted in a breakthrough. They discovered her personal diary, which contained very disturbing information. Shortly before her death, Amanda wrote that a certain man had been harassing her, and the next several pages were torn out. The investigator could not identify this person, and soon the version of his involvement was no longer taken into consideration. Leave in the case, police attempted to identify the man's identity. They spoke to all of Amanda's friends and asked if the girl had brought up anything regarding this. Several of her friends acknowledged that she had indeed told them about it, and even named the man Cecil Wallace. He was the stepfather of Amanda's friend with whom she had spent the night for detectives. This information was a real surprise they had been searching for the killer throughout the town and beyond, and in the end, T. But the testimony of the friends was not enough to arrest him. Investigators had no substantial evidence against the man, no DNA samples were found on the victim's body, and the court documents did not indicate whether she had been subjected to violence. Detectives questioned Wallace, but he denied any involvement in the crimes the police themselves wondered how the man could have done all this unnoticed in a small house where his wife and three children slept without serious evidence or confession, they could not detain Wallace, therefore. The detectives continued to work on all possible leads soon after an interesting fact emerged. It turned out that Wallace's sister Candace worked in the police department that was handling Amanda's case. Moreover, the woman actively helped her brother and his family during the interrogations. She literally told him what to say and how to behave. But that was not all. Five years ago, she was fired from another police department for falsifying report on her brother's accident. She wrote that he was driving on a road Wallace claimed that a deer ran out in front of him as he was driving. But in reality, the man was drunk and had an accident. At that point, other detectives were already working on Amanda's case, and they questioned the impartiality of the local police's investigation. But they were unable to confirm that anyone else could be assisting Wallace. The investigator spoke with Wallace and his family several more times, but this did not produce any results. They continued to search for any leads, but instead of finding any four years after the murder in 2008, detectives turned to the National Center for Missing and Explosion after receiving repeated complaints from the Wallace family that their home had been vandalized. The town's unanimity that the man was a murderer and that his sister was covering it up only increased in negative sentiments. Wallace continued to live among them freely, which only heightened these feelings. Three more years passed before the police finally got a new lead that changed everything. In 2011, a 27-year-old Texas woman who grew up in White Cloud went to a news website from her old town where she found information about Amanda's murder and swore it was her. She then contacted the police. They had gone through all the case materials, conducted new interrogations, and tried to find new leads. Ultimately, they came to the same conclusion as the local detectives that there was not enough evidence to make and in 1998, when the victim was 13 years old and still a resident of that city. She spent the night at the Wallace home because she was friends with his second foster daughter. In the middle of the night, a man broke into their room and assaulted both of them before threatening to keep quiet. The victims were too terrified to call the police, so they never reported what had happened. In Amanda's case, she made the decision to contact the police, and then she provided them with a statement that assisted investigators in moving closer to the arrest of the suspect. They spoke with many people in White Cloud, who might have been impacted by Wallace's actions, and this tactic was successful because they were able to identify several women who admitted that the man had touched them inappropriately. This incident occurred between 1998 and 2002. The victims were then between the ages of 13 and 16, Putting all this information together, police detained Wallace, 43, in October 2011. Wallace was charged with sexually assaulting these victims and was also the first person to be officially named as a suspect in Amanda's case. Detectives had no doubt that Wallace was responsible for the murder, and at the preliminary hearing, he was given bail of $150,000, and other family members assisted him in raising the funds the trial was scheduled to start in a month. While waiting for this... Wallace returned to work. The locals were not happy that he had been released on bail, 
They frequently protested outside the company's office, demanding that this man be fired on November 10th on the day of the first court hearing an unexpected turn occurred. Wallace did not show up at the appointed time, and the police immediately declared him wanted. A few days later, Wallace was found in a local jail. Detectives who did not anticipate this turn of events were forced to continue the inquiry after the suspect passed away. They could only rely on strong evidence that could connect him to Amanda's death. They obtained a search warrant for his home in an effort to find any evidence connected to Amanda's murder. They looked around every corner, tore down some walls and lifted floorboards, but they found nothing. After gathering the necessary evidence, detectives turned their attention to the suspect's sister Candace, believing that she was protecting her brother and wanting to know if she was aware that he had killed Amanda. Candace was detained in August 2012. She was accused of deliberately misleading the investigation, but that was just the beginning. Throughout the course of the investigation, detectives discovered that Candace had been concealing her brother's drug dealing during those times. Candace also advised him to always carry a cigarette with someone else's DNA on it, so that if necessary he could plant it at the crime scene. Detectives also concluded that at least nine people knew about Wallace's crimes, but remained silent. All of them were members of his family. The police were also of the opinion that at least nine people knew about Wallace's crimes, but remained silent. Wallace's sister could not provide consulting services on a case that she was working on as a police officer, given that she had been assisting her brother through interrogations. She broke this rule and was ultimately punished, but Candace insisted that her brothel was involved for another two years before making a deal with the police in which she admitted to lying to the investigators in exchange for the dismissal of two other charges. If a person has committed a minor offense, they can be given several weekends in jail. This way they receive a punishment, but it does not significantly affect their life. The convicted person can continue to go to work and spend time with their family, of course. This is a dubious practice where the convict is only required to be in the jail building for two days a week and can freely roam during the rest of the time. In 2004, medical experts only handed over part of Amanda's remains to her family so they could hold a funeral. The remainder was to be kept by detectives during the investigation, but after Wallace's death, a decision was made to hand over the remainder to the family. The detectives were sure that Candace had helped her brother avoid punishment, and because approving it 100% was not possible, she received such a light punishment. Amanda's family was forced to undergo yet another trial. She also works to change the law to change how the police search for missing children. The mother insists that investigators should not conduct an investigation based on their subjective assessments and consider the disappearance as a voluntary escape from home. Thus, there is almost no doubt that Wallace committed the disappearance. However, there is still some doubt that Wallace committed the disappearance. Given that there is no information in the court records regarding whether the victim was subjected to violence, two assumptions can be made. He likely assaulted her but did not leave his biological material, so the investigation decided not to disclose this fact because it was unnecessary. Detectives could also withhold this information for the sake of the investigation in the hopes that the criminal would reveal facts that had never been revealed. His prior crimes also speak in F.A. The detective suggested that all of Wallace's relatives who were in the house on the night of the murder were aware of the crime and may have even assisted in it. Wallace had at least three victims using the same scheme, and all of them stayed at his house overnight. The question is why he killed Amanda. Perhaps he intended to intimidate her like the others, but the girl threatened to tell the truth to everyone or she tried to flee from him and he panicked. The fact that Wallace settled the score with his life before the trial speaks in favor of his guilt, even though he took the specifics of this crime to the grave, as his wife, son, and daughter were present which may have explained how he was able to attack the victim without waking any of his family. In any case, even without a final ruling from the court, Wallace will no longer be able to harm anyone. Share your opinion in the comments, and don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Thanks for watching. What happened to Sheila Josephine Harris and why this case angered the public? Sheila Josephine Harris was a young woman who won a beauty contest and was discovered dead in her own apartment. The police started looking for the murderer without realizing the repercussions it would have. Sheila Josephine Harris was born on February 26, 1963, 
in Douglas County, Nevada. She knew she wanted to be an actress or a model from a young age. Therefore, she actively competed in numerous beauty contests during her school years. Sheila won a local beauty contest in her district in her senior year of high school and planned to compete for Miss Nevada and Miss Carson City in case of victory. Despite such ambitious plans, the young woman decided to pursue a higher education in the field of business and trade after graduating. They later remarried and had two more daughters, and Sheila actively assisted her mother in caring for her younger sisters. They tried to see each other as often as possible, but due to her studies and work, they were only able to spend time together a few times a week. On January 4, 1939, the young woman rented an apartment and took a part-time job at a supermarket to cover her living expenses. The young woman took her studies and work very seriously because she wanted to have a good education and provide for herself independently. Sheila was scheduled to start her morning shift at the supermarket the following day, so she wanted to go to bed early despite his injury. Stephen decided to see her off and they parted at the entrance to the residential complex the following day. Sheila did not show up for work. The store manager noticed her absence and was greatly alarmed. Stephen had recently broken his arm, and the young woman occasionally visited him. He once called Sheila's home phone, but there was no answer, so we got in touch with her mother to find out if anything had happened. At first, Sheila's mother assumed that Sheila had simply overslept, but when the building manager said he had called Sheila's home phone, the woman became alarmed. She decided to visit Sheila's apartment, but she asked a friend to go with her because she was too worried and afraid to go alone. The mother arrived at. She entered the apartment and was greeted by a horrifying scene that caused her to scream. Sheila lay in bed without any signs of life. Blood was all around her, and bruises could be seen all over her neck. Although a friend had tried to prevent the mother from seeing this heartbreaking scene, the woman still went inside and saw her dead daughter. When the police arrived, they started to investigate the crime scene and discovered that the young woman had been strangled and had suffered severe injuries. Medical examiners determined that the young woman had been tied up and subjected to violence. The perpetrator had dealt her several blows, probably with a board or other heavy piece of wood, and then strangled her with an electric cable, which caused her death. Investigators were unable to find the board or the cable in the apartment but they did find wood chips underneath Sheila's clothing and body. In 1982, professionals were able to remove biological evidence from the murderer, who may have been the murder weapon, but they could now perform a DNA test. The brutality with which the attacker treated his victim initially led the detectives to believe that this crime could have been committed haphazardly and that the perpetrator might be mentally unstable. However, it soon became evident that this attack was meticulously planned. First, there were no signs of forced entry on the door, which means that the attack was carried out without using force. Investigators believe that the perpetrator was not a first-time offender and may have been a serial killer or someone who had previously committed a similar crime because Sheila must have allowed the perpetrator in on her own. No one else in the apartment building heard anything, and the killer took a wire and a wooden board, depriving the police of two crucial pieces of evidence. Sheila chose the apartment because the rent was low and she could not afford to live in a more prestigious neighborhood on her salary from the supermarket. This only complicated the police's work since many people in the neighborhood knew Sheila. With almost no evidence, investigators started looking for witnesses. They interviewed all the building's residents, but none of them noticed anything suspicious that night. The first day, the police had the most obvious suspect. Sheila's boyfriend Stephen's statistics show that it is often people close to the victim who commit such crimes, and Stephen might have been the last person to see Sheila before the murder. He said he accosted her a month after the murder. Investigators carefully studied local residents and tried to identify who might be involved. They questioned about 70 men, but they were unable to establish their involvement. When local media learned that the detectives were considering Stephen as a suspect, they quickly learned that his family had strong ties to the police. His brother was the sheriff of Carson City, and his father previously held the same position before retiring, so as a result, newspapers started to smear the young man's name. The young man also had no alibi for the rest of that day and was unable to prove that he did not enter Sheila's apartment. Residents of Carson City demanded that the teenager be immediately arrested, and some even called for the death penalty. The situation was further complicated by the Carson City residents' conviction 
that Stephen was responsible for the crime and that his brother and father were using their position and connections to conceal it. This led to people protesting, writing angry letters to Stephen and his family, and even threatening violence. Investigators tried to determine if the boy had a motive for committing such a crime after speaking with Sheila's friends and learning that the couple had never experienced any significant issues and that the young woman had never complained of aggression from Stephen. In addition, the victims had serious injuries that required the killer to exert significant effort, and Stephen had a broken arm at the time. He was also arrested for being drunk in public. The detectives started to believe the boy was innocent as a result of this, but it was too late. Under pressure from the public's threats and constant accusations, Stephen committed suicide before he could be completely cleared of suspicion. As a result, the police had only one candidate for the murderer's role. David Winfield Mitchell, a gardener and handyman who was assigned to the apartment building where Sheila lived. However, there was no direct evidence pointing to Mitchell as the murderer. When suspicions against Mitchell started to grow, detectives re-interviewed residents of the complex and other employees to see if anyone had noticed any strange or suspicious behavior from the gardener, and in doing so, they learned that the man could enter any apartment in the complex to perform some repair work, and that shortly after the murder, he resigned and left in an unknown direction. The police tried to find him, but he seemed to have disappeared. When attractive young women passed by, he kept his eyes off them and watched them silently until they disappeared from view. Several tenants thought this was odd, and investigators began to suspect that he was the person who killed Sheila. A man was declared wanted, but over the following years they were unable to find him. Meanwhile, forensic scientists had one more trick up their sleeves they discovered a hair in the victim's apartment that may have belonged to Mitchie. Tobago and experts were able to determine that the hair found matched his ethnicity. DNA analysis wasn't yet available in those days, so they couldn't determine a 100% match with Mitchell's DNA. In 1986, four years after the murder, the police finally received a lead on the man's whereabouts. He was living outside the state and was soon arrested. During questioning, Mitchell denied his guilt and the detective said only one thing, a hair that presumably belonged to him. Investigators continued to suspect Mitchell of killing the young woman, but they lacked solid evidence and realized the case had no chance of success in court. As a result, they decided to free Mitchell because no judge would have found him guilty based solely on one hair, which could have in fact been left there during cleaning. Since that time there have been no developments in this case. Sheila's mother learned about how new DNA analysis technologies could help solve such crimes and contacted the detective in charge of the case. The woman persuaded him to send the killer's biological material to the laboratory and request a comparison with Mitchell's. Since they couldn't prove the man's guilt, they practically put the investigation on hold until 1999, 13 years after the murder. After the 1986 interrogation, after a protracted wait, the investigators received the long-awaited results. The semen sample from the victim's body completely matched David Mitchell's DNA. Experts also concluded that the voice heard in the victim's apartment belonged to him. As a result, the police had 100% proof of Mitchell's guilt. However, Mitchell had returned to his native country and obtained employment as a security guard in a government institution. This presented a new challenge for the investigators. In order to extradite Mitchell, which was difficult, they had to go through all the bureaucratic red tape and demonstrate to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that Mitchell was the one who committed the murder. This process took several years, and federal authorities in the state government engaged in talks with the other state for the following seven years, until 2006, when a decision was finally made to extradite him. The suspect was brought to Carson City, and soon one of the most high-profile murder cases in recent memory took place there. Second, journalists focused heavily on the fact that the victim's friend Stephen had committed suicide due to accusations against him. The court had to decide whether David was the real killer or whether the entire town mistakenly believed Stephen was guilty. Mitchell's attorney used these societal uncertainties in his strategy and insisted that David was not the real killer. They had another indirect argument on the day of the murder. Stephen had a cast on his hand. First, the young man was unlikely to have been able to inflict all these injuries on the victim with one hand. 
Second, particles of the cast would undoubtedly have been found at the crime scene, but there were none. The prosecution side refuted these arguments by citing compelling evidence that DNA testing in modern conditions has extremely low chances of error. In the late 1960s, when the suspect was living in New York, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for assaulting three young women in their homes. Mitchell broke into their home, tied the women up with an electric cable, and subjected them to violence. After his release from prison, he moved. On the prosecution side, during the trial, they revealed information that had not been made publicly available before. In spite of his prior sentence, Mitchell received only three years in prison, of which he served one and a half years, and was released on parole. He was then supposed to be deported to his native country. However, the man vanished from the police, moved to Carson City, and got a job as a gardener in that same complex, all the while avoiding capture. The young women managed to fight him off. They called the police, and nine months later Mitchell was arrested. The investigation after Sheila's murder also raised concerns because the investigators had no knowledge of Mitchell's criminal history, contrary to the prosecution's version on the night of Sheila's murder. David knocked on her door and said that he had something he needed to do. If the system had not allowed him to leave so early, the young woman would likely still be alive. The same is true for the management of the residential complex, who, without knowing it, hired a serial rapist who fled from the police, which he used to stun the victim, and Mitchell committed all these crimes alongside her before fleeing the scene with the board and the electric cable. Because the jury reached a unanimous verdict in less than 30 minutes, David was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, but his attorney argued for leniency by pointing out that Mitchell had been reformed and had lived an honest life for 25 years after the murder. David was 63 years old when we started his prison term. He spent most of his life on the run, and now he only has to spend the rest of his days in prison. Sheila's mother thanked the court for not allowing this monster to walk free. She claimed that if he hadn't been released early in the 1980s, her daughter would still be alive today. However, one question still remained that perplexed investigators. How did he get away with it? The offender was obviously serial, so it is likely that he may have attacked other women. He evaded capture for 25 years, so it is likely that his acts may have caused harm to other people. However, it is unclear whether the police will be able to find the truth. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it, thank you for watching. When a young woman went to the parking lot of her school to go to a sporting event, she disappeared without a trace. Soon, a very creepy discovery was made, and the police got involved. It took detectives 28 years to solve this creepy mystery, and none of them knew it would be the first of its kind. Sarah Yarborough was born in Portland, Oregon, on June 12, 1975. Her parents soon moved to a different state and settled in the town of Federal Way, which is close to Seattle and is basically a suburb of it, had two brothers and helped her parents take care of the youngest one. She was close to him from a young age. Sarah was involved in music and ballet. She worked hard in school so she could get into a good college. Because of her good grades, she went to New Zealand twice as part of a school program. Later, Sarah joined her school's cheerleading team. She also had a lot of friends. Sarah was 16 when she went to an event with her cheerleading team. They met at the school building where the bus would pick them up. But Sarah got the time wrong. She thought the bus would pick them up at 8 a.m., but it was not supposed to come until 9 a.m. Sarah's friends started to arrive, but no one saw her. Some students saw her car in the parking lot, but there was no young woman. Students thought this was strange, but no one could reach Sarah because none of them had cell phones at the time. Around the same time, two 12-year-old boys were walking around the school grounds. They saw a strange man come out from behind some bushes, look at them, and walk away in the opposite direction. The boys thought he was strange, but they did not pay much attention and kept walking. The children thought she was dead when they saw her lying on the ground with no signs of life. They ran home to tell their parents, and the parents of one of the boys went with him to the scene. The father of the other boy decided to follow the suspicious man the children had seen. His son told him that he saw a car that looked like a Chevrolet Nova pull away from that spot. Since he lived near the school, he went outside to try to find that car. At one point, he was able to the man lost sight of it, and he could not find it again. In the meantime, 
the other boy's parents came to the school and realized that the young woman on the ground was probably dead. They ran to the school building and called the police. When the police arrived, they confirmed that the young woman was indeed dead. From the marks on her neck, they were also able to quickly figure out that the dead woman was Sarah. They concluded that the victim had probably been strangled. Officers found Sarah's shoes, pants, and socks, but nothing else. They found her purse and car keys inside the car in the school parking lot, which led them to think that she may have been attacked right next to the car and then dragged behind the trees. The body was taken to a medical examiner, and the police started looking for clues. Bushes near her body. They said he was a tall man in his early 20s with shoulder-length blonde hair, a dark raincoat, and black trousers. Soon, the police found another witness with a very surprising story. A man out for a jog saw a strange scene in the same wooded area. A young woman was lying next to some bushes, and a man was hovering over her. The young woman was not moving at all, so the witness thought that in both cases, the man and the young woman were still on the side of the road. It did not seem to him that a crime was being committed. The witness told the police that he had just moved to the U.S. from another country and did not know what was normal behavior there. However, he still gave the police a rough description of the killer that matched what the children said about him, who had been near the school, but no other useful leaves were found. In the meantime, medical experts looked at Sarah's body and decided that this triangulation was the cause of her death. Apparently, the person who killed her used her own tights. In addition, a serious injury was found on the young woman's head. The experts thought that from this below, the victim lost consciousness, which was consistent with the runner's story. He saw that the young woman on the ground did not move at all. In almost every piece of Sarah's clothing, they found traces of male semen from the same person. However, in 1991, there was no common DNA database, so all the detectives could do was compare DNA samples from specific suspects. The medical examiner also told the detectives that Sarah's body showed no signs of sexual abuse, even though forensic scientists had found traces of male semen on her clothes. Sarah got to school almost an hour early, and she was the only one in the parking lot. Her killer probably saw her there and waited for her to get out of the car, then hit her on the head with something until she lost consciousness. He then dragged her from the parking lot and put her behind some trees, where her body was later found. The killer took off some of Sarah's clothes and did sexual acts on her before strangling her with her own belt. Police were able to find Sarah's body because it was in a Chevrolet Nova. However, they were disappointed to find out that the driver of that car had just been delivering donuts that morning. His DNA did not match that found on Sarah's clothes. It seems that the kids just saw the car driving down the road next to them and thought the killer was in it. Over the next few days, police continued to look for witnesses and new leads but they did not make much progress. On Monday, school started again, even though all the students were horrified by what had happened. The murder had happened only a few meters from their school, and the killer's identity was still unknown. The young women were afraid. Teams arranged to walk each student to her car or bus so they would not be left alone on the street. Detectives found that there were about 70 potential witnesses in and around the school that morning, and they talked to each of them. However, they did not learn anything new. Based on what the two children and the jogger said, a rough sketch of the killer was made and sent to all local newspapers and TV stations. The story got a lot of media attention. Hundreds of tips came in, and investigators looked into each one, but none of them led anywhere. At one point, they got a tip about a man who fit the killer's description and had a criminal history, but his DNA did not match the killer's sample. Since then, the case has been on hold for many months. In total, the police got about 4,000 different leads, and they tried to follow each one. But they did not have enough resources. As investigators continued to look for the killer and new cases came up every month, time was also working against them. When Sarah's family found out that the police did not have enough resources to handle all the tips, her grandfather did what he could to help. He worked for a technology company and persuaded management to give the police department a very powerful computer with 150,000 memory chips. Still went along with it. With this computer, police officers could store information about all the leads in one place, process them faster, and sort them in a way that made them easy to study. Despite this, every lead led them down a dead end, and in the years that followed, they made no progress. Two years later, Sarah's classmates graduated, and before graduation, 
they decided to honor their friend. They raised a lot of money and used it to build a memorial to Sarah. In metal next to these things was a picture of the young woman's dog reaching for her purse. Over the years that followed, the case was reopened and all the evidence was looked at again, but the police were still unable to find out who did it. During this time, the police talked to thousands of people and took DNA samples from nearly 300 possible suspects, but none of this helped. In 2011, 20 years after the woman went missing, the case was still unsolved. He heard about a company that was working in the field of genetic genealogy. The policeman contacted the company and asked if they could try to find relatives of the person whose DNA was found on the victim's body. Unfortunately, they failed. In 2011, genetic genealogy was just starting to become popular, so the experts did not know how to search for both male and female relatives. DNA of a man, they could only look for family ties with other men, and vice versa. They also had to deal with laws that said they could not use genetic data samples to look for relatives of suspects. However, it did lead to some interesting results. For example, the team of researchers the detective approached had already been working for years to make a genetic pedigree of the first people who came to the United States. After looking at the killer Sarah's DNA, they found that he was related to one of the ship's passengers, Robert Fuller. However, it was almost impossible to track him down this way since there were just over 100 people on the ship at the time. But over the centuries, they have had more than 25 million descendants. Also, the detectives did not know that he had made the Sarah Yarborough case the first of its kind, even though his idea was not new. The detective tried to use the information he had and track down several men with the fuller surname who lived in his town at the time of Sarah's murder. He found photos of them and met the only witness, a jogger, and two men who had found the body as children. Unfortunately, neither of them recognized the killer in the photo. Finally, the investigators asked for DNA samples from every fuller in the area and sent them to a lab. Experts found that one of the men was a distant descendant of Robert Fuller from that same ship. However, he was not the killer, and he did not even know that any distant relatives lived near him. The killer may have been so distantly related to him that his family never knew of the connection. The detective retired in 2017, and the case was given to a new team of investigators, Test in 2011. By that time, scientists knew a lot more about how to study genetic material, so they agreed to try to trace the killer's family tree. It took them two years. First, they used public databases to find even the most distant relatives of the killer. Then, they tried to manually trace their family ties to find people who lived in Federal Way at the time of Sarah's death. In total, they had to get rid of several thousand people before they found the right one. Sarah's clothes most likely belonged to one of her two brothers, who were 33 and 27 years old at the time of the murder. The older brother, Patrick Nicholas, turned out to be a violent criminal with a long criminal record. His DNA sample was in the FBI database, so he could not have killed Sarah because his DNA would have shown a match back in the 1990s. The younger brother, Patrick Nicholas, has also been on the police's radar. Radar for violent crimes, including crimes against children. But that was before the DNA samples of such criminals were added to the database. Detectives immediately set up a surveillance of the man. The man, who was 55 at the time, lived in a nearby town called Wellington, the police had been watching his every move for two days, and soon the chance came up. Patrick went to the laundry, and while he was waiting for his clothes to be washed, he went outside to smoke. The police put it in a bag marked Evidence and went back to Patrick's car. The next time Patrick went outside to smoke, a handkerchief fell out of his pocket. The men did not pick it up and went back to the laundry room. The police were happy to take the second piece of evidence in case the experts could not get a DNA sample from the cigarette bite. However, the experts were able to get samples from all of these items easily, and the very next day they arrested the... The sperm that was found on Sarah's clothes in 1991 was a perfect match for Patrick's DNA. The judge immediately issued a warrant for the man's arrest, and the police took him into custody. It took five days from when investigators first learned his name to when he was officially charged with murder. When his biography was leaked to the media, many people began to ask why a man with such a criminal history was not even considered a suspect for all those 28 years. At age 19, Patrick Nicholas went up to a police officer and said, 
I am the guy who killed my mother. Young young woman and got into her car, where he tried to abuse her. The victim was able to get away, but she had to jump into the river and swim for a long time to get far enough away. Patrick spent four years in prison, and then he was let out. The next time the police caught him, he was trying to abuse an underage young woman. He was arrested again, but his DNA was not in any database. Patrick's biological grandfather was adopted and grew up under the adoptive family name. One of the men who found Sarah's body as children in 1991 said Patrick was without a doubt the killer, and he admitted it. He was only 12 years old when the body was found, but the killer had known him for years. The witness was always afraid that the killer would come after him, and it was not until Patrick's arrest that he finally felt safe. Patrick's trial did not start until 2023. The man insisted he was innocent, and his lawyer tried to challenge the main evidence, DNA, which showed that Patrick's semen was on the victim's body. Lawyer also tried to question the accuracy of the DNA analysis, but experts said that those claims were completely false. Patrick was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder, without premeditation. On May 25th, he was given a sentence of 45 years and 8 months in prison, which makes it very unlikely that he will ever get out. During the reading of that sentence, Patrick did not show any emotion, unlike Sarah's family, who spoke to the judge about how they were thinking about Sarah. Investigators for bringing the killer to justice, even though he had avoided justice for 28 years. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you liked it. Thanks for watching. The student got off the bus and was nowhere to be found. Without a trace, her body was found in a field the next day. The police looked for the killer for 39 years, but it was not until 2019 that they were able to find out what really happened. We will tell you what happened. Helene Sinsky. Helene Przinsky was born on April 6, 1958, in Huntington, which is near New York City. She was the youngest of three children. Her older brother and sister were 12 and 9 years old, respectively. The girl grew up with love and care, got along well with her older relatives, and was a positive, bright person. When she was 14, her father got a job offer, and the family had to move to the small town of Hamilton near Boston. There, she went to the local school and developed a passion for after high school. She went to Wheaton College, which was 110 kilometers from her town. It was close enough for her to visit her family often, and it also had a great writing program. Helen got used to being a college student quickly. She did well in school and was involved in college life. Eventually, she got a chance she was excited about. She was going to do an internship at a radio news station in Denver, even though the city was more than 3,000 miles away from our college. Helene was excited about the opportunity. In addition, her uncle and aunt lived in Denver and agreed to take her in for the internship. She also went with a classmate who studied journalism in January 1980. Helen, then 21, flew to Denver and began working at a radio station. Every day she had to take the bus from the office to her home. The trip took about 30 minutes after which she had to walk several miles. On January 16th, she left the radio station as usual at 6 p.m. and went to the bus stop. The only thing was that she never showed up at home. Her aunt immediately began to worry because Helen had always warned her before. If she planned to be somewhere late, the woman waited a few hours but at half past 11 she decided to go to the police after all investigators had already begun a search immediately fearing that her disappearance might be connected to a recent string of attacks on women in the area. They calmed the area along Helen's route all night, but could not find her in the morning. A woman approached the police she was driving her car through a suburban area of Denver with her children. At one point they noticed someone lying in a field near the road. The mother stopped. The car walked closer and saw the body of a young girl with no signs of life. The police arrived on the scene and immediately identified Helen. Her clothes were partially missing, her hands were tied behind her back, and all her personal belongings were also missing. Later medical experts determined that the girl had been stabbed nine times and abused. The death occurred between 8 and 10 p.m. A person who saw Helene get off the bus at 5.30 was able to be found by the cops. She had several kilometers to walk from the bus stop, and it appears that the perpetrator attacked her at that point. Law enforcement agencies surveyed the area near where the body was found, but they were unable to find almost any clues other than shoe impressions, presumably size 44. 
that led from the road to the body and back. By then, medical examiners had found biological material on the victim's body and clothing that appeared belonged to the killer, except that in those years it could not help the investigation because the science of studying DNA was only at an early stage of development. But the samples were sent to a laboratory for storage, hoping that they would help identify the perpetrator in the future. Police turned to the public for information using newspapers and local television they tried to find witnesses who might have seen Helen that night. Soon they were approached by a woman who at about 10.20 p.m. saw a man near the field where the body was found. He was standing on the side of the road next to a car. Unfortunately, it was dark outside at the time, and the woman could not get a good look at the man she provided the police with, only generalities that could not help them in any way. Then the detectives took a very interesting step with the consent of the witness. They invited a hypnotist to the station, and the woman was able to remember more details on the basis of which it turned out to draw a portrait of this unknown man. It is hard to say whether the hypnosis session really helped the investigation, but the fact remains that at that time the police had nothing but this drawing, but they could not find a single suspect, and the case froze for years Helen's college diploma was given to her after she died as a way to remember her. The school also named an alumni award after her because she was always involved in college life. The investigation was not reopened until 1998. Eighteen years after the murder by then, technology in the field of DNA research had progressed markedly and researchers had entered samples of biological material into the FBI database. Unfortunately, no matches were found. This meant that the perpetrator had no previous criminal convictions, at least not since they began taking DNA samples from convicts 15 more years past. And in 2013, the local police department created a unit to handle unsolved cases. They reopened the investigation into Helen's murder, but no new leads could be found. A DNA sample from the victim's body never showed up in the FBI database. This meant the girl's killer had not come to the attention of the police for other possible crimes all this time. Throughout all these years, Helen's relatives and police were not the only ones trying to find the truth. The girl's high school friends with whom she was in the choir took an active part in the investigation. Decades after her murder, they continued to press detectives to review the case regularly. They also gave interviews to get the story out to the public and distributed flyers about Helen's murder along her bus route. In 2017, the case was reopened again, and this time the detectives had much more to go on by this point. Forensics had begun to make extensive use of genetic genealogy, by which the perpetrator's identity could be deduced through his relatives. Of course, this was a very complicated and time-consuming process. Moreover, this method worked only in the case if the relatives of the DNA possessor were in the publicly available genetic databases. There are several of these, and they are mostly used to search for family members in 2018. Police turned over available DNA samples to the Parabon Lab, which had already helped solve hundreds of similar cases. Experts looked at about 3,000 matches, including even distant relatives of the alleged killer. They had to get rid of people who did not fit the age range or could not have committed the crime for other reasons. In the end, they decided that the person with the DNA was probably the son of a woman named June Estes, who was dead at the time. The problem was that she had four sons, but the lab was only able to identify two of them. They were 10 and 11 years old. A year went by before something unexpected happened. A woman named Jessie put her DNA sample into a public database which was the best way to find criminals. Experts at Parabon saw that Jesse was a close relative of Helen's killer and contacted her. After a more detailed DNA test, they found that Jesse's third cousin was the killer. Detectives asked the woman for information about her family to finally find the suspect. Immediately after uploading her data into the database, the woman began collecting information about her family tree and asked both of her parents to enter their DNA into the database. Through this, Experts at Parabon determined that the killer was related to Jesse on her father's side. Unfortunately, the search for an answer will drag on for several more months. Expert detectives and Jesse's family worked together to get closer to the owner of the DNA from the murder scene, and soon it finally happened. The cops were able to reach a relative of June Estes, and he gave new details about her older sons. It turned out that the woman suffered from mental problems, and after her next breakdown, her father took the boys and took them to another town. Their names were William and Curtis, 
and the detectives were to find out which one of them was the killer. The answer was not long in coming. The Cavs immediately discovered that William had been incarcerated multiple times and his DNA sample was entered into the FBI database in 2010. Given that the sample from Helen's body has been run through that database repeatedly since then, William was not the killer. The downside of this database is that it only shows a full match, not a partial match, even when brothers are involved. 39 years after the murder, the police had a prime suspect named Curtis White, who also went by the last name Clanton. It turned out that this man had a long criminal history. When he was 18, he knocked on a woman's door and asked to use her phone. Once inside, he grabbed a knife and abused the victim before running away. He was quickly caught and sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he was released after only four years because he was defended. Curtis moved in and got a job as a gardener in the area where Helen was killed. He later moved to Florida, which is where the officers went to look for him in 2019. Curtis was 62 years old at the time and worked as a trucker. Before charging him with Helen's murder, investigators wanted more hard evidence. After a week's surveillance, they got a hidden DNA sample from him, but it wasn't enough. Followed to a club, he confessed to a brutal murder, life sentence granted at 82. Victim's family found closure after almost 40 years, other cases possibly linked but unproven. Justice served partially. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you like it. Thanks for watching. A 28-year-old woman mysteriously vanished from her own home, leaving her bedroom light on. They had been looking for her for months, and the story started to sound like a detective show. The police had barely looked into the case, so the missing woman's parents turned to an independent team of former detectives. It was only thanks to them that the horrible truth came out. Kate Waring was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. She had two boys and loving parents who tried to give them the best of all. Kate loved animals from a young age and started volunteering at animal shelters when she was in her teens. She also danced, had many friends, and was a very positive person. It seemed like the woman grew up in a good place, and in some ways she did. However, just before she went to college, she told her parents that someone close to her family had abused her as a child. To be found, this was a big surprise for Kate's parents, who had no idea what their daughter had been going through for years. After the woman told them this terrible secret, her parents did everything they could to help her, but the effects of such a trauma only got worse over time. First, Kate had problems with alcohol, and then with drugs. At one point, her parents suggested she get help, and she agreed, home and live with her family, which was also supposed to help her deal with her problems. At the time, Kate was an adult and living on her own, but she agreed to come home anyway. At first, therapy seemed to be helping, but Kate still could not let go of the past and start living life to the fullest. The psychiatrist she went to diagnosed her with depression, but at one point, everything changed. Her father, who constantly yelled at her, died, offered to take Kate on a trip anywhere in the world she wanted. The woman was excited by the idea and soon decided she wanted to go beyond the Arctic Circle. Her dream was to see polar bears. Even though she had been hurt by animals, they started looking for tours and soon bought tickets. They were going to get to the Arctic Circle by ship, and Kate could not wait for this exciting journey. At this point, Kate's parents watched as her depression got worse. When they finally went on the trip, Kate was thrilled. She and her father had a great time and the woman gained a lot of good feelings on the ship that took them to the Arctic Circle. During the trip, Kate met another tourist from Russia. They talked and wrote to each other. By the end of the trip, Kate liked him, and after he went home, she decided to go to Russia. There, she met him again, and she even thought about staying in the country. Kate's visa was up for renewal, so she had to go back home. Despite this, it seemed like the woman had finally gotten over her depression. She planned to fix visa problems back home and even started writing a book for her kids. It seemed like her life was finally getting better. But on June 12, 2009, everything changed. Kate was home alone while her family was away on business. She always called her father to let him know she was okay, but she did not this time. He called Kate, but she did not answer. After a while, 
he asked his wife to come home and check on their daughter. Kate had had problems with alcohol and illegal drugs in the past, so her parents were still worried. When her mother got home, she did not find Kate there, but the light in her room was on. It looked like she had been out for a while and would be back soon. Her mother waited a few hours, but Kate still was not home. She also found that Kate had at home that needed to be taken regularly. Despite their worry, Kate's parents decided not to worry and wait for their daughter to show up. Kate was already 28 years old at the time, so they knew she could live her life. Kate's father decided to wait until Monday, when he would call the police. On Monday morning, the father got a call from the Beck. An employee told him that a man had come into the office and tried to cash more checks. Kate Waring they could not get in touch with the woman herself, and her father was in charge of her account. The whole thing seemed very strange. The woman's father knew that his daughter only had a few hundred dollars in her account, which is why the bank security service called him. They said the woman's signature looked real, and they gave the name of the man who had brought the check. His name was Ethan Mack, and he did not know him. Real One assumed that this man was a friend of his daughter's, but he still went to the police because Kate was still not talking to him. The police started looking into the man's disappearance, and the first thing they asked Ethan was about his relationship with the missing man. Ethan said that he had known Gay for years and that she had given him the check to pay off her old debts. He also said that he often gave her money for clothes, jewelry, and other purchases confirmed that she and Ethan had been friends for a long time. According to them, they had never been in a relationship, but they had always been close. Ethan said that he and Kate met on Friday night and went out to eat at a restaurant. After dinner, he drove Kate home and went about his own business. He even showed the detectives letters from Kate that backed up what he said about the dinner. Ethan let the detectives look around his house, where he lived with his wife and the situation with the check was still strange to the police, so they were not in a hurry to let him go. Eventually, Ethan called the police station and asked them to leave him alone. The police tried to piece together what happened on that Friday night when Kate was last seen. She went to see her therapist in the afternoon, then to the gym, then to the store, where she bought a bottle of wine. Surveillance cameras caught her talking to someone, but they could not figure out who it was. During the investigation, she may have been talking to Ethan, who later picked her up and took her to a restaurant. The woman's parents also remembered that on the day she went missing, Kate told them she was in trouble, but she would not say what it was about. They did not remember this until a few days later. Unfortunately, none of this helped in any way, and as the weeks went by and the woman was still missing, her parents thought the police were not doing enough. Kate Waring's case was given a second chance, and a group of former police officers led by a lawyer named Andy Savage took it on. This group had been looking into cold cases on their own, and Kate Waring's case interested them in particular. The group was made up of five men all of whom had a lot of law enforcement experience. One of them was former Detective James Randolph, who first looked in Kate's bedroom. There, he noticed two suspicious things. The first was a package he was worried that she would never skip a drug on her own, and the fact that she had left the package at home was a red flag. Next, he found Chinese money on Kate's bed. This was strange, because Kate's parents had no idea where the woman got the money or why she needed it. Then. A team member named Bobby Minner got involved. He was an expert at finding information about people on the internet and finding them. His skills came in handy. Kate called her friend James around 10 p.m., but he did not answer. She left him a very disturbing voicemail in which she said that someone had stolen her credit cards. He went on to find out that her phone was last used at 1.53 a.m when she called her own voicemail box number. For some reason, Bobby found out that the hall was made from the James Island area, which was just a few miles from Kate's house. He talked to a few people he knew who lived in James Island and found out something strange. Ethan Mack, who had agreed to let the police check out his and his mother's house, did not actually live there. Instead, he rented an apartment in a nearby building. Eugene was very lucky to find out these details because one of his close friends turned out to be the owner of the apartment Ethan had rented. As the team of detectives dug deeper, they found out that Ethan Mack had the team decided to look into the case on their own. They found out that Ethan had a girlfriend named Heather Camp. When they asked Kate's parents if they knew the woman, 
Kate's mother told them a strange story about how she met Heather a month before she went missing. She and Kate were on the same train from Washington, D.C., where the woman was having trouble getting her visa to Russia. After meeting Ethan, the woman was going to Russia. Kate agreed to help and loaned her a certain amount of money. A few days later, Heather told Kate that her daughter had died in a car accident in New Jersey, which made no sense. Heather did not go to New Jersey, and her behavior suggested that her daughter's death did not bother her. Another strange fact was that an Indiana fraud case had been filed against Heller. This was because she was pretending to be a licensed doctor and forging the necessary documents. The team gathered a lot of information that made them look at the case from a different angle. They gave all of this information to the police, but they did not want to look into the case any further. The team realized that the only way to get the police to look into the case was to give them false information. In order to find out what happened to Ethan, the team took extreme measures. First, Eugene Frazier asked a friend who rented Ethan's apartment to put a hidden camera in front of the door. They also put a hidden GPS tracker on Ethan's car. This let the team track his movements and see what he was up to. It was not long before it paid off. After looking at Ethan's itinerary, the former detectives figured out that he had been to followed his steps and found out that at each of these pawn shops, the man sold different pieces of jewelry in small batches. Unfortunately, they could not find out if the jewelry belonged to Kate, but the detectives felt like they were getting close to a clue. After a while, they ran into a big problem. The owner of the apartment where Ethan and Heather were staying told them that he was going to kick them out for not paying rent. The team knew that if they moved out, they would lose so. They tried hard to persuade the owner not to do it. At the same time, the detectives quickly came up with a new plan. They asked the owner to give Ethan and Heather more time to pay their rent, but they had to sign a contract promising to pay it back. This trick worked, and as soon as the landlord gave the team this contract, they sent it to the lab. Their goal was to compare Ethan and he to see if they were the same person. Signature on the very check for $4,000. And here they have their long-awaited break. The specialist said with absolute certainty that the signature on the check was written by the same person who had signed Heather on the contract. This meant that it was Heather who had forged Kate's signature. But the team knew that the lazy police would not listen to them. So they came up with a new plan. Ethan that the apartment needed to be treated for bugs. The head of the team put on an exterminator suit and went to the apartment with the owner ahead of time. The detectives waited until Ethan left the apartment and noticed that his car had pulled away from the house. When James and the owner went inside, they got an unpleasant surprise. Ethan was at home. It turned out that Heather was driving his car, but it was too late to call off the whole operation, so James had to change his plans. James listened to the story about the need to get rid of the bugs and asked Ethan to wait outside the apartment while dangerous chemicals were sprayed. Ethan, who did not suspect anything, agreed and went outside at the same time James started to carefully search the apartment for any evidence that might link Ethan to Kate's disappearance. James looked in Ethan's backpack and looked at what was inside. Chinese money was the first clue, since the same bills were on Kate's bed. James could not find any more clues, so he and the landlord pretended to do the processing and left. The team had to come up with a new plan. When they looked at the camera footage in front of Ethan's apartment, they noticed that one man came in a lot. It turned out that this man was a neighbor of the couple named Terry Williams. The detective thought that Williams might know something about Ethan and Heather's role in Kate's disappearance, so they took a risk and decided to would tell the police what Williams' friends had done to Kate. They took the bag of cash and went to William's apartment with this offer. However, the detectives were in for a surprise. When they knocked on William's door and told him about their offer, Heather was there and heard everything. It turned out that Heather was cheating on Ethan with Williams. When Heather heard the detectives talking to Williams, she got scared. She called Ethan and screamed. Williams over the next few days, they tried to figure out what to do next. But then another surprise happened. William called them and invited them to his house for a talk. When the detectives got there, he told them that Ethan and Heather had not told him anything directly, but he thought they had done something bad to Kate. He then took an iPod off the shelf and said that Heather had given it to him just days after Kate went missing. iPod, and thanks to the serial number, 
they were able to figure out that it did belong to Kate. This set of clues was enough to send the team back to the Charleston Police Department, and this time the local cops could not shrug off the job. After looking at everything the team had found, they finally arrested Ethan and Heather. At the first interview, Heather agreed to help with the investigation as long as the police helper got minimal punishment. Wadmala Island, about 20 miles from her home, the police sent out a search party and combed the area all day. But Kate's body was not there. It soon became clear that Heather had just lied to them. Andy Savage then came up with another plan. He knew that Heather was probably involved in Kate's murder, but he met with her and said he would help. Heather is sure that this is her only chance, and Kate agrees. She said that Kate's body is still on the outskirts of Wadmala Island, near Polly Point Road. She also gave a specific location. The detectives went there without the police, and they were disappointed when they did not find Kate. But the next day, they went back, and they did. The woman's remains were found, but medical examiners could not figure out what killed her. In August 2009, Heather signed a confession to murder, obstructing justice, and check fraud. The police found that the woman had been a con artist for years, and on that train from Washington, D.C., she chose Kate as her next victim. She later started dating Ethan, but he was not in a hurry to plead guilty, and his trial started in October 2010. On the day she went missing, Kate found out that Heather had cheated on her and stolen her credit cards. She threatened to tell her father, who would probably call the police. Heather told Ethan, who sided with her even though she had been friends with Kate for a long time. According to the investigation, Kate had dinner that night with Ethan and Heather. Heather was also there. Heather may have promised Kate that she would return the credit cards and money that were in Ethan's apartment. When all three of them got to the restaurant, Heather could not take it anymore and attacked Kate. The court did not believe Heather's story and gave her 39 years in prison. Ethan, on the other hand, got 25 years. The difference is because Heather was also charged with fraud. It could be the basis for detective movies. On the one hand, we have Kate who was hurt badly as a child and turned to alcohol and other drugs. She found the strength to change her life for the better and beat her depression. On the other hand, we have the sad fact that her life was cut short by a mix of betrayal and greed. Ethan Mack was her close friend for years, but he killed her for the sake of his new lover. When they found out that the woman had a history of drug problems, they put the case on hold. This is where people with useful skills and a desire for justice came to the rescue. A group of independents did more than the entire police department and it was only because of them that the killers were sent to jail and Kate's family was relieved of the heavy burden of ignorance. It is important to note that not a single police officer was involved in the case to the truth. And what do you think about these minor infractions? Is it possible to use surveillance and fake searches to show that someone killed someone? Leave your thoughts in the comments. And if you like the movie, do not forget to click the likes button. During a fire, a 19-year-old student was discovered dead in her own apartment, but the fire was not the cause of her death at all. The detective realized right away that they were dealing with a murder, but there was little to no evidence to support their suspicions. The police have many suspects, but only one tiny, seemingly insignificant detail helped them solve the case. Missy Gruba was born on April 26, 1974 in the American city of Burleson. Texas. Because of her family's humble lifestyle, she worked a variety of part-time jobs during her school year to help pay for her own schooling. Missy decided that she wanted to be a teacher even before graduating, and in 1992, she enrolled at the University of Texas at Arlington, which was about 40 kilometers from her home. Missy also decided to rent a place closer to campus and work two jobs to pay her rent and tuition without the help of her parents, but sometimes even that wasn't enough to cover a bill. In addition, she received good grades and participated actively in the local church even before graduation. Despite having a busy schedule, Missy called her mother every day when she got home. It had become a tradition for them that their daughter would call her and let her know that she had returned from work, even if it was already night. On the evening of April 7, 1994, Missy also called her mother. They spoke for about 10 hours. The young woman was in the middle of her senior year of high school. Around 3 a.m., 
Missy's downstairs neighbor called the police to report hearing loud noises coming from the apartment upstairs, including breaking glass and banging. Thinking there might have been a robbery going on, she called the police. The squad arrived on the scene, and a short time later, the fire department received a call to the same address. It turned out that there had been a fire. Since the building was small, the firefighters were able to locate the source of the fire, which was Missy's apartment on the second floor. When the firefighters entered the apartment, they saw a terrible sight. The young woman was lying on the bed with no clothes on, and the fire was raging all around her. The firefighters immediately realized she was dead so as to evacuate the residence. When the firefighters first arrived at the young woman's apartment, they smelled a strong gasoline odor. After thoroughly inspecting the apartment, the firefighters were confident that they were dealing with intentional arson. Someone had stabbed the young woman several times, leaving numerous bloody wounds on the bed. As for the fire itself, the firefighters immediately believed that it was purposeful arson as well as when they first arrived at her apartment they smelled a strong gasoline odor. Dead young woman inside, but the arsonist had shut the front door, reducing the size of the fire and making it difficult for the flames to continue to burn. The police quickly identified the deceased as Missy Gruba, and while her body was handed over to the medical examiners, they came to the conclusion that she had passed away before the fire began. This was supported by the stab wounds on her body and the absence of smoke tra. They also discovered that the girl had been abused and were able to obtain a sample of the abuser's DNA as a result. The police discovered a knife in Missy's apartment that they believed to be the murder weapon but there were no prints on it and it appeared the killer had washed it in the sink before setting it on fire. The DNA sample from the victim's body was also ineffective. The police had their first lead almost immediately because it turned out that Missy had filed a police report on a co-worker she had worked with at the coffee shop a young guy had lost his place and was looking for someone to stay with for a while until he could find a new apartment of all his co-workers. Missy was the only one who agreed to help and let him stay with he regardless of her. The co-worker only stayed there for a few days. One day, Missy returned from work and was about to deposit the day's tips into her piggy bank. She continued to set aside small sums to supplement her tuition and rent until she had nearly $1,000 saved up. However, that day, the young woman discovered that all of her money had vanished. Since no one else had spare keys, she immediately accused her co-worker. He denied wrongdoing, but Missy insisted. When the young woman went to the police, the man may have harbored resentment toward her and decided to exact revenge. If he hadn't known that Missy had already done so, he might have killed her just to prevent her from doing it. The police began looking for this man. He had quit his job and vanished, so the investigators had a pretty good suspect. The man had the keys to Mrs. Apartment, so he had no trouble getting in. The letters were found in the victim's apartment, and judging from their contents, he and Missy were having some sort of relationship. They didn't live too far apart, but they frequently wrote to and from each other. The young woman was a devout Christian who had never had a boyfriend. She also mentioned in her letters that she wouldn't be ready for an intimate relationship until she was married. Her companion initially shared this viewpoint, but over time the letter's contents grew more explicit. The detectives were pleased with their discovery and decided to run the man through the database. To their surprise, they learned that he had a prior conviction for violent crimes. Given that Missy had also been seen before the murder, this was enough to make the young man a suspect. He was found in question, but he denied any involvement and had no good alibi. The boy claimed he was sleeping alone in his house when Missy was killed, but Missy was killed between midnight and 3 in the morning so his claim had a third suspect the met. Itchment of the cafe where Missy worked told them about an incident that occurred just before her death. The young woman reported to the manager that one of her co-workers, Jeff, had stolen some items or money from the cash register. The theft charges were confirmed and the man was fired afterwards. He later caught up with Missy and started accusing her of losing his job and leaving him without a livelihood. During this conversation he said he was going to kill himself. During this conversation he said he was going to kill himself. During all of this was more than enough for the police to question the man. But while the detectives were attempting to learn his address, something unexpected occurred. Jeff's girlfriend entered the station and claimed she was afraid of her boyfriend and suspected him of killing Missy. It turned out that the man had not been home the night of the murder and he had never been there before. 
When he was found and brought in for questioning, Jeff acted very brazen and kept smiling. He bombarded the detectives with various stories that were inconsistent with reality, claiming that Missy was actually obsessed with him and wanted to date him and that was why his behavior was so bad. The man repeatedly mentioned the story that he had been fired because of a complaint from Missy and he had been furious about what she had done. When the detective said that Jeff's girlfriend denied this alibi and that he was at home with her the night of the murder, he just laughed and said that Jeff did agree to provide his DNA sample voluntarily given that there was no evidence against him and the DNA analysis could have taken over a month. However, a few days later, Jeff's girlfriend called the police, upset and reported that the man had kidnapped her. He held her hostage for eight hours, threatening to kill her if she tried to flee. Eventually, he released her, and the young woman immediately called the police. They started looking for Jeff right away, but he had already escaped. Despite this, the detectives were almost certain that he was responsible for Missy's murder. They put out a search for him on a kidnapping charge, but the man seemed to have vanished. Meanwhile, experts at the lab were able to almost certain that Jeff was the murderer, but the lab's results disproved the theory. As a result, they were left with only one suspect who had not provided his DNA sample and who had not yet been found, a colleague of the victim who she had allowed to stay with her but a month had passed since the murder and the plea police were shocked to learn that both samples from Jeff and Missy's boyfriend had a different blood type. As mentioned earlier, Missy occasionally worked as a nanny. One of her regular clients was a young couple who lived in the same complex. They had a young child and the woman was pregnant with her second or partners. Missy's mother called the investigators and said she remembered a strange detail the young woman had told her on the phone a few days before she died. She didn't give it much thought and didn't decide to share with the police until a month later. According to the mother's account, a few days before her daughter's death, a man came to Missy's house to talk even though it was getting close to nightfall she let him and Lewis told her that his relationship with the young woman had been strained recently and that he just needed someone to talk to but what followed was something that struck the police as extremely strange Missy said to her mother that after the chow, she told her that after the chow, Lewis told her that he was going to detectives found it difficult to believe that a 32-year-old man and his father would visit a 19-year-old woman's home at midnight and then engage in a pillow fight. But according to Missy's account of the incident, that is exactly what happened in a conversation with her mother. Missy didn't give it much thought, but the police decided to check on the man and discovered that Lewis had no criminal history, had served in the army, and was a model employee at the restaurant. But Lewis said, I hope they catch whoever killed and raped Missy as soon as possible. He later added that they might never find the offender because all the evidence was destroyed in the fire. The problem was that the police never revealed that the victim had been abused before she died. It wasn't in the newspapers or reports, and it wasn't mentioned in any interviews. The man was calm and forthright in his responses to all of the police inquiries until the detectives asked him for a DNA sample, at which point Lewis became visible, nervous and questioned why they needed his DNA since the fire was supposed to destroy all traces of the perpetrator and his sample would have nothing to compare it to. The man said that he and Missy did talk a lot but that he had nothing to do with her murder. Lewis' behavior changed dramatically when the detectives told him they had a sample of the killer's DNA. He said he urgently needed to take his child somewhere and left the station promising to return the next day to take the DNA test but he never did. It is important to note that the police also withheld the fact that the experts received a sample of the killer's DNA so no one knew whether they had this evidence or not. Man was no longer working there. The manager reported that the man's girlfriend had called and asked for Lewis to take a few days off because he had to leave town. Additionally, the detectives learned that Lewis had married his girlfriend the day after he was questioned. At this point, they could only speculate as to the motivation behind the marriage, but first they decided to speak with his wife, who revealed that Lewis had called her from work the day of the murder and announced that he was going to leave town. Lewis told his wife that he had run by Missy's house and noticed the fire. He went up to her apartment and saw that the place was engulfed in flames and the young woman herself was lying on the bed. Lewis tried to save her by giggling. He returned after 2 a.m. and his wife noticed that he smelled strongly of smoke and gasoline. 
The man was also coughing constantly and his nose had traces of soot. His wife asked him what had happened, forced him to run outside reportedly his wife was pleased with the story, and they went to bed as you have already realized the detectives found a number of suspicious. His points in the story even setting aside the fact that the man decided to go for a run in the middle of the night. His further story defies any sense of reason. First, how could he have gotten into Missy's apartment without keys after the fire forensics found no evidence of forced entry on the door according to Lewis's account? He entered the victim's apartment after she had already passed away. Additionally, if his account is to be believed, Lewis decided to go to bed after witnessing the death of a young woman he had known for a year and a full-fledged fire in the home next door. His wife, it appears, did not feel the need to intervene either. The police also learned Lewis's blood type from his wife and it matched the blood type found on the victim, sufficient to place a man on the wanted list, but his whereabouts remained unknown. The wife also claimed that she didn't know where her husband had gone, but the detectives didn't believe her by that point. Instead, they suspected that the woman was purposefully protecting Lewis because, in their opinion, he had given her a significantly altered account of the murder in which he had no choice or Missy had attacked him herself. In other words, he had persuaded her under false pretense immediately after Lewis's wife gave them information about where he might be. Police from the city of San Antonio discovered a burnt-out car that belonged to Lewis and that his mother lived in the same city. Detectives went there and found the man, who was then arrested at the station. He acted extremely tense, lying on the floor sobbing, and generally looked like he was on the verge of a breakdown. Lewis's story then turned genuinely bizarre when he said he didn't remember how events unfolded after that but he may have stabbed her while denying that he had set the apartment on fire the man did not actually deny his involvement in setting the fire. This account did not go well with the fact that the young woman's body was found with many wounds and bruises, let alone the fire. Given that Lewis did not directly confess, the case went to trial and the man continued to maintain that he and Missy had a consensual intimate relationship that night. This made the detective's job difficult, but now they could take a sample of his DNA at that point. They already knew that Lewis's blood type matched the killer's, and all they had to do was wait for the DNA results. Eventually, the experts found a perfect match, and Lewis was charged with murder. According to the investigation, Lewis claimed that he did not remember stabbing Missy but did remember getting a knife from the kitchen. He also claimed that he remembered that there was a fire in the room but that he did not start it. Lewis had long had a crush on Missy and was even somewhat obsessed with her because of this one intriguing fact. He had lived in her condominium and worked in the same restaurant as her for almost a year. In addition, in the days prior to the murder, Lewis had visited Missy around midnight for no apparent reason, which also seemed odd to the investigators. According to their version, Lewis had gone to her apartment on the night of the murder in order to persuade Missy to have intimate contact with the young woman who was the victim of the murder. There were hundreds of similar complexes in their city, so it would be logical to assume that Lewis had chosen this particular place in order to live closer to Missy. Possibly the story about the run and the attempt to save Missy came about only after investigators began to suspect Lewis and informed him that the fire had not destroyed the killer's DNA upon learning this Lewis could have persuaded his wife to believe the story about the run and the attempt to save Missy. He and Lewis flew into a rage. He abused her then killed her and went to get gasoline after setting the apartment on fire. He returned home and told his wife some made-up story in which he detectives theorized that Lewis had married her only so she would be legally entitled to not testify against him. As for Lewis himself, the court sentenced him to life in prison with the possibility of petitioning for parole in 2034. However, aside from the young woman receiving CPR, it appears that his wife really didn't know the truth. She was also not charged in any way. The court determined that he had long sought to seduce the young woman and eventually decided to commit the crime after which he saw only one way out to kill Missy to avoid prison. As a result, the court concluded that he had long sought to seduce the young woman and eventually decided to commit the crime after which he saw only one way out to kill Missy to avoid prison. The police were able to solve a very complicated case in which the most improbable was the culprit they only attracted attention to. Lewis may have gotten away with it if it weren't for that small detail, and Jeff was eventually apprehended and sentenced to four years in prison for kidnapping his own girlfriend. 
Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like if you liked the video. Thanks for watching. A 16-year-old girl went out for a run and disappeared. The police launched an investigation that would eventually last for 38 years. When the truth did come out, people were literally shocked. It turned out that the case could have been solved in just a few weeks, but instead, it took almost four decades to find answers. In this video, we tell you what happened to Joyce McLean. Joyce McLean was born on September 4, 1963. When she was young, her family moved to a tiny town called Melnugget located almost on the edge of the United States. From an early age, she had a passion for music. The girl quickly mastered several instruments, but her favorite was the saxophone. She loved to compose her own compositions and was a member of the school music group. In addition, she was a member of the cheerleading team, played soccer, and in general was a very active participant in school life. At the end of the summer vacation in 1980, Joyce was preparing for her approaching age of 17. She had only recently received her driver's license, and she planned to go to the lakeshore with her friends and relatives to celebrate her birthday. She was even going to invite a local musical group to celebrate her birthday. Joyce had two more grades to finish after which she planned to go to college. The girl was preparing for this in advance, so she studied only with honors, as well as earning various sports and musical achievements. On August 8th, she and her friends spent the day at the lake. Afterward, she decided to go for a run. Joyce loved sports, but running was not her favorite activity. Despite that, she was going to play in high school soccer games during the new school year and she made every effort to keep herself in shape. The girl went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. Normally, she would run with her friend, but she was busy that night. Joyce had a standard route. She would do a few laps on the road that went around her tiny town. It usually took about an hour, but that night, the girl never made it home. Several hours had passed since Joyce had left, and her mother was beginning to get seriously worried. The girl always let her parents know where she was going, and if she had gone for a walk with friends after her run, her parents would have already known about it. Her mother decided to go looking for her and drove around town in her car. She asked around all the neighbors who came her way, but no one had seen Joyce. Considering the vast majority of the people in this small town knew each other, a few more people joined the search. Night was approaching, and the girl was still nowhere to be found. Then the concerned parents decided to call the police. Local officers immediately joined the search, and in the hours that followed, more and more citizens took to the streets. They combed the route Joyce was running, as well as the area behind the school. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Joyce. With each passing hour, panic increased, and there was little hope of finding Joyce alive and unharmed. It was the middle of the night, and the police had completely ruled out the possibility she might have gone out with some friends. The problem was that everyone she knew was at home and later joined the search. Joyce's parents simply couldn't imagine their daughter deciding to go out alone until very late at night. They were unable to locate her and the search dragged on for two days. During that time, police officers, along with residents, continued to explore the area until they finally made the heartbreaking discovery on August 10th. Joyce's body was found just 60 yards from the school playgrounds, not far from the trees. The girl was lying on the ground. Virtually all of her clothes were missing, and her hands were tied behind her back with a piece of blue cloth. The police immediately realized that the victim had been hit hard in the head, but a more detailed analysis was to be done by a medical expert. After examining the body, they concluded that the girl had received multiple blows to the head and that her death occurred on the evening of the same day she disappeared. Despite the almost total lack of clothing, the unknown perpetrator did not abuse her. Unfortunately, no other information could be obtained. There were no foreign DNA samples on the body, and even in the early 1980s, the technology was only in its infancy. The first person in history to be convicted thanks to DNA testing was not arrested until 1987. So, the police were faced with a complex investigation with a minimal set of clues. Shortly after the discovery of the body, officers discovered Joyce's clothes, but that did not bring them any closer to a solution either. News of the brutal murder quickly spread through the town plunging it into a very grim state. As is usually the case, 
the inhabitants of such tiny towns in the middle of nowhere had never encountered a murder. Adding to the anxiety was the fact that the killer was still out there, and his identity remained unknown. Given the complete lack of evidence, several theories swept through the town. The most popular theory was that Joyce's body had been found near a place where less fortunate youths congregated. They often drank alcohol there at night and also took illegal substances. People thought that a group of such tipsy guys might have molested Joyce and things got out of hand. The police even checked with locals who regularly spent time in those groups, but they were unable to establish their involvement. Another theory was that the killer might have been a man who came for seasonal work. Hundreds of people came to this area on a regular basis since there were not enough local people to fill all the jobs. But even here, the police could not find any evidence. Some even began to suspect the volunteer who discovered Joyce's body. The fact was that he had spent most of his time surveying the area in tandem with another volunteer. On the morning of the last day, however, he went out to search alone. Because of this, there was a theory that he was involved. But even here, the police could not confirm his guilt. There was another version. It turned out that the same night Joyce disappeared. There had been a serious accident not far from the city. A 19-year-old local resident had snuck into a garage and stolen a gas tanker before crashing into another vehicle. He sustained serious head injuries and slipped into a coma for nine days, making it impossible for the police to question him. And when he woke up, he pleaded not guilty. The investigators didn't know what to do next. They had no evidence or witnesses. As a result, the case went into a long drawer for years, during which time the police were unable to get any closer to a clue. Eight years later, Joyce's relatives created a petition calling for coverage of their daughter's murder on a national unsolved crime show. This would get the word out to viewers across America and draw the attention of potential witnesses. There is always the possibility that someone heard or saw something but, for some reason, did not report it to the police. The petition gathered 6,000 signatures, and the authors of the program agreed to do their own story. It was broadcasted in 1989, and the police did indeed receive a lot of appeals, but all of the collected information turned out to be either erroneous or outright false. Unfortunately, this happens in almost every well-known case. People either make mistakes or simply lie and fabricate non-existent facts forcing the police to waste time and resources on checks. The case stalled for several more years, but all the while, Joyce's mother continued to fight for the truth. In the mid-2000s, she decided that new technology and techniques in forensics could help uncover evidence that had been missed in the 1980s. To do so, experts needed to exhume the victim's body, but there were challenges. Initially, Authorities denied the mother's request for an exhumation. They believed that in almost three decades, any possible evidence simply had not been preserved. But the woman continued to insist, and in 2007, she managed to move the issue forward. The medical expert Peter Cummings of Massachusetts contributed greatly to this effort. He was born in East Mill Market and was only five years old at the time of Joyce's murder. Despite such a young age, he remembered well the horror in which his town had been plunged. Peter admitted that it was these events that guided him into the field of forensics and medicine. When he learned that the authorities had rejected Joyce's mother's petition for an exhumation, he contacted her and asked her not to abandon the idea. Peter believed that the remains might have been preserved enough to try to extract evidence from them. He also contacted one of the leading forensic experts in the United States, and he took an interest in the case. Joyce's mother decided to take the initiative and organize an independent examination. The exhumation required about $20,000, which the family did not have, but they had the support of concerned people who, after so many years, still remembered the case. With their help, the family quickly raised the necessary amount, and the exhumation took place in 2008. To the surprise of many, experts did unearth some important evidence, but at the time, they kept this information secret. Investigators only said that the discovery would not be followed by any immediate arrest, but the police immediately reopened the case. A few months later, it was reported that unidentified people had desecrated Joyce's grave. The police said they did not know if it had anything to do with the murder investigation. The next major twist came a year later, in 2009, and that moment may have been pivotal. 
as law enforcement announced a prime suspect for the first time in 29 years. Let's take it back to 1980 as we recall a few hours after Joyce's murder. A local man stole a gasoline truck and got into a serious accident, causing him to fall into a coma. That man was 19-year-old Scott Fournier, and in 2009, he was put on the bench for possession of illegal material with minors. It seemed like the two cases were unrelated, except after the sentencing. The judge suddenly announced Scott as a person of interest in the Joyce McLean murder case, urging the man to confess to what he had done. This news greatly surprised Joyce's relatives. They were well acquainted with Scott and knew that the police were considering him as a suspect because of that accident. But why had a judge officially declared him a person of interest after a long 29 years? The lead detective in the case declined to comment on the situation. He only said that they had made significant progress since the exhumation and the investigation was well underway. Scott was already 55 years old at the time and refused to plead guilty. The case went to trial, and he spent nearly two years in jail awaiting his first hearing because he didn't have $300,000 for bail. The trial didn't begin until 2018, and the public finally learned something really strange. It turned out that Scott had repeatedly confessed to killing Joyce just weeks after the fact. On one occasion, he cried and confessed to his mother and sister that he had killed Joyce. On other occasions, he told a local priest, an acquaintance of a married couple, and a co-worker of his. Some of these confessions did not reach the police until years later, but some became known almost immediately. Scott was questioned, but he began to deny his guilt. He referred to the head injury he sustained in the accident. According to him, he really thought he killed Joyce but now believes that in reality, it never happened. He was questioned a total of 27 times, and Scott kept changing his story. At first, he told the police that he killed Joyce by stabbing her several times with a glass insulator from a power line that was lying nearby. The girl was indeed killed right under the power line. Scott further stated that he tied her hands, abused her, and fled. The police were confused by one fact in this story. Firstly, they were unable to identify the exact murder weapon even though a glass insulator was found near the body. Second, Joyce had not been abused, as the medical examiner's report attested. But otherwise, his story was very close to the truth. In the following interrogations, he stated that he had killed Joyce in the company of other guys. Then he said he had just watched them attack her. He then changed his statement again and said that these guys forced him to participate in the crime. There were many stories like this, and during the investigation phase, the detectives just got confused. They had no hard evidence against Scott, and his story changed every time they questioned him. For this reason, he was not arrested all those years. It was only in time that they managed to gather enough evidence to bring the case to trial. Two witnesses helped in this, a priest and a colleague of Scott's who both heard him confess. The colleague asked Scott how he got away with it, and Scott replied that he had simply filled the police with false accounts of other people's involvement and that it threw them off the scent. The colleague reported the conversation to his superiors but not to the police. Apparently, they never passed the information on to law enforcement. He admitted to the priest that he did not abuse Joyce because she was on her period at the time, and that was a key factor. The police never divulged this information, although they became aware of it after examining the girl's body. It turns out that Scott simply could not have known such details unless he himself was the killer. Scott's attorneys insisted that all the evidence was circumstantial. They wrote off their client's confessions to the head injury he sustained in the accident. They also cited the fact that the police did not arrest him immediately after he first confessed to the murder. In addition, the attorneys rebuked the court for refusing to consider other suspects. For example, they tried to pin the blame on the man who discovered Joyce's body, Peter Larley. That morning, he was to go in search of the girl paired with another volunteer. They had arranged to meet at 6 a.m., but Peter never showed up. Later, the volunteer learned that he had gone out early and found the body. But there's an odd point here too. This volunteer's sister lived next door to Peter and on the morning of that day, she saw the man leave the house at dawn. According to the woman, he had a large gym bag in his hands, and when he returned home after finding the body, he looked happy and smiling. 
This story seems dubious, if only for the reason that the volunteer did not report all of this to the police until 16 years after the murder. That already seems strange, and it is impossible to verify the authenticity of his words. Unfortunately, Peter Larley died of a heart attack just two days before Scott's arrest. For this reason, no one will ever know why he came out earlier, but the police said that there is no evidence that he was involved in the murder. The prosecution denied all the arguments of the defense. They assured them that the police had looked at all possible suspects and had not been able to find even a hint of their involvement. Scott, on the other hand, gave many reasons for suspicion. Even his stepfather told the police early in the investigation that he suspected Scott of the murder. According to him, a few days before the incident, the boy said he planned to start running in the evenings. He also mentioned that he felt sympathy for Joyce. Moreover, when Scott first confessed to the murder, he was asked to show where he had attacked Joyce. The boy led investigators to the exact spot where the body was found. They cited several other witnesses to corroborate the theory that he was involved. On the evening of Joyce's murder, at about 9 p.m., a couple saw Scott run by the scene of Joyce's murder with a bottle of liquor in his hands, except, according to them, an unknown young man was running beside him. They didn't know at the time that's where the girl's body would be found, but they later reported it to the police. An hour and a half earlier, two local teenagers had also seen Scott and an unidentified young male running through that area. The trial lasted just over two weeks, and the final verdict was handed down on February 5th. 2018. Scott was found guilty of Joyce's murder, sentencing him to 45 years in prison. At the time, the man was 57 years old, a sentence that virtually guaranteed he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. In 2019, Scott's attorneys appealed, which helped them schedule a new hearing. The court, however, did not change the original sentence. According to the judge, the evidence against the perpetrator was exhaustive and all the arguments of the defense had no weight. Joyce's relatives lifted from their shoulders the heavy weight of ignorance that had been with them for 38 years. All the time, they had fought for the truth, and it was her mother who contributed the most. This woman dedicated her life to getting justice. Eventually, she went even further and helped pass a law that enabled the authorities to start allocating substantial funds for the creation of unsolved homicide squads. One obscure point remains in the whole story. Who was the other guy seen by witnesses? Scott's involvement here is almost obvious. He knew so many details that the police never disclosed publicly. It just can't be written off as conjecture. But what about the two groups of witnesses who told the police the same thing? Could it be that Scott committed this crime in the company of some other person? This point is also questionable. After Joyce was killed, Scott stole a gasoline truck and had an accident but he was the only one in the car. Where did his supposed partner go? Is it possible that they separated immediately after the murder? And yet, the version of the second killer seems dubious. Share your opinion on this story and don't forget to like if you liked the video. Thanks for watching for. This gruesome story that took place in England over the years has become one of the most famous criminal cases in the country. A young woman was killed while walking in the park with her two-year-old son, who was the only witness. The police couldn't find the perpetrator for 16 years, and when the case was finally solved, they were accused of catastrophic mishandling. It turned out they had committed numerous mistakes that cost the lives of many people. In this video, we will show you how a single murder case evolved into something much larger over 16 years and how it all came to an end. was born on November 23, 1968, in a village near Colchester, England. She grew up in a decent full family. Her father was an army officer, and her mother was a housewife. From an early age, the young woman took part in various volunteer programs helping the elderly and children with disabilities. At age 11, she enrolled at Colchester High School for Girls, where she was active in dance, singing, and acting. All of her teachers insisted that the young woman had real talent and should develop in that direction. However, Rachel herself was more deeply into the study of history and English. After school, she got a job as a lifeguard at the pool in Richmond. Rachel later planned to try her hand at hosting a television program for children in 1988 when she was 20 years old. Rachel met her future husband, Andre. The couple began dating, and a year later, they had a son Alex together. 
other they moved to an area of London called Bella. By then, she had already been offered a job as a model, but she decided to devote her full attention to her family for a few years and then tried to get a job in television. On a summer morning, July 15, 1992, Rachel took her son and their Labrador for a walk in the local park. At the time, Alex was only a month away from his third birthday. This park in Wimbledon's common neighborhood was popular with the locals. There were always a lot of people there during the daytime, mostly parents with children and dog walkers. Despite this, because of the large area and the abundance of greenery, it was always possible to get away from prying eyes and enjoying nature and solitude. Unfortunately, there was a downside to this. At about 10.06 a.m., a woman walking in the park noticed a gruesome scene a young woman was lying on the ground. There was a lot of blood around, and a small child was sitting next to her. The victim was Rachel. Several dozen police officers arrived on the scene. They had to cordon off an area of four square kilometers where there were hundreds of potential witnesses and possibly the killer detective soon realized that none of the park's visitors had seen either the moment of the attack or the killer himself. No one except for one witness Rachel's son Alex they were to get all the information from the two-year-old boy. Of course, this was extremely difficult to do the child was first admitted to the hospital for examination to make sure he was not injured later the detectives did get some information from him he said he and his mother were approached by a tall thin white man with brown hair everyone in the park was questioned it took the police almost an entire day. But it only took a few hours for reporters to get the whole country to hear about this gruesome crime. Rachel's case instantly caused a wide resonance which is not surprising a young mother died in front of her child in one of the most popular parks in London. Residents of Britain were even more shocked when the newspaper leaked information from the pathologists report Rachel had been stabbed 49 times with a sharp object. There was enormous pressure on the Metropolitan Police Society demanded that the sadists be caught and punished as quickly quickly as possible, and detectives did indeed have to work at an accelerated pace. In the first few weeks, they interviewed 548 men, 32 of whom were even arrested for a short period of time, but all to no avail. The police simply had no leads. The only thing the experts were able to find was a tiny piece of organic material that they thought might be connected to the killer. But in 1992, technology simply didn't allow them to study it. By September, Investigators were left with no suspects, so they enlisted the help of Paul Britton, a renowned profiler, to compile a description of the killer. Here's what he came up with. He is a man in his late 20s to early 30s, most likely living alone. All of his hobbies are also socially unrelated. He's interested in knives and the occult and has sadistic fantasies. In addition, he lives near the park at the request of the police department. This profile, along with this catch, was shown on television. After that, they received at least four calls, all with the same matching name Colin Francis Stagg. In addition to the fact that he fit the sketch, the police ran his name and realized that he had already been on their radar. The fact is that the Stagg had tried to enter the park the day Rachel was killed. Colin Stagg, 27, had led a secluded lifestyle. He had lost his job and was struggling to find money to pay for housing and food. He had a dog that he walked every morning in Wimbledon Common Park. According to his testimony, on the day Rachel was killed, he went there with his dog, but because of a severe headache, he quickly went home and went to bed. Toward evening, he felt better and decided to take his dog out for a walk again. However, on this approach to the park, he was stopped by the police. Stay calmly answered all questions and gave his details. The police had no evidence against Egg but he seemed to them to be a suitable candidate for the role of the killer. In addition, the press kept pressuring law enforcement agencies, and they needed a breakthrough in the case urgently that same day Stagg was brought to the police station where he was held for three days when questioned he denied any involvement in the murder. But the detectives were beginning to believe more and more the opposite first occult books were found in his home, which coincided with the profiler's suggestion. Second, the police were able to find two women who gave some disturbing details about Stagg. One woman accused him of exposing himself in front of her in that very part. In his defense, Collins said he was just sunbathing in a secluded part of the park, and the woman came there herself. Another woman reported that she had been exchanging intimate letters with him for some time in one of them. 
and he confessed to her that he dreamed of having sexual intercourse outdoors. All this was already enough for the police to consider Colin a pervert and finally believe his involvement in the murder of Rachel, except they knew that all these circumstantial arguments would not stand a chance in court. For this reason, the man had to be released on the advice of his lawyer he agreed to pay a fine for exposing himself to a woman in the park though he continued to insist on his innocence detectives, along with a profiler, came up with a very unusual plan that was supposed to help force a confession. A metropolitan police officer under the pseudonym Lissy James began writing column letters of intimate content. She said she knew the woman stake had corresponded with before. Despite the ridiculousness of the situation, the plan worked. Colin responded to all the letters, and each time their dialogues became more and more explicit and perverted. Lizzie played the part of a woman with violent and sadist hobbies, sometimes even illegal, and their communication lasted five months. All this time, Stagg insisted that they finally meet in person, and the detectives decided it might actually help to get a confession out. The location and date was set at a park. Lizzie didn't go there alone but Stagg didn't know that plainclothes officers were keeping an eye on them in case the man decided to attack their colleague during the conversation. Izzy on the provider's advice shared with Colin a fictional story about her secret hobby. She revealed that her ex-boyfriend was into the occult and that they performed a ritual sacrifice on a living person together. Stagg took this information rather calmly. At least he kept in touch with Lizzie, and they spent a few more hours together and parted ways. After that, they met a few more times, and finally, the police decided to move on to the final part. Walking in the park, Lizzie talked to Colin about Rachel's murder. She told him that she wished he had been the murderer because she was aroused by thoughts of the crime, but it didn't work. Stagg apologized to her and told her that he had nothing to do with the murder. Lizzie tried to get him to confess several more times, but he kept denying his involvement. It looked as if the police had botched a six-month operation. They couldn't get any evidence that Stake had killed Rachel, but the detectives were still convinced they were right. That's why they did arrest him in August 1993. At the interrogation, Colin was told all the cards and that all this time, he had been in correspondence with a police officer. He read excerpts from these letters describing various perversions and was also introduced to the real Lizzie herself. Stagg was shocked but, on the advice of his lawyer, refused to answer police questions investigators had hoped to the last that, under such pressure, he would confess to the murder. But he did not. All they had to do now was to take the case to trial all this dragged down for a year which Stake spent in custody when the case finally went to trial as lawyers blew the prosecute. In arguments to smithereens even the judge was forced to admit that the whole operation with Lizzie James was overkill and that the police had behaved in an extremely unprofessional manner. In September 1994 Colin was acquitted of all charges and released Lizzie James later resigned from the police citing serious psychological trauma from the operation the police who had spent more than three million pounds on this investigation were deadlocked they had not a single the suspect and most of the detectives continued to think the stake was the murderer and they were not alone in this opinion the newspapers and the public continued to blame him for what happened every time he went out on the street he caught the embittered looks of passers-by almost the entire country believed that the murderer had gotten away with it and this only added to the hatred towards stack this went on for years. The Rachel Nickel case was finally hung in the balance, and the police made little effort to look for new suspects why when they were all sure of Colin's involvement by then. Rachel's husband, along with Alex, had gone to live in Europe for several reasons. First, he was constantly harassed by journalists, which reminded his son of his mother's murder. Secondly, the father felt it was not safe for his son to remain in London. He was the only person who had seen the murderer for a long time. No one knew which country they had moved to. Later, journalists did get wind that they lived in Spain and France. In 2000, Scotland Yard took up the case and assigned a new team to it. They studied all the collected material and witness statements, but they failed to find a new suspect. Only three years later, they announced that they had found DNA from an unknown man and Rachel's clothes analysis technology had only just matured to such a capability. And in 1992, such a discovery was simply impossible that even in 2003, 
This tiny sample, which took experts 18 months to find, was not enough to establish identity. The data from that sample was only enough to rule out unsuitable people and a year later in 2004, the police finally had a new suspect. His DNA was already in the database, and a comparison with a sample from Rachel's clothes showed mixed results. That man was the 38-year-old Robert Knapper, a convicted murderer and serial rapist who, at the time, had already spent 10 years in a halfway house. His biography is striking in two ways the cruelty of his crimes and the ease with which he evaded justice later. Because of this, the police would face a wave of outrage from the public Knapper first came into the hands of law enforcement in 1986. He was then given a suspended sentence for assault with an air gun in 1989 he broke into a young mother's house and abused her. For the next four years there was a series of similar attacks, but the police did not tie them together and could not reach the suspect. What followed was something truly amazing Napper confessed to his mother that he had carried out all these attacks she called the police and told them everything and what do you think they found no connection between the crimes and the woman's story so they didn't look into the Napper's involvement. The only thing the mother could do was convince her son to see a psychiatrist. When Napper came back from there, he said that the specialist thought he was crazy but took no further action. A short time later, he assaulted and abused a woman and her child in Crystal Palace Park. This happened just weeks before Rachel's murder. But again the police failed to see the connection. This was by no means the only such attack in Crystal Palace Park, and police at some point figured out that one man was committing the crimes from the words of witnesses. They compiled a sketch of him. After the publication in the newspapers, several of Napper's neighbors contacted the detectives. They all pointed to the man, and the police called Napper for a blood sample. He simply ignored the request, and the detectives did not go looking for him. They simply forgot about him. In November 1993, London was rocked by another high-profile crime which, as it later turned out, was also committed by Napper, a young mother, Samantha Bassett, who was attacked in her room. In addition, the perpetrator did not spare her young daughter. What he did to them shocked even experienced detectives. The police photographer who arrived on the scene could not return to work for several months because of the shock of what he saw. Remarkably, the same profiler who had been brought in to investigate Rachel's murder worked on all of these cases, and he believed that all of these attacks had nothing to do with each other. The detectives also saw no possible connection to Rachel's case because they were 100 sure that Colin Stay was guilty. The team of investigators handling the attack at Crystal Palace Park also saw no connection. Napper was nearly 190 centimeters tall, and based on witness testimony, the perpetrator was shorter but the maniac made one mistake in the attack on Samantha Bassett. He left a fingerprint in her apartment that allowed his identity to be run through the database. Napper had previously been fingerprinted after he stalked a woman in the street. He was not arrested until May 1994. When questioned, he denied guilt and was extremely calm in his apartment. They found maps of London on which the locations of the attacks and murders were circled, including the place where Rachel was murdered. They also found several nodes on how to properly abuse women. Shortly before that, police found a knife in the very park where Rachel has murdered. The fingerprints on the handle matched Napper's, but even that wasn't enough to make detectives consider him the killer because they were still convinced Colin Stegg was guilty. Napper, however, was still considered a suspect in Rachel's murder for a while, but those charges were quickly dropped. The thing is that Napper said he was at work that day in 1995. Napper went on trial for the murder of Samantha and her daughter. The prosecution struck a deal with him in which he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and the court sent him to a closed psychiatric hospital instead of the prison. The fact was that Napper had been diagnosed with a number of disorders, including Asperger's syndrome and schizophrenia. Because of this, the maniac could have avoided prison anyway, with or without a confession. As a result, the judge sent him to provide a more psychiatric hospital for treatment with no time limit. Later, detectives wanted to question him about Rachel's murder but the doctors forbade it because they feared it might aggravate the Napper's mental status back to 2004. 
the new team of detectives on the Rachel Nickel case finally began to take a closer look at Napper as a suspect after they compared his DNA to a small sample found. On the young woman's body the results were very mixed that sample wasn't enough to confirm the similarity. It was only enough to rule out other suspects in Napper's case. The results did not do with 100% certain the investigators kept digging further. Using new technology on Rachel's clothing, they managed to spot a microscopic piece of pain experts examined it and concluded that it matched the pain on the Napper's iron toolbox. Prior to his arrest, he worked as a storekeeper for the Department of Defense. It is not entirely clear how we could have gotten a job there with his set of mental disorders, but the fact remains he combined assault and murder with his day job. It took Scotland Yard three years to prepare this case for trial and in 2007, Napper was charged with the murder of Rachel Nickel. During the first hearing, he pleaded not guilty, which prolonged the trial for almost a year at the end. Napa agreed the same deal he had been offered 12 years earlier, a change of plea to manslaughter in exchange for a confession on December 18, 2008. 16 years after the murder, he finally confessed for Napper himself. The verdict did not change anything. He was left in the same hospital, under heavy guard. Most likely he will never be released, but the news made a lot of noise all over Britain the police suffered it the most, fixating on Colin Stagg and completely ignoring Colin Stagg and other serious leads. Instead the investigation was divided into three separate lines each team of detectives looked for different criminals while behind all the attacks and murders what Napper that the same year 2008 Stagg sued the police department for £706,000 a record for Britain for unwarranted criminal prosecutions. The Metropolitan and police also issued a public apology to him. He subsequently wrote several books about his life experiences. In them, he described what it was like to be accused of murder. Stagg admitted that for 10 years, his life was effectively ruined by journalists and the police after the whole of Britain finally believed in his innocence he decided to spend all the compensation on travel expensive cars and other things that brought him. Joy. In 2010, a special commission issued a report criticizing the actions of homicide detectives. This document was called a catalog of wrong decisions and mistakes, and the reason for this is not only the fact that the murder could not be solved for 16 years. The whole point is that if the police had done their job properly, they could have arrested Napper before he killed Rachel Samantha and her daughter. No disciplinary action followed. However, all of the detectives involved in the case retired and one of the lead investigators passed away. As for Rachel's son, Alexei did not give his first interview until 2017. 25 years after the incident, he said that growing up without his mother had been problematic, but that he had found the strength to let go and move on. Shortly before the interview, he went to the very place where his mother was murdered, and at the moment, he was able to finally let go of the heavy weight of the past one can only hope that this story like others like it, will serve as a lesson for law enforcement agencies around the world. It is too late to speculate about whether or not the police could have saved Rachel and Samantha, but it is never too late to draw conclusions and prevent future crimes. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. In a small town, a horrifying crime unfolds, a happy family shattered by a shocking incident. They lived an exemplary life until one fateful morning. The police received two distress calls and what they encountered was straight out of a detective thriller. For seven long years, the truth remained hidden and the case became a mystery that captivated an entire town. Suspicion falls on the victim's husband, but he maintains his innocence. Can the truth be unraveled? Honey Debate was born on July 31, 1976, in a small American town of Ellington, Connecticut. She had two sisters and a brother. From an early age, Connie stood out for her kindness and desire to help people which earned her many friends. Later on, fueled by these qualities, Connie decided to pursue a medical education. She studied at the University of Connecticut and then found employment in the sales department of a pharmaceutical company. In addition to her career, Connie became the vice president of a charitable organization in her town which provided free emergency medical assistance to people. She also desired to create a large and close-knit family. In the early 2000s, an opportunity presented itself when she met a man named Richard 
and a romance blossomed between them. The couple got married on July 4, 2003, and a few years later, they had a son. Three years after that, their second son arrived. Around the same time, Connie and Richard decided to move into a new home, purchasing a large house in a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts of Ellington. It was an ideal choice for their expanding family, with a spacious house and a large backyard where their sons could play. Moreover, their close friends lived in the same area, and they frequently spent time together as families. For many years, they led an exemplary life. However, everything changed on December 23, 2015. That morning, the police department received two calls in quick succession. First, the security company alerted them that the alarm had gone off at Richard and Connie's house. Five minutes later, Richard himself called the police, requesting assistance. The officers promptly arrived at the house only to be greeted by a horrifying sight. One of them entered through the open front door and immediately noticed a trail of blood leading from the staircase in the basement to the kitchen. Following the trail, the officer discovered Richard in the kitchen. The man was partially tied to an overturned chair with zip ties, lying face down on the floor with wounds visible on his body and another plastic restraint around his neck. The officer called out to him, and Richard replied with a single sentence, he's still in the house. The police immediately requested backup and began searching both the building and the entire neighborhood. Soon after, they made another horrifying discovery as they descended to the basement. They found Connie's lifeless body with a gun lying next to her. Meanwhile, detectives freed Richard, and while they waited for an ambulance, he recounted what had happened that morning. At around 8.10 a.m., Richard had taken their sons to the bus stop from where they would go to school. Afterward, he returned home, changed into his office attire, got into his car, and headed to work. Meanwhile, Connie was preparing for a sports activity taking place at the local charity organization's gymnasium. Shortly after Richard left home, he received a notification from the security service about an alarm triggered at their house. This had happened before due to their cat, whom they often left home alone. Richard also realized that he had forgotten to take his laptop, which he needed for work. Therefore, he decided to turn back. Before turning around, he messaged his boss, informing them that he would be delayed and then drove back home. Richard arrived at the house sometime between 8.45 a.m. and 9 a.m. Upon entering, he heard a noise on the second floor. As he went upstairs and entered his and Connie's bedroom, to his horror, he saw an unknown man rummaging through the closet. The intruder was dressed in camouflage clothing with his face covered. As soon as the perpetrator noticed Richard, he lunged at him, knocking him to the floor. The assailant demanded Richard's wallet, bank cards, and their PIN codes, otherwise he threatened to wait for his family and kill them. Almost immediately after that, Richard heard the garage door open, indicating that Connie had returned from her activity earlier than expected. He shouted that there was someone in the house and told her to run. The intruder had it downstairs, but Richard attempted to stop him. During the struggle, the unknown man managed to push Richard off the stairs and he fell to the first floor. While he was regaining his senses, Connie ran to the basement where they kept two handguns and the assailant pursued her. A few moments later, Richard managed to stand up and followed to the basement. However, by the time he reached there, the unknown man already had the gun and in the next second, he shot Connie. The sound of the gunshot was so loud that Richard was almost deafened for a few minutes. He thought he heard a second shot shortly after but wasn't certain. Afterward, the assailant made Richard sit on a chair and bound his hand and leg with plastic restraints. Then he put down the gun, picked up some tools lying in the basement, and inflicted several puncture wounds on Richard with them. Following that, the unknown man knocked over some items, took a blowtorch, and began burning them. Apparently, by using the blowtorch, the intruder attempted to eliminate evidence. Afterward, he turned to Richard and directed the torch toward him. Due to being only partially restrained to the chair, Richard managed to stand up and knock the torch out of the assailant's hands. He grabbed it and directed it toward the attacker, setting fire to the mask on his face. The unarmed perpetrator immediately fled the basement, and shortly after, Richard went upstairs to call the police. While Richard was recounting the incident, the police thoroughly searched the house and an area several kilometers around it. 
However, they failed to find the suspect. The only thing they discovered was Richard's wallet, which was lying on the lawn in front of the house. Investigators called in canine units with search dogs in an attempt to track the killer. They allowed the dogs to sniff the wallet as the perpetrator had held it for some time. However, it didn't work, and three different dogs kept leading the detectives back to Richard. Following that, the canines were taken through the house hoping they would detect the scent of an intruder, but that also yielded no results. Detectives found it strange because trained dogs are usually capable of detecting human presence even days later. But in this case, none of the three dogs picked up anything. Another peculiar aspect was the timeline of the incident. According to Richard, approximately five minutes had passed between the moment he entered the house and when the assailant fled. Considering that Richard returned home between 8.40 a.m. and 9 a.m., everything should have ended no later than 9.05 a.m. However, the security company only reported the alarm activation at 10.16 a.m. and Richard himself called the police a few minutes later. It seemed that he had spent over an hour in the house before contacting the police. Additionally, there was too little time between Connie's departure for her sports activity and her return. Meanwhile, Richard was taken to the hospital where doctors determined that his injuries were not life-threatening. Their detectives interviewed him again, hoping to obtain a description of the attacker. Richard stated that the intruder was tall and well-built, but his face was impossible to see due to the mask. Forensic experts examined Connie's body and found that she had sustained two gunshot wounds, one in the abdomen and another in the back of the head. The detectives had very few leads and they continued to talk to Richard, hoping to gather more details. The more questions they asked, the more suspicious his answers became. Initially, Richard claimed that he had left for work while Connie was getting ready for her training session. But in the hospital, he stated that he couldn't recall with certainty who had left first. He also couldn't remember if he had activated the alarm before leaving or if his wife had done it. Richard also changed his version of events. Initially, he claimed to have heard a noise on the second floor as soon as he entered the house, but now he stated that there was no noise and he only noticed the intruder when he went upstairs and entered the bedroom. He also said that the assailant didn't push him down the stairs from the second floor, but rather he tripped and fell himself. However, the main inconsistency was regarding the moment of the murder. Richard stated that he rushed into the basement and witnessed the assailant taking the gun from Connie before shooting her. However, initially, he claimed to be unaware of how the attacker acquired the weapon. Furthermore, according to Richard, the basement was pitch dark, leading the detectives to wonder how he could see what was happening. Then Richard also added that he couldn't see Connie's body due to the darkness, so he wasn't certain if his wife was dead. Another suspicious element was the superficial wounds inflicted on Richard with pliers. They posed no real threat, but the interesting part was that most of them were on the left side of his torso, considering that Richard was right-handed and his right hand was not restrained to the chair. He could have self-inflicted those wounds. Additionally, there were no bruises or contusions on his body. According to Richard, he fought with the assailant and fell down the stairs, which should have resulted in abrasions, but there were none. Richard's shorts had blood stains, but forensic analysts found inconsistencies with his story. If someone had inflicted wounds on him with a sharp object while he was sitting on the chair, at least a few drops of blood should have landed on the lower part of the shorts, but there were no traces there. The same applied to the area in the basement where the assailant struck Richard with pliers. There should have been a considerable amount of blood on the floor near the chair, but the investigators found only a few small droplets. That wasn't all. According to Richard, after the attacker fled, he regained consciousness after a while and then crawled up the stairs from the basement to the first floor. However, there was not a single trace of blood on the steps even though Richard was injured and should have been bleeding. Another peculiar detail caught the attention of the detectives while examining the crime scene. They noticed that the basement window was open. The police considered the possibility that the intruder entered the house through that window, but there was an interesting point the locks had been removed from the inside. The same was true for another window and the investigators decided to conduct a small experiment. They attempted to open it from the outside, 
but they succeeded only when one of the officers struck the frame and shattered the glass. This led the detectives to doubt that the intruder could have opened the window even without the locks without breaking the glass. All these factors made the investigators question the authenticity of Richard's story. They went back to him at the hospital and asked if they had any problems in their marriage, to which he stated that he had a mistress, but Connie was aware of it. According to his account, he and his wife wanted to have a third child, but Connie was unable to conceive. That's when Richard proposed the idea of surrogacy and he chose his former classmate as the surrogate mother. She had recently gone through a divorce and wanted to have a child. Richard and his wife presented her with a plan she would conceive Richard's child and then the three of them would raise the baby together and the woman agreed. Initially, they planned to proceed with medical fertilization procedures but it turned out to be too expensive so they decided to do it in a more natural way and Richard engaged in intimate relations with the woman resulting in her pregnancy. He claimed that Connie was completely okay with the arrangement and supported everything that was happening. The detectives had serious doubts about the credibility of this story as it sounded highly unnatural. They continued to question Richard and his account changed once again. Just a few minutes after telling the story, he stated that, in fact, Connie and his friend never met or spoke to each other. He also admitted that he wasn't sure if his wife knew about the pregnancy. During further conversation with the police, he confessed that he had been cheating on his wife with his former classmate for several years and Connie was unaware of it. The detectives reached out to the woman and she stated that she entered into a romantic relationship with Richard less than a year ago. She knew he was married but believed he was in the process of getting a divorce, as he had told her so. The woman became pregnant in June, six months before the incident occurred. Richard insisted that he had already hired a lawyer for the divorce and planned to finalize the process before the baby's birth. However, investigators found out that he hadn't contacted any lawyer and all of Connie's acquaintances confirmed that she never mentioned anything about a divorce. All of this was enough for the detectives to consider Richard as the main suspect. However, they couldn't find any substantial evidence against him, so the police started considering all possible scenarios. That's when they discovered something interesting. Friends and relatives of the family informed them that Connie had repeatedly complained about a contractor with whom they had issues. He had done poor quality work on their house, and the couple tried to get a refund, but the contractor turned out to be quite aggressive. Connie admitted that she was genuinely afraid of him. It was because of this issue that Richard and Connie purchased two guns and installed an alarm system. Investigators looked into the contractor but he had an indisputable alibi for the time of the murder. Eventually, they returned to their prime suspect, the victim's husband. For months, the police had refrained from publicly declaring him a possible murderer. All of Connie's friends and relatives believed that an unknown robber was behind the crime and sympathized with Richard. Detectives spent a lot of time talking to Connie's closest friends. They stated that if she had discovered her husband's infidelity, especially that his mistress had become pregnant, she would have undoubtedly confided in them. Other acquaintances of the family noted that Richard had been behaving strangely after the murder. He didn't appear depressed or upset, and a few days after his wife's death, he even asked a few neighbors, where do you usually order food from? Digging deeper, the police discovered that Connie and Richard were facing serious financial problems. Connie was unaware of where their money was going, while Richard secretly spent it on his mistress. They also found a note titled, Why I Want a Divorce on Her Smartphone. In the note, she listed Richard's constant lies, mistreatment of her and the children, his unauthorized use of her money, and more. Based on this, investigators concluded that Connie had been contacted contemplating ending the marriage, but she had no idea about her husband's secret life. Further examination of the financial aspect revealed that just five days after the murder, Richard attempted to withdraw $500,000 from his wife's insurance account, but the request was rejected by the security service. A month later, he received a $75,000 check from his wife's employer. All of this indicated that Richard may have had selfish motives for the murder, but it didn't prove his guilt. 
Another curious fact was that Richard canceled the contract with the security company only 19 days after the murder. If his story about the intruder was true, it would have been the most illogical move, endangering not only himself but also his two sons. Desperate to find any evidence, the detectives obtained a search warrant for all electronic devices in the house, and finally, they stumbled upon something significant. Collecting all this information together, the police were able to reconstruct the exact timeline of events. At 8.44 a.m. in the morning, the security system recorded the garage door opening and closing. Investigators determined that Connie had left for her workout because at 8.53 a.m. she was captured on camera near the gym. At 8.50 a.m., Richard, who was still at home at that time, first deactivated the alarm system and then reactivated it. After that, he was supposed to leave the house and go to work, but at 8.59 a.m., he again disabled the alarm using his remote control. Considering that the remote control works within a few meters of the system, Richard had to return home, which aligned with his claim that he went back to retrieve his laptop. However, there is one problem. He stated that he received a notification of the alarm being triggered on his way to work. During that time frame, though, the security system did not record any breaches, indicating that he didn't receive any notifications. At 9.02 a.m., Richard accessed his email from a tablet, and two minutes later, he wrote to his boss that he would be delayed because his alarm had gone off. Another inconsistency emerged here. Not only were there no actual alarm notifications, but Richard also lied to the police in his email. He claimed to have sent it immediately after receiving the notification while being several kilometers away from home, but the tablet data showed that he was at home when he sent the email since it was connected to the home Wi-Fi. It appeared that he spent a minimum of four minutes inside the house before he supposedly encountered the intruder, and everything that happened thereafter took less than a minute, which was theoretically impossible. However, the crucial evidence came from Connie's fitness tracker. She arrived at the gym at 8.53 a.m. but left a few minutes later because the classes were canceled. At 9.08 a.m., the bracelet stopped tracking steps. Based on this, investigators concluded that Connie got into her car and drove home. The journey took eight minutes. Here is where it gets interesting. According to Richard, the assailant attacked his wife almost immediately after she entered the house. But the bracelet data contradicted this. The data showed that the woman walked 370 meters inside her house between 9.18 a.m. and 10.17 a.m. in the morning. Data from her social media account also showed that she was online for six minutes during this time frame. This means that Connie entered the house at 9.18 a.m. and was alive for nearly a whole hour completely contradicting her husband's story. The crucial factor here was that the police had not just theoretical inconsistencies, but full-fledged digital evidence to support their case. Gathering this detailed information took the police over a year, and in April 2017, they finally arrested Richard. For the vast majority of his acquaintances, this event was a real shock. They had no idea what evidence the police had managed to gather and continued to see Richard as the victim. The man was accused of murder and initially, the bail amount set for him was $5 million. However, his lawyer argued that Richard had a clean criminal record and two minor sons under his care. As a result, the amount was reduced to $1 million, which he promptly paid. Richard spent a whole five years waiting for trial as the process kept getting postponed. The trial finally began in April 2022, and during this time, the man's lawyers managed to gather many interesting facts. The defense presented evidence that six DNA samples belonging to an unknown individual were found in the house. They also pointed out that there was only a minimal amount of gunpowder on Richard's hands, and if he had been the one who fired the gun, there should have been much more. The prosecution refuted these arguments, stating that the gunpowder test was conducted several hours after the man was taken to the hospital, giving Richard ample time to remove most of the traces. Regarding the DNA, there was no evidence to prove that it belonged specifically to the mysterious intruder. Anyone who had visited Richard and Connie's house at least once could have left those samples. In turn, 
the prosecution presented a detailed digital timeline of the couple's movements that morning, contradicting all of Richard's statements. The evidence indicated that the woman died an hour after she was allegedly shot by an unknown intruder as she continued moving around the house and using social media without any indication of distress. Richard's own story became a significant argument for the prosecution as he repeatedly changed his statements. All the contradictions in his words were used as further evidence of his deceitful storytelling. The trial lasted for 22 days, and on May 10, 2022, the jury found him guilty. Richard was sentenced to 65 years in prison, but he continued to insist on his innocence. This trial was a difficult ordeal for Connie's relatives and loved ones as they only learned about all the evidence against her husband during the process. Until that point, many of them still believed in the story of the unknown robber. But once all the cards were laid out on the table, no one doubted Richard's guilt and more. However, his lawyers announced plans to appeal the verdict until it was reviewed, but so far, these attempts have not yielded the desired result. As for Connie's sons, they remained in the custody of her relatives. At the time of the murder, they were six and nine years old, but the children lived with their father until the verdict was reached. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. A woman spending time with her family on a normal Saturday morning heard the doorbell ring and went to answer it. What happened next resembled more the plot of a horror movie than a real-life incident. It took the detective more than 30 years to unravel this terrible mystery, the ending of which shocked and angered everyone. Marlene Warren was born on April 15, 1950, in Michigan, USA. She grew up without a father and since her teenage years dreamed of having a large and close-knit family. Very soon, that dream came true. The girl married a man named John, and they had two sons. But just a few years later, an unexpected tragedy struck the family. Marlene's husband died suddenly of an illness, and the woman was left alone with two small children. Since then, she has spent most of her time at work, trying to provide for her sons alone. Although she struggled with this, she sacrificed everything for her children. Six years after her husband's death, she met a man named Michael Warren, and they soon married. The man was a used car salesman, and after their marriage, he opened his own business in that area. By that time, Marlene was already making good money, but instead of spending it all, she tried to save it. The woman invested in Michael's company and also helped him in the management. The man himself was also good at this business, and in the following years, it began to bring them decent money. Over time, Marlene and her husband expanded the business. They bought several properties to rent, and their finances took off. The family moved to an upscale Miami suburb called Wellington, buying a large house there. They seemed to have built a near-perfect life. But in 1988, Marlene suffered another tragedy. Her oldest son was killed in a car accident. For the woman and her youngest son, Joseph, it was a huge blow. After all the difficulties they had gone through, their life had just gotten better when suddenly fate presented them with yet another test. Yet they found the strength to move on. After this tragedy, Marlene became even closer to Joseph because he was her only closest relative. Her husband also helped her to recover from this loss. After the death of her son, the woman began to think about selling the properties that she and Michael were renting out. Despite the fact that this business brought in good money for Marlene, it was associated with constant worries. There were often situations when tenants delayed rent or lost it altogether. In each such case, the woman did her best to find the best solution. It was very hard for her to put people on the street because she was a good-natured person and well remembered the financial difficulties she experienced with two small children. On the other hand, she and her husband could not let people live in their homes for free, and eventually, Marlene wanted to get rid of the business so that she would no longer face such moral dilemmas. Two years had passed since her son's death, and the family was just beginning to recover and return to normalcy. But something terrible and unforeseen awaited them once again. On the morning of May 26, 1990, Marlene was at home with her son and three of his friends who came over for breakfast. Their kitchen was located so that they could see the driveway through the windows. At some point, the doorbell rang, and Marlene went to open it. Her son saw a white Chrysler parked in front of their house. The next second, the woman opened the front door and saw a man in a clown costume holding two balloons and a bouquet of flowers on the doorstep. Marlene said, how cute is that? But the next second, something unexpected happened. 
The clown pulled a gun out of his pocket and shot the woman in the head. Her son and his friends rushed into the hallway where a heartbreaking sight awaited them. Marlene was lying on the floor with blood everywhere. The man in the clown suit looked at them for a few seconds, then got back into his car and drove away. Marlene's son called an ambulance, after which he decided to chase after his attacker. At the time, his leg was in a cast after an injury, and the guy couldn't drive. He told his two friends to stay with his mother, asked his friend to drive, and drove with her in the direction the attacker had gone. But by that time, the clown was out of sight, and they never managed to find him. Marlene was taken to the hospital in an unconscious state, and the detectives began their investigation. The first thing they did was talk to everyone in the house. The woman's son said that he could not see any signs of his attacker. He was wearing a suit and makeup, gloves on his hands, and a wig on his head. The only thing the son remembered was that the perpetrator had very dark eyes. His friends added that the clown was quite tall, and his shoes stood out strongly against the costume. They looked like work shoes. A neighbor who was walking his dog near Marlene's house also saw the clown, but he was unable to share any significant sightings with police. Investigators put out a search for a white Chrysler and began searching for other evidence. Of course, Marlene's husband, Michael, was the first to be suspected. That morning, he had just left for the racing stadium in Miami, and at the time of the attack on his wife, he was not at home. From the first hours of the investigation, the police had several good reasons to think about his involvement. First, they found out that Marlene and her relatives really liked clowns. There were a lot of pictures and figures depicting these characters in their house. This suggested that the attacker knew this fact and chose such an outfit for a reason. Secondly, just two hours after the incident, the police received an anonymous tip from a woman who called the investigators and said they should look into Michael Warren and a woman named Sheila Keen. Sheila, who was 26, worked with Michael at his car rental company. Digging deeper, the detectives learned of rumors that there was a secret affair between them. Their relationship had been speculated about by some colleagues, so they immediately shared this information with investigators. Here, the police discovered another possible motive. If Michael was in a relationship with another woman and wanted to break up with Marlene, he had one problem. Most of the real estate and business that the family owned were written down to his wife. In that case, Michael would lose an impressive part of his fortune in a divorce. The police immediately checked the man's whereabouts at the time of the attack, and it turned out that Michael was in a car 110 kilometers away from the house and had two friends with him. Investigators concluded he would not have been physically capable of committing the crime. Upon learning of the attempt on his wife's life, Michael rushed to the hospital and has not left her room since. Officers spoke with Sheila, and she stated that there was no romantic relationship between them, and she had nothing to do with the crime. The woman added that she was at work at the time. Detectives also interviewed Sheila's husband, who said he was aware of rumors of an affair between his wife and Michael but could not confirm whether or not it was true. The man added that his wife had moved out about a month ago, and in fact, they were no longer together. Although the police had no evidence to link Michael and Sheila to the crime, they continued to consider their involvement highly probable. Given that the husband could not have physically been outside his house that morning, the police wondered if Sheila could have been the clown because of the costume. None of the witnesses could determine the gender of the assailant for certain, and Sheila was known among her colleagues for her character. The woman was responsible for dealing with clients who were delinquent in rent payments, and most of these cases led to serious conflicts. So Sheila always carried a gun with her. After doctors removed the bullet from Marlene's head, experts determined that it had been fired from a .38 caliber handgun, remarkably the same caliber as Sheila's. The cops went to examine the weapon, but Sheila claimed that the gun had been stolen or lost months before the incident, leaving the detectives with no tangible evidence. They continued to dig deeper and learned that after Sheila moved out of her husband's house, she had moved into a rental apartment. Investigators heard rumors that Michael was paying for the place. A new interesting discovery awaited the police officers. While their colleagues were trying to establish where the perpetrator took the clown costume, balloons, and flowers, they found that on May 24th, two days before the attempt on Marlene's life, a woman came to the costume store near Sheila's apartment. The store was already closed but the woman persistently knocked on the door until someone opened it for her. She urgently needed a clown costume, a wig, face makeup, and a red nose. The store clerk sold her the items. They described her as tall, thin, with dark hair. The balloons and flowers were traced to a supermarket about a mile from Sheila's apartment. The salesman stated that the same items had been bought by a woman just a few hours before the attempt on Marlene's life. He described her as a tall, thin young woman with long dark hair. The salesman also mentioned that the female customer exhibited rude and somewhat masculine manners. The investigation had lasted two days, and on May 28, the doctors informed the police that Marlene had died. The case was reclassified as a homicide. Detectives continued to look for more possible evidence against Sheila. They obtained a warrant to search her apartment. 
While waiting for the warrant, they were informed of a similar car in a parking lot located 13 kilometers from the victim's home. Investigators got there and verified that it was the same Chrysler the killer was driving. Inside, they found long dark hair and orange fibers that looked like pieces of a clown wig. During a search of Sheila's apartment, the police found the same orange-colored particles and work boots that matched the witness's description, a similar model worn by the clown on the day of the murder. However, the police faced a major problem. Without DNA analysis, all the evidence against Sheila was circumstantial. They couldn't charge her with murder without concrete proof. But in 2013, a new team of investigators reopened the case and requested a re-examination of all available evidence. Advanced technology and DNA examination and other physical evidence had emerged since 1990. After several years of examination, experts found that the orange flecks in Sheila's apartment, the car, and the murder scene were identical. The crucial clue came from comparing the DNA of hairs found in the white Chrysler to Sheila's DNA, which resulted in a perfect match. Armed with this incontrovertible evidence, detectives were able to take the case to court, and in 2017, Sheila was arrested. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. Her attorneys claimed that she feared for her life and took responsibility for someone else's crime. However, it is widely speculated that she took the plea deal to receive a lenient sentence. The court sentenced her to 12 years in prison, reduced further due to time served and good behavior. As for Michael, his involvement remains unproven, and he remains free. Marlene's son expressed his gratitude to the persistent detectives who never gave up on the case. He managed to rebuild his life, opened his own small construction firm, and moved forward despite the immense tragedy of losing his mother. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Thanks for watching. A young woman moved to another city for her studies and stayed with an acquaintance. What happened next seemed like a twisted plot of a detective movie than a real-life situation. For several years, this story troubled the police until the unexpected truth finally came to light. Jonah Berry was born on October 26, 1983, in Bristol, Tennessee. She was lively and sociable, had many friends, and was always the life of the party during her school years. She was also part of the local cheerleading team. After high school, Jonah enrolled at East Tennessee State University, where she studied psychology and criminalistics. While studying, she also worked part-time at a children's educational center. During her time at the university, she met a guy named Jason White. They dated for several years, and shortly before graduation, they got engaged. In late 2004, when Jonah was 21 years old, she decided to pursue a master's degree in psychology, which required her to temporarily move to Knoxville to study at a different university. After working at the Children's Center, Jonah realized her passion for this field and aspired to become a child psychologist. Meanwhile, her boyfriend continued his studies in another state, aiming to obtain a law degree. Despite the distance, the couple communicated every day and started preparing for their wedding, which was only a few months away in Knoxville. Jonah planned to find her own accommodation but stayed with her friend Jason Amami for the first few weeks. He had studied with her and her boyfriend at the university, and after graduating, he moved to Knoxville. He lived in a two-bedroom apartment and agreed to host Jonah until she found a place of her own. Jonah found two part-time jobs at a jewelry store and a children's hospital. On the evening of December 5th, after finishing her shift at the store, she went to the shopping center to buy Christmas presents. When she returned home, she packed some gifts intended for the children at the educational center, chatted with her apartment neighbor, and went to her room. There, she talked to her boyfriend on the phone and went to sleep around 4 a.m. Jason and mommy woke up to a woman's scream. He thought Jonah had a nightmare and headed to her room. At that moment, a man emerged from the room and Jason noticed a knife in his hand. The assailant immediately attacked him, delivering several blows. Jason tried to defend himself and managed to push the attacker away at some point. He ran out of the apartment and quickly ran to the neighboring residential complex, knocking on every door, hoping someone would call the police. But no one opened for him. He then sprinted to the nearest 24-hour store, almost a kilometer away. The store clerk called 911 upon seeing the bloodied man and Jason recounted what happened. The police arrived at his home and discovered Jonah lying on the floor next to the corridor door that connected five apartments. The young woman was alive but barely responsive. As the paramedics prepared to load her into the ambulance, a police officer asked if the attacker was still in the apartment and Jason thought he saw Jonah nod ever so slightly. The officers thoroughly searched the entire building and the surrounding area but failed to find him. Jonah was swiftly transported to the nearest hospital, 
but despite the efforts of the doctors, they were unable to save her. Medical experts determined that she had sustained over 20 knife wounds, leaving them with virtually no chance of saving her life. As for her neighbor, the assailant had managed to inflict eight wounds on him, with only one being serious. The medics provided him with the necessary care, and his life was not in danger. Meanwhile, detectives began investigating the crime scene. From the bloodst pains in the corridor, they deduced that Jonah had attempted to reach out to her neighbors and seek help, but none of the four residents had opened their doors. Next to the door to Jonah's room, investigators found the murder weapon, a kitchen knife belonging to Jason. The assailant had struck with such force that the blade had bent. Additionally, the police discovered blood traces near the back door of the apartment and on the staircase leading from the second floor to the street. Considering that Jason and Jonah had exited through the front door, the detectives concluded that the murderer had left the crime scene through the back door. Another lead awaited them in Jason's room. They found a partial footprint that the perpetrator may have left when following the apartment owner and launching the attack. Considering the brutality with which the killer had dealt with Jonah, the police suspected that the crime was personal in nature. Their first step was to closely scrutinize Jonah's fiancé, Jason White. Despite him being approximately 1,000 kilometers away from Knoxville, all friends and relatives attested to the couple having a wonderful relationship and there seemed to be no motive for the fiancé to commit such a heinous crime. The young man only learned about his fiancé's death at 10 a.m. when her mother called him. He said that after hearing the news, he fainted and took a long time to recover. He had to ask his neighbor to book a plane ticket for him and pack his suitcase since he was incapable of doing anything himself. Detectives thoroughly examined his alibi and concluded that he physically couldn't have traveled to Knoxville and returned by morning. As a result, he was eliminated as a suspect, and the investigators turned their attention to Jonah's neighbor. Unlike the victim's fiancé, the neighbor had no alibi. Jason was in the same apartment as her and could have committed the crime. Friends and relatives of Jonah were also suspicious of him, with some considering him the most likely killer. Others accused him of fleeing the apartment and leaving the young woman alone leading the victim's parents to not even want him to attend her funeral. Immediately after Jason was discharged from the hospital, the detectives began interrogating him. The young man stuck to his initial version of events, he woke up to a scream, saw an unknown man, and was attacked when he managed to push the assailant away. Jason rushed to the front door and ran outside, attempting to reach the neighbors. He believed that Jonah had also managed to leave the apartment since he no longer heard her screams. However, the police were hesitant to believe this account. The first thing that made them suspect Jason was his injuries. Seven out of the eight wounds proved to be non-life-threatening, and the last one on his right hand could have been sustained during both defense and attack. Furthermore, forensic experts found no signs of forced entry in the apartment, indicating that the perpetrator was already inside. Jason himself mentioned that he had taken out the trash through the back door that evening but couldn't remember if he had locked it or not. Detectives continued to press him, paying particular attention to the door he used to run out onto the street. Jason insisted that it was the front door, but the police suspected he was lying. If he had exited through the back door, it would explain the bloody traces near the door and on the stairs. In that case, it would further implicate him. Additionally, the police accused him of using and selling illicit substances and behaving aggressively when unable to obtain a dose. Jason denied all of these allegations but the investigators kept bombarding him with various accusations. After spending several hours with Jason at the police station, the detectives offered him a polygraph test, and he agreed. They brought in an expert who asked leading questions, and at the end of the interview, informed him that the polygraph indicated that he had given false answers. Upon hearing this, Jason entered a state of close to hysteria. He screamed that he had nothing to do with the crime and feared for his life as the real perpetrator was still at large. However, the detectives didn't believe him. Nevertheless, they couldn't arrest him for murder since there was no evidence against Jason. They had to wait for the laboratory experts to finish examining the few pieces of evidence found in the apartment. Then, an unexpected turn of events occurred. On the knife used as the murder weapon, three DNA samples were found, those of the deceased young woman, Jason, and an unknown male. The unknown male's DNA was also discovered in Jonah's room, on the back door handle, and on the staircase used by the perpetrator to flee. Furthermore, a fingerprint left by the victim's blood was found on the knife handle, and it didn't match Jason's fingerprint. These discoveries made the police doubt that he was the killer. The evidence confirmed that someone else was indeed present in the apartment that night. However, comparing the DNA samples to existing databases yielded no results. Despite the detectives no longer considering Jason as the murderer, public opinion remained against him. He was accused of fleeing and abandoning his girlfriend instead of trying to protect her. In addition to that, Jason began to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Soon, another interesting fact emerged. It turned out that the polygraph operator had simply misinterpreted the instrument's readings. In reality, there were no signs indicating that Jason was lying. Furthermore, the police had no actual evidence linking the young man to illicit substances. 
they accused him solely to exert additional pressure. Most importantly, the police initially downplayed the severity of the injuries Jason sustained. In reality, he had suffered serious harm, with his lung and neck being severely damaged. Full recovery was unlikely. Due to these police reports, the insurance company only covered 25% of the medical expenses, and Jason experienced significant financial difficulties. After Jason ceased being a suspect, the police began questioning him as a witness. Based on his statements, they created an approximate profile of the attacker. The situation was complicated by the fact that Jason couldn't clearly see the assailant's face, as the room was dark, and the perpetrator immediately attacked him when he exited the room. Detectives also discovered something interesting in Jonah's room, a camp and near the back staircase. There were scattered discs and a stereo player. Initially, they assumed these items belonged to the victim or Jason, but Jason denied it. According to him, none of those belongings were in his apartment, implying that the killer left them behind. The investigators handed the approximate portrait of the suspect to journalists, and after its publication in the news, the police received hundreds of potential leads. People provided information about acquaintances who even remotely resembled the portrait, and the detectives followed up on each lead. One of them seemed particularly intriguing to a detective. They were informed that in the vicinity of Jonah's murder, there was a group of teenagers known for breaking into houses to commit theft. One of them, a 19-year-old named Michael Perkafau, resembled the suspect's portrait, and the police began searching for him. It wasn't easy since the young man was already wanted for theft. However, now that he was suspected of potential involvement in the murder, dozens of police officers joined the search. They eventually located him and brought him to the station. The investigators immediately noticed his footwear. The pattern on the soles resembled the footprint left by the killer. They collected a DNA sample and fingerprints from him and sent everything to the experts. Meanwhile, they interrogated him. During the questioning, the detectives were in for an unexpected surprise. Michael confessed almost immediately that he and his friend had indeed broken into Jonah's apartment that night. According to Michael's account, their intention was to steal valuable items from Jonah's apartment, but his friend grabbed a knife and attacked her. However, the detectives quickly became skeptical of his story. Firstly, the details Michael provided didn't match the actual facts, and secondly, there were no traces of the presence of two outsiders at the crime scene. The laboratory result only confirmed their skepticism. Michael's DNA and fingerprints did not match those found at the murder scene, and the same applied to his shoes. The pattern on the soles was different from the footprint in Jason's room. Eventually, the police realized that the young man was simply lying. Such situations occur quite often, where individuals take on someone else's guilt. Some do it to seek attention, while others lie in hopes of receiving rewards for information. It's unknown what motives drove Michael, but his story turned out to be fabricated. Since then, investigators have interviewed over a thousand potential suspects and collected around 400 DNA samples, but they haven't found a single match. From the early weeks of the investigation, a reward was announced for information leading to the resolution of the case. The amount increased each month and reached $60,000 in December of 2005, one year after the murder. The state governor added $20,000 from his own pocket, further drawing public attention. Despite the numerous leads, all of them proved to be dead ends, and the case remained unresolved for several years. In 2007, Jonah's parents decided to advocate for changes in the state's legislation. They found it astonishing that the perpetrator's fingerprints and DNA were not found in any of the databases. Considering the brutality of the crime, the parents refused to believe that it was his first offense. Later, they learned that, under the laws of Tennessee, fingerprints and DNA samples were only taken from convicted criminals. Jonah's parents resolved to rectify the situation and participated in the creation of a new law that mandated the collection of these samples from all individuals arrested for violent crimes. The authorities supported this initiative, and in May of 2007, such a law was enacted. Two months later, a breakthrough finally occurred in the case. The police arrested 22-year-old Taylor Lee Olson for violating the terms of his parole. The man had been convicted of theft, and during a search of his home, marijuana bushes were discovered, leading to his rearrest. Olson had an extensive criminal history, primarily consisting of thefts, check forgery, and car thefts. He had been arrested multiple times, but his fingerprints and DNA were never taken until now. Despite living with his girlfriend and their newborn daughter, Olson regularly committed crimes. It turned out that Olson had already come to the attention of investigators five months prior. They received a tip about his possible involvement in the murder, but for some reason, the police never attempted to take his DNA for analysis. However, now that he was arrested for violating the terms of his parole, they finally decided to question him about the Jonah case. Olson denied his involvement in the murder and willingly agreed to provide his DNA sample. It was handed over to experts, and soon, the detectives received a report from the laboratory. Taylor's DNA fully matched the sample found in the victim's apartment. Following this, his fingerprints were taken, and they also matched the print found on the murder weapon. Olson was subsequently arrested, and the detectives brought him in for questioning. 
At first, he denied his guilt, but soon, he decided to confess. Taylor explained that on that night, he wanted to steal Jonah's car and entered the apartment through the back door to take the keys. When he entered the young woman's room, she woke up and started screaming. That's when Olsen grabbed a kitchen knife and struck her multiple times. Although he claimed he did not intend to kill anyone and it all happened accidentally, the detectives doubted the truthfulness of some aspects of his account and leaned toward the belief that Taylor had initially planned the murder. It was possible that he had been stalking the victim for some time, indirectly supported by a fact mentioned earlier in the investigation. Jonah's friends told investigators that she had been followed by someone in a car. At the time, they couldn't find any evidence to confirm it, but after Olson's arrest, they considered the possibility that he had indeed been stalking her. Despite the doubt surrounding some details, nobody questioned Olson's guilt. His DNA and fingerprint were found on the murder weapon, indicating that he had inflicted the knife wounds on the victim. Olson's trial was scheduled to begin in mid-2008, and by that time, he had already hired a lawyer. Apparently, the lawyer advised him to retract his confession, and Taylor provided a new version of events to the detectives. Now, he claimed that he had entered the apartment together with his friend named Noah Cox. According to Olson, when he entered Jonah's room to take the car keys, she allegedly woke up, grabbed a knife, and struck him multiple times. Olson ran out of the apartment through the back door while his friend went into Jonah's room, where he grabbed the knife from her and killed the young woman. This account also did not convince the police. No fingerprints or DNA of other individuals were found at the crime scene, making the involvement of someone else unlikely. The detectives were awaiting the start of the trial, but it was never meant to happen. On March 28, 2008, Taylor Olson ended his life in his prison cell. Notes addressed to his family, Jonah's relatives, and the police were found next to him. In the letter to the detectives, he once again claimed that his friend Noah Cox was the actual killer and apologized to Jonah's family and his own. The detectives continued to believe that Olson was the one who committed the murder, yet they repeatedly questioned Noah, but no evidence of his involvement could be found. Jonah's parents also believed that he lied. In their opinion, if Taylor was truly innocent, he would not have taken his own life. It was much more likely that he simply didn't want to spend his entire life in prison. Moreover, for several months after his confession, Olson continued to maintain that he entered the apartment alone and that no one was with him. If he was trying to protect his friend, why did he suddenly retract his confession and start accusing him of the murder? Share your opinions on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching Foreign. A woman in Australia left her home and disappeared without a trace, leaving her husband and two children behind. Relatives tried to contact her, but after several weeks of unsuccessful attempts, they decided to turn to the police. An investigation was conducted, and it was concluded that the woman was not in danger and had the right to control her own fate. Since then, she has not contacted her family. Only 40 years later did they learn the shocking truth. Lynette Joy Dawson was born on May 5, 1948, in the Australian state of New South Wales. She grew up in a large, loving family with two brothers and a sister. Together with her parents, they lived in the small town of Clovely, which is essentially a suburb of Sydney. Lynette was a cheerful child, had many friends, and always tried to help her loved ones. Her parents decided to send her to Sydney Girls High School, believing it would be the best choice for her. The school often held events in conjunction with Sydney Boys High School, and in 1965, at one of these events, Lynette met a boy named Chris Dawson. They were both 16 years old and soon the couple began dating. After finishing school, Lynette decided to pursue a career in medicine. She wanted to help people, so she chose to become a nurse. At the same time, she took a part-time job at a childcare center. When Chris and Lynette were 21, they decided to get married. The couple got married in 1970. The newlyweds moved to the northern suburb of Sydney called Bayview, where the woman got a job at a local hospital. Chris was actively involved in sports and played professional rugby since 1972. He had a twin brother named Paul, with whom they were in the same sports team. Later, they both decided to end their professional careers and became physical education coaches at one of the Sydney schools. Chris and Lynette dreamed of a large family, but they struggled to conceive for a long time. After six years of unsuccessful attempts, they began to consider adopting a child from an orphanage. But Lynette finally became pregnant, and the couple had their first daughter, followed by their second. Lynette and Chris were happy to finally have children. Their family seemed exemplary to friends and acquaintances, but soon the first signs of trouble began to appear in this idyllic picture. Lynette's friends started to notice bruises and injuries on her body periodically. When asked about it, Lynette claimed that it was nothing serious and her friends shouldn't worry about it. Lynette's friends were concerned for her, but they didn't see what was happening as something truly terrible. 
In those days, domestic violence wasn't considered a serious crime in the eyes of a significant portion of society in Australia. Moreover, everyone who knew Chris considered him a loving husband and caring father who never showed signs of aggression and was a positive person. Therefore, their friends tried not to interfere in their marriage and hoped that the couple would solve their problems. But the relationship between Lynette and Chris only continued to deteriorate. Lynette noticed that her husband had cooled towards her and was worried about the future of their family. A few years after the birth of their daughters, they decided to use the services of a nanny. Chris suggested this job to one of his 15-year-old school students, Bev McNally, but she didn't stay in this part-time job for long. She witnessed Chris raising his hand to Lynette twice and decided to leave. After this, Chris offered this job to another of his 16-year-old students, Joanne Curtis. After some time, Joanne had problems in her family, and Chris offered her to stay with them for some time so she could spend more time looking after the children until the situation in her family improved. Despite her kindness and desire to help people, Lynette was against this. She was deeply concerned about the problems in their own family and didn't want someone else to be constantly present in their home. However, Chris insisted on it, and in October 1981, Joanne moved in with them. The young woman lived with them for about a month until Lynette discovered that her husband was sleeping with Joanne. It was a real shock for her and another blow to their marriage. She kicked Joanne out of the house but decided not to divorce Chris. Lynette wanted to keep their family together for the sake of their children, and she continued to love her husband despite his actions. Just a few months later, on December 3, 1981, Lynette faced yet another shock. Chris left her a note saying that he was leaving the family. He wrote that he would move to another city with Joanne and asked his wife not to portray him in a bad light to the children. Lynette was devastated by this news, but a few days later, she was surprised again. Chris returned home because Joanne changed her mind about avoiding him in another city and asked to be taken back. Meanwhile, Chris spent New Year's Eve with Joanne, leaving his wife alone with the children. At that time, Joanne moved into Chris's brother's house, which was on the same street. Despite everything that was happening, Lynette wanted to keep their family together no matter what, so she decided to enroll in family therapy. Chris was against this idea, but she managed to convince him. She went to see the specialist right after New Year's, and it seemed that the therapy had a positive effect on their relationship. Chris started to spend more time with his wife and showed a desire to fix everything. On January 8, 1982, Lynette called her mother and told her that the family therapy was going well. They also agreed to meet with her and other relatives at the local beach the next day. Her mother thought that her daughter's speech sounded a bit unclear, as if Lynette was drunk. The woman explained that Chris had prepared some alcoholic drink for her. The next day, the relatives were waiting for Lynette on the beach, but she never showed up. They called her at home, and Chris said that he had driven his wife to the bus stop that morning. She was going to the store to return some clothes that didn't fit. However, she never returned home, and her relatives began to worry. In the evening, Chris called Lynette's mother and told her that his wife had contacted him by phone. She said that because of the problems in their marriage, she had decided to be away from home for a while and gather her thoughts. Her relatives thought that what was happening was strange, as they were aware of the problems that had been building up between the spouses for years. But they still couldn't imagine Lynette leaving her two daughters. She loved her children more than anything in the world and never mentioned considering the possibility of going somewhere. Days passed, but Lynette still didn't contact her family, which only added to their worry. On January 12, Chris reported that Lynette had called their home phone and said that she was okay. Since then, he had spoken to her a few more times and told her relatives that she had been using her bank card. Despite this, her family continued to doubt that Lynette was okay. She didn't know how to drive and didn't take any items that she might need for a living. She even left behind cash that was hidden in case of an emergency. Three weeks later, Lynn. Ed's eldest daughter started first grade, as the school year in Australia begins in January. But Lynette missed this event, which caused even more concern for her relatives. They were practically certain that something bad had happened to her, while Chris said that she continued to regularly call home, and the last such call was at the end of January. Since then, Lynette hadn't been in contact. On February 18, six weeks after Lynette left home, her husband went to the police. He filed a missing person report and expressed suspicion that amid all the problems in their marriage, Lynette could have joined some religious organization or even a cult. Her relatives denied such a possibility as Lynette was not religious and didn't attend church. The police began a search, but they had absolutely no leads. Lynette's mother and other members of her family were certain that she would never leave home, abandoning her daughters. So they believed that she had been kidnapped or some other tragedy had occurred. Despite this, the police concluded that Lynette had indeed left home, as they had no evidence of the contrary. They tried to find her for some time and then stopped the investigation. Chris posted a message for Lynette in the local newspaper, calling for her to come home. He wrote that he loved her and was eagerly awaiting her call. He also called all of her friends, trying to find any information about his wife's whereabouts. 
Despite Chris's eagerness to find Lynette, he divorced her a year after her disappearance, and the next year, he married Joanne Curtis, his former student and lover who had moved in with him. On January 10, 1982, a day after Lynette went missing, Joanne became the stepmother of Lynette's daughters, and Chris, not wanting to traumatize the children with the stories of their mother's disappearance, told them that Joanne was their real mother. Lynette's relatives were not happy about what was happening, but they couldn't do anything about it. They stopped relying on the police, as they had long ago stopped investigating due to the complete lack of leads. Moreover, they didn't even try to question all of her relatives and friends, and the case was abandoned almost immediately without a proper investigation. Chris and Joanne moved to Queensland with the children, selling their old house. Chris almost completely cut ties with his former wife's relatives, only occasionally calling her mother. Later, Chris and Joanne had a daughter. Six years passed, and during that time, Lynette never contacted anyone. This continued until 1990 when something unexpected happened. Chris and Joanne divorced, and soon after that, Joanne contacted Lynette's relatives to pass on shocking information. She said that she had suspected her husband of murdering his ex-wife all this time. According to her, a month before Lynette's disappearance, Chris had talked about hiring a hitman to get rid of her. On the very day she disappeared, he told Joanne that Lynette had left forever and would never return. She also advised the police to search the backyard of the house where Lynette and Chris lived. In 1991, the police questioned Chris. He said that his ex-wife was just trying to tarnish his name and that he had nothing to do with Lynette's disappearance. He admitted that the woman was intentionally doing this to get custody of their daughter after the divorce. At that time, the court was deciding who would have custody of their child, and Chris's arrest would have been beneficial to Joanne. Police seized phones from Chris and his brother, but nothing suspicious was found. So investigators once again abandoned the case, considering Joanne's words dubious. The case remained dormant for another nine years until 2000 when the police decided to excavate the backyard of Chris's old home. But there was a catch. Due to insufficient funding, they only dug around the pool area. This area was chosen after police talked to the new homeowners. According to them, during the sale, Chris persistently asked if they planned to change anything exactly in this place. The only thing that the police managed to find was a torn pink cardigan. Investigators admitted that it could have belonged to Lynette and contained some evidence, but DNA analysis found no matches with Lynette. A year later, the case was once again brought to attention. This time, the deputy state prosecutor concluded that Lynette was killed by someone she knew. Police resumed the investigation, questioning her friends and relatives, but they failed to find any leads. Only in 2003, two years later, investigators publicly announced that they considered Chris a suspect. They wanted to charge him with murder, but it never happened due to the complete lack of evidence. The man could not be convicted, but investigators managed to find many witnesses who reported that Chris and his brother regularly had intimate relationships with their school students. However, no charges were brought on this matter and as a result, the case stalled again. In 2006, Chris claimed that he saw his wife among the extras of a series filmed in England, but no one could find any evidence to support his words. In 2010, police announced a $100,000 reward for information about Lynette's disappearance, and four years later, they doubled the amount. Despite the large number of appeals, this did not bring any results and they failed to find any reliable leads. In 2015, police dug up a section of Chris's former home, trying to find his wife's body, but they were unsuccessful. The turning point in this case came in 2018 when a podcast about Lynette's disappearance was released and gained massive popularity in Australia. Arguments were presented in favor of Lynette's husband being responsible for her murder. The podcast was listened to by several million people, which led to a wave of public outrage. Australians accused the police of negligence and demanded that the culprit be punished. The podcast author, Hadley Thomas, spoke to Lynette's relatives and tried to find new leads, although he was unable to find any new evidence against Chris. The public outcry was enough to initiate a new investigation. As a result, on December 5th of that year, detectives arrested Chris for the first time on charges of murder. He continued to insist on his innocence and was released on bail before the start of the trial. The trial dragged on for several years. In 2019, he appeared before a judge and claimed that he did not kill his wife and that the trial should have started in 2020. But Chris's lawyers consistently delayed the process. They insisted that due to the widespread coverage of the case in the media, their client had a biased attitude towards him. So they demanded that they abandon the jury and conduct a trial where the judge would make the decision. In May 2022, this demand was approved and the trial finally began. Chris's lawyers insisted that there was not a single piece of evidence against their client and all the charges were based on societal bias due to the podcast. According to them, the author presented his opinion in such a way that many believed in Chris's guilt and refused to adequately evaluate the situation. Despite the lack of direct evidence on the prosecution side, 
They built their case on a multitude of indirect factors. Relatives and acquaintances of Lynette who had repeatedly seen signs of abuse on her body testified in court, and Lynette had admitted to them that Chris was responsible. Their neighbors who witnessed the man beating her also testified in court. Relatives and acquaintances of Lynette who had repeatedly seen signs of abuse on her body testified in court. Lynette had admitted to them that Chris was responsible. Their neighbors, who witnessed the man beating her, also testified in court. They recounted that the day before Lynette's disappearance, when she returned to family therapy, she had bruises on her neck. One of the key witnesses was Joanne, who revealed that as she grew older, she realized how unhealthy her relationship with Chris was. He became obsessed with her when she was only 15 years old. He would leave notes in her backpack at school and ask her out. On days he was persistent and didn't take no for an answer, so the young woman felt like she had nowhere to turn. According to Joanne, Chris completely controlled her life. He told her what to wear, who to talk to, and what to do. He monitored her every move and couldn't stand it when things didn't go according to his plan. As a result, the woman concluded that the man could have easily killed his wife. According to the prosecution, Chris had wanted to end the marriage for a long time but he would have lost part of his property and custody of the children in the divorce. So he decided to kill Lynette and stage her disappearance. In addition, he wanted to get rid of her so that she wouldn't interfere with his relationship with Joanne. Chris's lawyers, on the other hand, insisted that Joanne had made all of this up to intentionally slander her ex-husband. They also called several witnesses who claimed to have seen Lynette years after her disappearance. These testimonies became the mainstay of the defense, but there was no evidence to support their claims. The prosecution believed that these testimonies were simply fabricated and that if Lynette was alive, she would have contacted her relatives and daughters over the years. As for the phone calls that Chris allegedly received in the first month of her disappearance, no evidence of their existence could be found. The prosecution argued that the woman was already dead at that time and the man made it all up to convince Lynette's relatives that she was okay. In their view, Chris killed the woman on January 9th, drove her body in an unknown direction, and hid it because the police were negligent in their work. In those years, no proper investigation was conducted, although the killer's motives were always obvious. The trial lasted for 10 weeks, and on August 30, 2022, the judge found Chris guilty. A few months later, in early December, the sentence was announced, 24 years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after 18 years of imprisonment. Considering that he will be 92 years old by then, Chris may simply not live to see that time. After the sentence was handed down, Lynette's relatives, including her eldest daughter, spoke. She no longer doubted that her father had killed her mother and said that his actions had destroyed her life. The woman demanded that her father confess where he had hidden Lynette's body so the family could finally bury her. But Chris remained silent and looked at the floor while his daughter spoke. Despite the fact that almost 41 years have passed since Lynette's murder, her relatives still hoped to find her remains. Chris, who is now 74 years old, continues to insist on his innocence. But even his own children do not believe him. Thus, one of Australia's most high-profile cases was solved, in large part thanks to a podcast that drew the attention of millions of people to this unjust story. If the police had conducted a proper investigation from the beginning, the killer could have been punished immediately after the crime, not after four decades. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. In 2021, a young woman named Riley Goodrich went on a first date with a guy to the movies. However, the evening took a tragic turn. Although the case was quickly resolved, there are still many strange and shocking aspects to it. In this video, we will recount the events unfolding for Riley Goodrich and Anthony Baraja. On July 26, 2021, a tragic shooting occurred in California, resulting in the loss of two teenage lives. Some of my regular TikTok viewers may be familiar with Anthony Baraja, a 19-year-old famous TikToker with almost 1 million on the app and posted videos of himself singing, doing pranks on his family, and sharing moments from his life. On the 4th of July that year, he attended a party where he met an 18-year-old named Riley Goodrich. Although Riley wasn't as popular on the app, she had a decent following of over 20,000. She was studying marketing on a full scholarship at Grand Canyon University and was home for the summer visiting her parents. Described as a nice and easygoing young woman, Riley got along well with Anthony. They spent time together whenever their mutual friends would meet up and eventually decided to go on a proper date, just the two of them. Riley informed her father about meeting someone, but he was skeptical when she mentioned that Anthony was a famous TikToker. However, on the 26th of July, 2021, Riley excitedly prepared for her first date. Anthony had recently returned from a holiday in Hawaii and wanted to impress the Goodrich family. 
He brought souvenirs for the entire family when he came to pick up Riley. Her father was touched by this gesture, seeing it as a sweet act, and he finally started accepting Anthony. The couple then set off for their date. Anthony planned to take Riley to her favorite restaurant called Wood Ranch. After enjoying some food, they headed to the cinema. Anthony had acquired tickets for a late-night showing of the new Purge movie at the Regal Edward Theater, scheduled for around 9.35 p.m. During the date, Riley sent a few text messages to her mother to keep her updated on how things were going. At some point during the movie, she messaged her mother, mentioning that she found the storyline a bit dull and silly. Little did they know that this would be the last message Riley would ever send. After the movie ended, the theater employees began cleaning the theater, only to discover a horrifying scene. Riley had been shot in the head, and Anthony had been shot in the eye. Tragically, Riley was pronounced dead at the scene, while Anthony was rushed to Riverside Community Hospital and placed on life support. The doctors found several projectiles in his brain, and the police recovered three bullet casings and one projectile in the theater. An investigation quickly commenced, aiming to uncover what exactly happened that night. It didn't take long for the police to find the person they were looking for. Only six tickets were purchased for the 9.35 p.m. showing of the Purge movie, including the ones bought by Anthony and Riley. Through ticket records, the police identified a 20-year-old man named Joseph Jimenez as another ticket purchaser. An anonymous tip led the police to Joseph, who had gone to watch the movie with three friends that night. According to the three friends' accounts, Joseph left during the middle of the movie and returned with a bag, claiming to have a strap. His behavior, including mumbling and talking to himself, made them extremely uncomfortable. They devised a plan to leave, without raising his suspicion. They excused themselves, telling Joseph they needed to use the restroom, and left the theater without alerting the staff or contacting the police. With Joseph now alone in the theater, he committed a despicable and cowardly act. He approached the unsuspecting teens from behind and shot them. Riley was shot in the back of the head, resulting in her immediate death. Anthony, upon hearing the gunshots, turned around, and Joseph shot him in the eye. The sound of the movie masked the sound of the gunshots, so none of the staff heard anything unusual. At around 11.28 p.m., two witnesses saw Joseph running out of the theater and escaping into his vehicle. The following day, the police went to Joseph's house. He had called the Riverside Sheriff's Department, claiming that someone was following him, but it was the law enforcement officials who were there to search his home. Joseph was seen yelling and brandishing a handgun, but thankfully, no one else was injured. He surrendered to the police without much resistance. The caliber of the handgun he waved at the police matched the one used in the shooting. Furthermore, a movie ticket for the Forever Purge was found in his wallet, placing him at the crime scene. Initially, Joseph was arrested for the murder of Riley and the attempted murder of Anthony. However, the charges were soon changed to two counts of murder as Anthony succumbed to his injuries a few days later. Despite Joseph blaming the voices in his head for what happened, stating that they tormented him for over eight months, no motive has been established. He claimed that the voices threatened harm to his friends and family if he didn't shoot the young couple in the theater. Nevertheless, he didn't explain how killing the couple would save his loved ones. Joseph had been diagnosed with schizophrenia eight months prior to the shooting but had recently stopped taking his prescribed medication, citing running out and neglecting to refill it. He told investigators that the voices were overwhelming that night, making it impossible to concentrate on the movie. Thus, he went to his car, retrieved a gun, shot the teenagers, and swiftly fled. He was arrested the following day. Joseph faced a special circumstances allegation of lying in wait, which refers to hiding and waiting for the right moment to launch an attack. This charge carries the death penalty. Currently, he is being held on a $2 million bail. There is no indication that he knew the victims before the attack, and their status as TikTok influencers doesn't appear to have played a role in the crime. Joseph offered his condolences to the victims' families in a statement, expressing regret for his actions, stating, I wish I didn't do it. One unsettling aspect of this case is that Joseph's friends who were with him that night faced no repercussions. They weren't charged, even though they failed to notify the authorities despite their fears about Joseph's potential danger. Their decision to leave him behind indicates that they knew he was acting strangely and might have possessed a firearm. While they might not have known the extent of his capabilities, they had enough concerns to exit the theater. The theater has since implemented purse checks before allowing entry. Riley's father advocates for the introduction of metal detectors in movie theaters, similar to those used at sports events. However, the cost and practicality of such measures make them nearly impossible to implement. This case is a heartbreaking reminder of the senselessness and innocence lost, as two teenagers were simply enjoying their first date together. It serves as a poignant reminder that life can be unpredictable and fleeting. I will strive to provide updates on the case in the future, and I will leave them pinned in the comments. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it. Thanks for watching. 
A young woman was found dead at her workplace. Detectives found several unusual clues, but they were unable to catch the culprit. Several years later, when the police re-examined all the clues, they made a very unexpected breakthrough. Perry Nelson was born on December 13, 1980 in the small American town of Lavern, Minnesota. She had loving parents, a younger sister, and many friends. Carrie was kind, empathetic, and always tried to help her loved ones. After graduating from the local high school, she enrolled in college in the neighboring state of North Dakota. She wanted to become a doctor so that she could help others. While in college, she met a young man named Mike Callen, and they became engaged. After a while, Carrie tried to balance her college studies with part-time work at the National Blue Mound State Park located near her hometown. Her duties included selling park tickets and escorting guests who came to relax at the camping site, go hiking, or see the bison. Carrie worked there for the second season in a row, and she loved the place. In addition to being a relatively easy job, she could also spend a lot of time in nature enjoying the picturesque landscapes. On May 20, 2001, she went to work as usual that day. Besides her, only one young woman named Rebecca, who was doing an internship at the park, was working there. In addition to her main duties, Carrie had to train and introduce Rebecca to the work process. Carrie's shift started at 8 a.m. and was supposed to end at 3.30 p.m. For most of the day, she was with Rebecca, explaining the work nuances. Around 12.45, Rebecca went to the office building located at the other end of the park, and Carrie stayed in a small room at the entrance. Rebecca returned around 2.30 p.m. She entered the building through the back door and immediately saw a horrific scene. Carrie lay motionless on the floor with a pool of blood near her head. At around the same time, a shocked Rebecca heard the front door. Thinking it might be the same person who attacked her colleague, she immediately ran out through the back door and rushed home. The young woman lived in a house located within the park grounds because her father was a manager, so she quickly ran there. Rebecca told her parents what had happened, and her father immediately ran there, while the young woman's mother called the police. The man arrived at the building and found no one there except Carrie. He tried to feel her pulse and realized that she was dead. After that, he closed the curtains, locked the front door, and called 911. At around the same time, another call came into the police. It turned out that the room Rebecca discovered her colleague's body inside, a park visitor walked in, not the attacker. The woman went to the registration desk and saw Carrie's body next to a puddle of blood, then returned to her car and also called 911. Police arrived on the scene and began their investigation. The young woman's body was lying behind the registration desk, where phones and cash registers were located, and things and papers were scattered around. One of the phone receivers was off the hook, the plastic pen of Carrie's chair was broken, and its pieces were on the floor. Based on this, the police assumed that a struggle had taken place between the victim and the attacker. After talking to the managers, the investigators found out that two bank bags intended for money storage had disappeared from the building. In addition, cash was taken from the cash register, with the total amount stolen being approximately $2,000. On the floor, detectives found several clues, men's wristwatches with a torn strap and a pack of cigarettes. Considering that Carrie did not smoke, the police assumed that the cigarettes were left by her killer. As for the watches, they assumed that the young woman tore them off the perpetrator's wrist during the struggle. Large particles of orange-colored stone were also found on the floor. The manager told investigators that these particles likely came from the decorative stone with the park's name, which was located on the registration desk. The police searched all the rooms and could not find the perpetrator. Considering that blood spatters were visible on the walls and ceiling of the room, they immediately assumed that this stone was the murder weapon. At the same time, their colleagues blocked the road leading to the park entrance and began questioning all visitors. The couple who stopped at the campground reported that around 2.30 p.m., a white car with a brown vinyl top drove past them at high speed. Unfortunately, they did not remember the model or license plate number of the vehicle. The investigation was complicated by the fact that there were no surveillance cameras in the park since crimes were very rare. The available evidence included a wristwatch, a pack of cigarettes, and the vague testimony of witnesses. Medical experts examined the victim's body and concluded that the cause of death was blows to the head with a heavy object. They suggested that the perpetrator may have used a large decorative stone, but this version could only be confirmed after its discovery. According to the investigators, the attack on Carrie occurred between 2 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. They found a love letter that she had written to her fiancé at her workplace. In the letter, Carrie expressed her eagerness for their wedding and described her desire to have two children. She put the date and time of 2 p.m. that day on the letter. Another interesting fact was that the men's watch found next to the victim's body stopped at 2.16 p.m. Perhaps they stopped working just after Carrie had taken them off her attacker's wrist. Police cordoned off the park and began searching for additional clues. Five days later, they found the decorative stone in a nearby stream. Apparently, the killer took it with him and threw it into the stream from a bridge while driving over it. 
Medical experts compared the relief of the stone with Carrie's head injuries and confirmed that it was the murder weapon. However, the water had washed away all fingerprints and DNA traces that the perpetrator may have left. No other clues were found, and the case remained unsolved for months. A year after the murder, a prisoner serving time in the local jail came forward to the police. He told them that his cellmate, Anthony Powers, had boasted to him about being responsible for Carrie's murder. Detectives investigated and found that Powers had an extensive criminal history, mostly for bank robberies, which had landed him in jail multiple times. Interestingly, Powers had escaped from prison shortly before Carrie's murder and was caught after the fact. However, his fingerprints and DNA did not match those found at the crime scene. Moreover, the witness's description of the murder did not match reality. The detectives concluded that both prisoners were attempting to deceive them for a reward of $50,000 for information leading to the solving of the case. Since Powers was already serving a life sentence, additional charges did not scare him. Additionally, in the event of a guilty verdict, he could have avoided being transferred to a federal prison and remained in the state correctional facility, which he preferred. The case remained unsolved for several years. Detectives regularly reviewed the case, hoping to find new evidence, but their efforts were fruitless. They even put up a photo of Carrie in their office to remind themselves of the case. Every day. In 2007, the case was reopened. By that time, DNA analysis technology had significantly advanced and experts re-examined the wristwatch. This time, they were able to identify three precise DNA profiles, one belonging to Carrie, the second to an unknown man, and the third to an unknown woman. Both of these samples were run through the state database, but no matches were found. Then the detectives remembered an interesting detail, a special sticker was found on the pack of cigarettes discovered next to the victim's body. In those days, each state had a labeled tobacco products, so the police knew for sure that the pack was purchased in South Dakota. The detectives sent the DNA samples to their colleagues in that state, and here they had a long-awaited breakthrough. When they ran these profiles with the South Dakota database, one of them showed a complete match. The man turned out to be 35-year-old Randy Laroyal Swanee. This name had never appeared in police reports in Carrie's case, so it was a surprise for the investigators. Randy turned out to be a serial robber, and at that time, he was serving a 30-month sentence in a South Dakota prison. At the time of the murder, he was out on parole. The police also discovered that he had a light-colored Oldsmobile Delta at that time, which matched the witness's description. The investigators checked his fingerprints, and they matched several prints found at the murder scene. Despite all this, the detectives wanted to gather as much evidence as possible before charging him. Randy had only one month left to serve in prison, so the police decided to act as quickly as possible. They spoke to his wife, not mentioning what her husband was suspected of. The woman was already used to Randy regularly coming to the attention of the police for robberies and thefts, so she was not surprised by their visit. The detective showed her photos of a watch, and the woman immediately confirmed that they belonged to her husband. She also said that she sometimes wore them, and the investigators immediately realized that the last DNA sample from the watch belonged to her. Then they decided to reveal everything and told her that they suspected her husband of killing a young woman. The woman burst into tears, but the police quickly realized that she was primarily scared for herself. Learning that her DNA might be on the watch, she thought that she too would be accused of the murder. On April 19th, detectives came to visit Randy in prison and attempted to speak with him without specifying what he was being suspected of. However, Randy refused to talk without a lawyer present. After the unsuccessful interrogation, Randy called his wife. As all prison calls are recorded, the police were able to listen in. The woman was angry and asked what he did. She revealed that the detectives were investigating him for a murder that occurred in Blue Mound State Park and was more worried about her DNA being found on a watch. At times, she began to cry and scream that she didn't want to go to jail for a crime she had nothing to do with. Randy, on the other hand, repeated that he knew nothing about it. The woman actively cooperated with the police, providing her DNA samples and allowing them to search their home. She also gave them several photos of Randy, one of which showed him sitting behind the wheel of a white car similar to the one witnesses saw. In another photo, the man's watch was visible and was fastened to the fourth clasp, just like the watch found at the crime scene. Additionally, his wife confirmed that Randy smoked the same brand of cigarettes that were found near the body. All of this was enough to take the case to trial. Randy was charged on May 8, 2007, one day before his release. He was immediately transferred to a prison in Minnesota and the prosecution began preparing for the trial. According to their version of events, Randy initially chose the park building as an easy target for robbery. There were no cameras or guards, but there was cash. When he entered, Carrie may have been in another room. Seeing that nobody was there, Randy began stealing money from the cash register. But the young woman returned and caught him in the act. A struggle ensued, and the man may have used threats to make her open the safe. Afterward, he took a decorative stone and struck her more than five times because he feared leaving a witness alive. 
even his relatives, including his wife, testified against him in court. They all said that Randy regularly committed thefts, used banned substances, and had serious gambling problems, which constantly put him in debt. His former cellmate told how Randy mentioned leaving his watch at the crime scene. Another cellmate claimed that after the police came to interrogate Randy in jail, he said, this time they got me. I'm looking at life. Randy's lawyers insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder. According to their version, Randy lost his watch sometime before the incident, and the real killer found it. However, this version conflicted with the results of DNA analysis. There were three samples of genetic material on the watch, Randy's, his wife's, and Carrie's. Randy claimed that on that day, he went fishing near a town about 150 kilometers away from the park. However, since he supposedly was there alone, no one could confirm his alibi. He also said that he had been in the park only once long before the murder. He admitted that he left his fingerprints there at that time, but there was another discrepancy. One of Randy's fingerprints was found on a leaflet that was made only four days before the murder. All defense arguments had no weight and contradicted real evidence, and Randy's lawyers tried to blame someone else. First, he called Powers and another inmate to testify, but their story still did not match reality. Then he began to harass the victim's fiance, constantly hinting that he could be the real killer. The trial lasted until August 15, 2008. After six hours of deliberation, the jury found Randy guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After that, he continued to insist on his innocence and filed multiple appeals, but they were all rejected. From the beginning, all his defense was built on absurd versions that contradicted DNA analysis and other evidence. So, there are no chances for his case to ever be reconsidered. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it. Thanks for watching. A 19 year old young woman, Nana Dirksmeyer, was found dead in her own apartment. Investigators began investigating and quickly discovered several disturbing facts, but they were unable to solve the case for several years. Until the truth came out, everyone was shocked and outraged by the turn of events, as no one expected such an outcome. Nana Dirksmeyer was born on December 26, 1985, in Russellville, Arkansas. She grew up in a very large family, with four brothers and one sister. When Nana was 10 years old, her father passed away, which was a tragedy for the entire family. But they were soon to face an even more terrible shock. Sometime later, the young woman confessed to her mother that her father had repeatedly subjected her to violence. She was afraid to speak up while he was alive, and her confession was a real shock to her mother, who had no idea what her husband was capable of. Despite such a tragic experience, Nana found the strength to move on and later decided to help other young women who had become victims of similar crimes. For this, she joined a volunteer organization where she provided support to children in need. During her school years, Nana began dating a guy named Kevin Jones. The young woman also took part in beauty contests and achieved significant success in this field. She won several local contests, which allowed her to compete for the title of Miss Arkansas. In addition, Nana actively participated in the life of the local church and sang in the choir. After high school, when Nana was 19, she and her boyfriend enrolled in Arkansas Tech University located in their hometown. The young woman decided to rent her own apartment as she wanted to start an independent life. After completing her first year, her boyfriend decided to change his major and transferred to another university, which was an hour and a half drive from their city. By that time, the couple had been dating for about five years, and it was their first time living in different cities. On December 14, 2005, Kevin returned home for Christmas holidays. He stopped by Nane's apartment before heading to his parents' home which was about 16 kilometers away from the city. The next day, both of them had plans. Nana had to take her last two exams and also meet with a young woman from the volunteer organization. Kevin was going to take his mom, who worked as a librarian, to a school event. On the morning of December 15th, at around 9 a.m., Nana sent a message to Kevin wishing him a good day. He was waiting for Nana to call him after her exams and let him know how they went, but she wasn't answering his calls or messages, and he began to worry. Around 6 p.m., Kevin took his mother to the school event, but he couldn't shake the thought of why Nana wasn't answering her phone all day. Eventually, Kevin decided to call his friend, who worked as a pizza delivery guy in the area where Nana's apartment complex was located. Kevin asked him to stop by and check if everything was okay. His friend quickly arrived and saw that Nana's car was parked in the parking lot and the lights were on in her apartment, but nobody was answering the door. He told Kevin about this, and then Kevin told his mother that he was worried about his girlfriend and wanted to go to her apartment to check if everything was okay. The woman agreed, and they went to the apartment complex together. Kevin's friend was waiting for them there, and all three of them started knocking on the door, but there was still no answer. Kevin had a key, but 
He left it at home that day because he didn't plan on stopping by Nanae's. A few minutes later, Kevin and his friend tried to open the front door because they thought something bad might have happened to Nane, but they couldn't get in. Then Kevin remembered that there were sliding glass doors in the back of the apartment. Approaching them, he immediately noticed something strange. Nana took her safety seriously, so every time she was home alone, she put a special removable grill on the back glass door, mainly used against burglars. But this time, there was no grill, and the doors themselves were unlocked. Once inside the apartment, they immediately noticed blood on the blinds, and a shocking sight awaited them in the bedroom. Nana was lying face down in a pool of blood, wearing nothing but socks. Kevin rushed to her and tried to lift her but immediately realized she was dead. Meanwhile, his mother called the police. Investigators arrived at the apartment and began examining the crime scene. They immediately suspected that the victim had been struck multiple times on the head with a table lamp that was found on the floor. They also discovered a bloody fingerprint on the lamp, which they believed may have been left by the killer. Next to the victim's body, they found her phone with the battery removed on the bedside table. Investigators found an empty condom wrapper. After examining all the doors and windows, they found no signs of forced entry. Medical examiners studied the victim's body and confirmed that the table lamp had been used as a weapon, with the metal base of the lamp matching the victim's head injuries. In addition, the victim had multiple knife wounds. According to the pathologist, the victim had died between 10.30 a.m. and 1 p.m., and there were no signs of sexual violence, which puzzled the detectives, considering that the victim was found without clothing. They first suspected a sexual motive for the crime. However, experts suggested that the perpetrator may have used a condom, the wrapper of which was found in the apartment, making it practically impossible to determine the presence of sexual violence. In the end, the police had no evidence, but one interesting detail emerged. The crime scene was not thoroughly examined, with investigators failing to collect blood samples from the blinds on the back door or search for shoe prints in the apartment, which could have been used as evidence. Moreover, they didn't even go to the second floor of the apartment. These oversights were explained by the fact that the investigators found their suspect, the victim's boyfriend, almost immediately after arriving at the scene. The first thing that made them suspect Kevin's involvement in the murder was the fact that he had a large amount of the victim's blood on him when he entered the apartment and ran to her. He tried to lift her up, and upon realizing that she was dead, he hugged and held her. The police found this behavior strange and suspected that Kevin had done it deliberately. By hugging the victim and getting covered in her blood, he may have destroyed potential evidence and compromised the crime scene. It would be difficult for investigators to prove his guilt. For example, if Kevin's clothes or nails were found with the victim's blood, it could easily be explained that he hugged the victim after discovering her body. Another suspicious moment was that Kevin went to check on his girlfriend not alone but with his mother, and he also invited his friend to the apartment. Investigators believed that this way he secured two witnesses who found the body with him and saw him covered in blood. The police talked to Kevin for a long time right outside Nani's apartment, and from their questions, the young man realized that they considered him a suspect. Then he said something that made the investigators even more convinced that he was the killer. Understanding that he was suspected, Kevin began arguing with the investigators and mentioned that he constantly watches law and order and knows that they are trying to make him guilty. These words also seemed strange to the police. In addition, they found out that the key to Nane's apartment was only with three people, the girlfriend herself, her mother, and Kevin. Considering that no signs of breaking in were found, they assumed that the guy used his copy of the key to enter the apartment. Kevin was taken to the police station for interrogation for several hours. He told his version of events that day and insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder. In turn, investigators directly accused him of this and urged him to confess. During the interrogation, another fact emerged that the police considered strange. Around 4 p.m., after numerous attempts to call his girlfriend, Kevin sent a message asking if she was alive. Given that Nana was already dead at that time, the investigators found this suspicious. While the guy did not demand a lawyer and tried to answer all questions, the investigators talked to him for several hours, constantly increasing pressure. Towards the end, they not only accused him of the murder directly but also manipulated the facts. Detectives said several times that there was incontrovertible evidence against him and the only way to lighten his fate was to confess to everything. After the police left the interrogation room and left him alone, Kevin stood up and started punching the back of the chair. For the investigators, this became another sign that the young man had a tendency to violence and could commit murder. However, in reality, the police had no evidence that could link Kevin to the murder. Medical experts found that Nana had tried to fend off her attacker, meaning that there should have been bruises and scratches on the killer's body, but none were found on Kevin. Despite this, the detectives continued to believe he was guilty and tried to find evidence. They interviewed over 50 people, hoping to find any witnesses, but it yielded no results. However, after talking with Nane's friends, the police learned something important. It turned out that shortly before her death, she had started seeing another guy secretly from Kevin. 
Investigators immediately checked this person, but he had a solid alibi for the time of the murder. This fact added even more suspicion to Kevin because now he had a motive. The young man could have come to Nane's house without warning, seen an empty contraceptive package, and realized that she was cheating on him. In a fit of rage, he could have killed her and then fled the scene and planned a way to avoid responsibility. This version was consistent with the nature of the injuries inflicted on the victim. She was killed with particular cruelty, which, in most similar cases, indicates strong personal animosity of the killer towards the victim. A few days later, Kevin agreed to undergo a polygraph test. The operator concluded that the young man gave numerous false answers, and one of the investigators even claimed that this was the worst result on a polygraph in his 28-year career. However, there is one caveat here. The person who read the device's readings was not a certified specialist. He was just a police officer who had not undergone the necessary training to work with this device. But this did not bother the detectives. After the interrogation, they again put pressure on Kevin, trying to force a confession. They claimed that all his acquaintances and relatives already knew that he killed Nane. The police really told everyone that Kevin's guilt was practically proven and that he would soon be arrested. They convinced the victim's parents that he was the one who killed their daughter, although they refused to believe it until the end. The day before the funeral, a farewell ceremony was supposed to take place in the church, and Kevin had been helping to organize it. Since early in the morning, he was called in for questioning again, with the promise of being released before the start of the ceremony. In the end, Kevin spent seven hours at the police station and missed the ceremony. Nobody present knew he was being questioned, so many assumed that Kevin didn't show up due to guilt over what had happened. Nane's parents didn't even want him to come to the funeral, as investigators had already convinced them of his involvement in the murder. But Kevin still came and sat far away from her relatives. By that time, experts had finished examining the evidence that the police had taken from the victim's apartment. Upon inspecting the light bulb in the desk lamp, they found a fingerprint that belonged to Kevin. It had been left by Nane's blood, which indicated that the fingerprint could only have been made during or after the murder. This became the only available evidence for the investigators, but they continued to dig under Kevin for several more months, hoping to find more evidence. They were unable to do so, and on March 31, 2006, they decided to try to obtain a conviction with the available evidence. The young man was arrested and charged with murder. At that time, many residents still believed that he was guilty, so Kevin's lawyers first requested a change of venue to another district. They were concerned that the jurors might be negatively predisposed against their client and render a guilty verdict without sufficient evidence. This request was granted, and the trial began in another city. The defense called a witness who provided Kevin with a solid alibi. A plumber had come to his parents' house that morning and saw him there around 10.30 am. The prosecution insisted that Kevin could have had time to go to Nane's and commit the murder, as according to medical experts. She had died between 10.30 am and 1 pm. They also presented an interesting fact. Kevin's phone had been turned off between 10.30 am and 12 pm. This time frame coincided with the time of the victim's murder. Furthermore, data from Kevin's phone showed that he only started calling his girlfriend at 4.30 p.m., although during questioning, he claimed that he had been trying to contact her all day. However, at that time, the young man may have meant not only calls but also messages. Lawyers presented two more witnesses whose testimony disproved the possibility of Kevin committing the murder. One of them was Kevin's grandmother, who said that on that day, she saw her grandson near the gas station and gave him some money to have a snack at a cafe. Another witness saw the guy between 12.30 and 1 p.m. near the restaurant, and the establishment's cameras recorded him having lunch. Thus, the young man simply could not have committed the murder and returned back in time. Lawyers also challenged the fact that Kevin could have left a bloody fingerprint on the lamp during the murder. In that case, by the time the body was discovered, the blood should have dried up, and the experts who came to the apartment that evening wrote in the report that the bloody fingerprint was slightly damp, confirming that Kevin could have left it accidentally when he found Nane's body with his mother and friend. But that's not all. It turned out that based on the table lamp, which was used to hit the victim, fingerprints were also found, but they did not belong to Kevin, and checking them against the databases did not yield any results. Lawyers insisted that these fingerprints belonged to the real killer. Lawyers also pointed out that the police did a very poor job from the first minutes. They did not inspect the entire apartment which could have missed many potential clues. At the trial, a medical expert who examined the victim's body spoke, and an interesting statement awaited all participants in the process. He determined that after death, the victim's body lay on her back for some time after which she was turned face down. This could indicate that the young woman was still subjected to violence. The expert confirmed that he did not find any direct signs of this but added that he could not rule out such a scenario. Finally, lawyers presented the main trump card. According to the official statement of the prosecution, 
No fingerprints or DNA were found on the empty contraceptive package found next to the victim's body, but lawyers ordered a retest, and this time, the experts found male DNA. The analysis showed that it did not belong to Kevin, and checking it against the databases did not yield any results. The trial lasted over a year, but in July 2007, the jury delivered its verdict. They found Kevin not guilty of the murder of Nana due to lack of evidence. For the victim's relatives, who had believed him to be the killer from the first weeks, this decision was a shock. They continued to believe that Kevin was responsible for her death and now he had managed to avoid punishment. Despite their client being acquitted, the legal team promised to continue working on the case and find the real killer. Considering that the police were fixated on Kevin, no one expected them to finally do their job properly. The first thing the lawyers did was to get the DNA from the contraceptive packaging compared to all the men who knew Nane. All these people voluntarily provided their samples, and none of them matched. This went on for two months until something unexpected happened in September 2007. The police arrested a man named Gary Dunn for robbery, and that's when things got interesting. Firstly, this man had already been convicted for attacking another woman. Secondly, he lived in the same residential complex as Nane. Thirdly, in the early stages of the investigation, the police considered him a suspect but quickly switched their focus to Kevin as they believed he was the killer. Given all this, the boys' lawyers requested a DNA test, and there was a long-awaited breakthrough. The sample from the contraceptive packaging matched Gary's DNA. It turned out that after the young woman's murder, investigators even questioned him using a polygraph. Gary, who was 26 at the time, passed it completely, even though in that case, the interrogation was also conducted by a non-certified specialist. Moreover, none of them even checked this person's alibi. Then Gary said that during the murder, he was shopping with his mother. After his DNA matched the sample from the victim's apartment, investigators finally bothered to check this information. The alibi turned out to be false. Gary really went shopping with his mother, just not at the time of the murder, as confirmed by the receipts with the purchase dates, and Gary even showed them to the police. But they simply disregarded such important information. They saw that the dates on the checks did not match the day of the murder. This was stated in the reports, but for some unknown reason, they either did not attach importance to this or somehow did not notice that the days did not match. In the end, experts compared Gary's fingerprints with those found on Nane's table lamp, and they matched. However, a serious problem arose here. The fingerprints and DNA matched, but not 100%. The judicial system has certain norms according to which the necessary coincidence indicators are established for guilt recognition. In Gary's case, these indicators were insufficient, although there were practically no chances that the DNA and fingerprints belonged to someone else. The investigators were likely guilty. Firstly, they did not study all the available evidence immediately after the murder as the rules require. It is possible that the DNA samples deteriorated slightly while not being properly studied a year after the murder. Secondly, the police could have missed many other clues because they simply did not search the entire apartment. As soon as the detectives received all this information, they arrested Gary and charged him with Nane's murder. Interestingly, at the time of her death, the man was on parole. In 2002, he attacked a woman who was running in the park, knocked her down, and started beating her, telling her that he was going to kill her. The woman managed to escape and ran to her car, while Gary fled the scene but was quickly found. The man spent 19 months in prison, after which he was released early. Interestingly, his DNA sample was not entered into the database. The trial of Gary began in April 2010, and there were many interesting things waiting for everyone. His own wife testified against him, saying that he was an aggressive and dangerous man. Gary regularly raised his hand against her, and the woman seriously feared for her life, so she was afraid to leave him. But the most interesting thing was that a few weeks before the victim's death, she saw her husband spying on Nana through the window of her apartment. Based on this, the prosecution assumed that the man had premeditated the attack. Given his criminal history, Gary clearly had a tendency towards violence, and he may have been keeping a close eye on Nana since she lived just a few meters away from him. On December 15th, he decided to act. Apparently, he knocked on her apartment door and came inside under a false pretense, where he grabbed the table lamp and struck her several times before assaulting and killing her. Because Gary used contraception, medical experts could not definitively say whether the victim had been sexually assaulted, but all the evidence pointed to it. Gary's lawyers denied his involvement, but he had no real alibi, so they focused on trying to blame Kevin. According to the lawyers, Kevin found out that the young woman was cheating on him and killed her. Kevin even had to testify in court and listen as they tried to paint him as the true criminal. Unfortunately, the prosecution could not use Gary's fingerprints or DNA as evidence, even though the match was practically undeniable. As a result, the jury could not come to a unanimous decision, and the trial was declared a mistrial. A new trial was not far behind, and its key difference was that a woman who Gary had nearly killed in 2002 testified in court. 
She told her how the man had attacked her and how she barely managed to escape. But despite this, the second trial also ended in nothing as the jurors did not reach a consensus. Consequently, Gary Dunn walked free as a free man, although his guilt was practically obvious. But a few years later, he did earn himself a prison sentence in 2018 when Gary was 39. He committed two separate crimes in one day. First, he attempted to kidnap a woman from a church parking lot, but she managed to fight him off. A few hours later, Gary stripped down in front of another woman in a mall parking lot and was soon arrested. Given his criminal history and the fact that he is practically a killer of non-A, the court decided to sentence him to the maximum term. Gary received 15 years in prison for these two incidents, and he is serving his sentence to this day. Despite having the right to petition for early release, authorities are unlikely to grant Gary such an opportunity. Additionally, they have the right to accuse him of Nane's murder for the third time, but they're not rushing to do so. The likelihood of the new trial ending in the same way as the previous two is very high, so investigators are trying to gather more evidence and prepare a stronger case against Gary. As for Kevin, after everything that happened, he pursued the study of law and, in 2011, he sued two police officers from the authorities of Russellville and Gary Dunn. He claimed that they were trying to pin someone else's crime on him, ignoring many clues and refusing to do their job properly. During the preparation for the trial, Kevin found out that, in fact, Gary's polygraph test results also showed lies, but investigators still did not consider him a suspect. Unfortunately, his lawsuit was dismissed due to the statute of limitations. As a result, negligent police officers did not face any consequences for letting the real killer roam free for years. And maybe, there again, in a few years, they will also not be punished for the fact that all acquaintances and relatives of Nana believed for years that Kevin was the murderer. Only a few years ago, her parents stopped believing this and restored their relationship with him. Now, Kevin works as a lawyer and strives to help those who suffer from police negligence or unprofessionalism. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. An animation studio in Japan has climbed to 33 as Asia correspondent Rene Henry explains it's the country's worst mass murder in almost two decades. Today's video focuses on the tragic Anim Studio massacre in Kyoto, Japan, which stands as one of the most horrifying crimes in recent history. This heinous act was the result of the hatred harbored by a single individual, resulting in the loss of numerous innocent lives. Before delving into today's topic, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. If you find this story compelling, please share it widely. We eagerly await your thoughts and opinions on the matter. On July 18, 2019, at approximately 10.30 in the morning, a Japanese national targeted one of the three buildings belonging to Kyoto Animation. Carrying a cart filled with liquids, this man entered the building without any resistance since there were no security personnel or employees at the doors. He had been surveilling the location for three consecutive days, ensuring a smooth entry. Without uttering a word, he proceeded to pour the contents of his cart later identified as gasoline, throughout the offices, floors, and foundation. As the bewildered staff attempted to comprehend the situation and the man's motives, panic and fear gripped them when they realized the nature of the substance. The man's chilling words, die, die, echoed through the building. Despite their attempts to restrain him, the employees were unsuccessful. In that critical moment, several employees surrounded him. Realizing his escape was impeded, the man ignited a lighter and set himself ablaze. He swiftly fled the building, following a meticulously planned exit strategy. However, he suffered severe burns due to the rapid spread of fire, intensified by the presence of highly flammable gasoline. Losing consciousness some distance away from the studio, the situation spiraled out of control. Frantically, everyone inside the building ran for their lives, with only a handful managing to escape before the fire engulfed the premises. Those fortunate enough to flee identified the perpetrator as the individual responsible for the inferno. Tragically, most individuals remained trapped inside, unable to find a means of escape. Their bodies succumbed to the flames, and the screams grew increasingly desperate. With each passing moment, 
The number of victims continued to rise as the fire ascended to higher floors, spreading CO2 gas throughout the building. Approximately 70 employees were present that day. In a mere 30 seconds, the fire consumed the entire first floor. Within a minute, it had engulfed the second, third, and subsequent floors. The only viable escape route was to reach the roof, but the spiral staircase proved to be a hindrance due to its limited capacity. Time proved insurmountable. The dense smoke rendered visibility impossible for some, making it difficult to breathe. Some lost consciousness, while others, fully aware and alive, resorted to unthinkable measures in a desperate bid to survive. Panic, terror, and fear gripped everyone within those walls. The fire trucks arrived after considerable delay, endangering the lives of those trapped inside as they struggled to control the massive blaze. It took five hours to gain some semblance of control and a full 24 hours to extinguish it completely. Subsequently, the police took charge of the situation, transforming the scene into a horrific tableau reminiscent of a horror movie. Charred corpses littered the hallways and corridors. The final death toll reached 34, with 36 individuals injured. Two among the injured later succumbed to their wounds, while the remaining survivors endured a year of medical treatment and multiple operations. Despite their best efforts, scars marred their bodies, permanent reminders of the tragedy. Some individuals never fully recovered and continue to bear the burden to this day. Among the survivors was Shinji Yuba, the 41-year-old man responsible for the attack. Born in 1978 in Japan, little is known about his childhood. It is, however, established that his parents divorced when he was young, and he lived with his father. Isolated and lacking companionship, Yuba's psychological state deteriorated after his father's suicide in 1999. His behavior grew increasingly aggressive, even threatening his neighbor with death over a request to lower the volume of his radio. In 2012, Yuba perpetrated a robbery brandishing a weapon and demanding money from a shop owner. Consequently, he received a three and a half year prison sentence, which he served in its entirety. Following his release, he came across a quiz in a newspaper sponsored by the Kyoto Studio. This annual competition featured multiple stages, culminating in the winner's story being adapted into a studio series with a monetary reward. Intrigued, Yuba applied for the contest but was rejected during the initial stage. Undeterred, he resolved to try again the following year, determined to win. He submitted his story to the studio, only to face rejection once more. Disillusioned and frustrated, Yuba contemplated giving up. However, toward the end of 2018, while watching a series produced by the same company, he became convinced that his ideas had been plagiarized. The company vehemently denied any wrongdoing, dismissing his claims as baseless. The events Yuba accused them of stealing were trivial occurrences, common in various series, egg, friends going on a trip, swimming, and enjoying specific foods. Convinced of the company's attempt to deceive him and feeling wronged, Yuba sought to confront its manager. However, his attempts to communicate were rebuffed leaving him no choice but to exact revenge through an extraordinarily twisted plan. Yuba began hacking into the email accounts of numerous employees associated with the company, sending death threats over an extended period. Although the company took precautions and stationed police officers at the building entrances and exits, they were withdrawn once the threats ceased. Yuba had cleverly employed an unbreakable code, concealing his identity as the sender. During this lull, he meticulously planned and executed the criminal act that led to the tragic incident. After two months in a coma, Yuba emerged and underwent numerous skin grafts. Due to the overwhelming number of victims requiring similar procedures, artificial skin grafts were performed on him. Once his treatment concluded, Yuba faced charges of premeditated murder and received a death sentence by hanging. 
However, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the execution was delayed. Currently, Yuba remains incarcerated, while multiple parties advocate for a life sentence, considering his potential mental disorder, which could mitigate his punishment. The aftermath of this incident and the extensive media coverage prompted several changes in the country's constitution. One significant amendment pertained to gasoline regulations, with restrictions placed on the sale of large quantities to individuals. Strict protocols were implemented for its purchase. Additionally, companies were mandated to deploy security personnel at building entrances and exits, ensure the presence of fire evacuation stairs, distribute manual fire extinguishers throughout the premises, and adopt smart lock systems designed exclusively for employees. The tragic events of that day and the subsequent fallout had a profound impact, prompting critical legal reforms and highlighting the imperative need for enhanced safety measures to prevent such tragedies from recurring. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe. Click on one of the two videos on your screen for more content like this. When this news made the headlines throughout Singapore, nobody believed it. Singapore is one of the safest countries in the world, having only had one serial killer in its history. However, the murder of Ayakanu Maria was no joke. In 1984, the 34-year-old caretaker was killed, dismembered by a butcher, and cooked into curry. Unfortunately, the curry turned out to be far from tasty, and several people complained about its foul taste. When the police finally took on the case, they unraveled a very complicated story. In this article, we will explore who murdered Aya Kanu, why they did it, and how they managed to get away with it. Well, on January 9, 1987, the police department in Changi, Singapore, was having a slow day, as usual. Not many serious crimes occur in Singapore, which made the following event all the more strange for the police officers. Detective G. Alagamale's pager buzzed. It was his trusted informant. The informant informed Detective G that he had been wanting to talk about this for two years and couldn't hold it in any longer. He claimed that two years prior, he had consumed a very peculiar curry at the Orchard Road Presbyterian Church and there was something off about the meat. He was convinced that he had unknowingly eaten Ayakanu Maria's remains. As a detective in the sixth safest country in the world, where the murder rate is 0.17 per year, Detective G found it hard to believe his informant's claim. He initially thought the informant might be intoxicated or playing a prank. However, when Detective G dismissed the matter, the informant became even more serious. He insisted that he knew all about Ayakanu, an Indian-born immigrant who came to Singapore in 1980 with his wife Ramia and their three children. They resided in a small house behind the Presbyterian Church. Ayakanu worked as a caretaker for the Public Utilities Board's Run Holiday Chalets, located along Biggin Hill Road. Some members of his family also worked at the church. However, Ayakanu mysteriously disappeared at the end of 1984, and the informant was convinced that he had been consumed in the curry served in January 1985. Detective G didn't know how to react. The story was not only disgusting but also outrageous and difficult to believe. Nonetheless, when he returned to the police station, he decided to share it with his superiors. Since there wasn't much happening at the station at the time, they told Detective G that he could take on the case if he wished. Little did they know that Detective G was about to uncover one of the most haunting and bizarre cases in Singapore's history. Detective G wasn't going to waste any time. He was deeply intrigued by this crazy story, and as soon as he looked into the name Ayakana Marifa Mufu, he discovered a missing person file from December 1984. Surprisingly, it turned out that Detective G's own wife had reported Ayakanu missing. According to her report, Ayakanu was supposed to borrow money from his employer and go on vacation in Gunting Highlands, Malaysia, a location known for its casinos at the time. The police initially dismissed the case, assuming it was a man running away from his family, and it was soon forgotten when the family never contacted the police again. However, there were several peculiar aspects about this missing person file that caught Detective G's attention. Firstly, he found it highly unlikely that Ayakanu would go gambling or borrow money from his employer, especially since he had recently borrowed $600 to pay for his children's school books. 
This meant that he still owed money to his employer and had no funds left for gambling. On the other hand, it didn't seem like Ayakenu was planning to abandon his family. He had made appearances before his planned vacation, and he had even taken days off work just before Christmas Day, indicating his intention to stay home for the holidays. So why would he disappear just two days before going on vacation? Furthermore, there was something else that stood out as the biggest clue of all. Mia, Ayakanu's wife, had reported him missing but then abruptly stopped all contact with the police. In Ayakanu's case, nobody seemed to care. His wife and children even left their home months after his disappearance. Mia took a caretaker job at Fucho Methodist Church and brought her family along as if she knew Ayakanu was never coming home again. Throughout early 1987, Detective G spoke to everyone who knew Ayakanu, not just his family but also neighbors, churchgoers, church staff, and anyone who might have heard something. It was during these conversations that a clearer picture started forming in the detective's mind. Contrary to what he expected, most people didn't express sympathy for Ayakanu. Instead, they seemed relieved, saying things like good riddance. It turned out that Ayakanu was a notorious raging alcoholic who brutally abused his wife. Ramia, on a daily basis. He would beat and kick her in front of their children and even in front of Ramia's brothers, who also resided in Changi. The neighbors could hear their fights and witness Ramia's daily bruises. There was another side to the story as well. In traditional Asian culture, divorce is rarely considered an option, and those who choose to divorce often face significant shame and may even lose their family's support. Understanding this cultural context, Detective G started piecing together what had actually happened to Ayakanu. Detective G made a significant discovery. One of Ramia's brothers, Balakrishna, worked as a butcher and mutton seller. In Detective G's words, a mutton seller would have heavy choppers, which seemed to fit well with the case. If the informant's story was true and Ayakanu had been turned into curry, a butcher would have the knowledge and tools to dismember his body. However, Detective G had a hunch that there were more individuals involved, and he wanted to gather all the names before making any moves. This way, he could ensure that no one would escape before being apprehended. By March 23rd of that year, Detective G had identified three more suspects, two men and a woman working at two churches involved in the finance ministry holiday bungalows in Changi. That night, officers from the special investigation section conducted a large raid, Several locations were simultaneously raided at 2 a.m., resulting in the arrest of eight suspects. All of them were Ayakanu's relatives, including his wife, her three brothers, their wives, and Ramia's mother. Balakrishna, Ramia's brother, worked as a butcher and mutton seller. Her other two brothers, Krishnana and Jamligam Chandra, worked as caretakers at the Finance Ministry Holiday Bungalows and the Orchard Road Presbyterian Church. Out of the eight suspects, some adamantly denied their involvement, while others remained silent, wearing a composed poker face and waiting for the police to take action. However, one of them eventually broke under the pressure from the officers. According to their confession, the murder occurred inside the Presbyterian Church's caretaker quarters on December 12, 1984. Rainia's three brothers had confronted Ayakanu, intending to warn him to stay away from their sister, threatening to beat him up. However, Ayakanu resisted and wanted to fight back, leading the brothers to decide to end his life. They restrained him on the ground and bludgeoned him to death with an iron rod. Here's where the story takes an even more gruesome turn. The family realized that they couldn't simply bury Ayakanu's body in a wooded area, as they would likely be caught. Given Valakrishna's butchering skills, he took his best meat cleavers and proceeded to dismember Ayakanu's body, just as he would with mutton. The family then cooked numerous batches of curry and biryani using Ayakanu's meat. These traditional Indian dishes were heavily spiced with chili powder to mask the terrible taste. The larger bones and skull were crushed and placed in black plastic bags, which were disposed of in various rubbish bins throughout the neighborhood. As for the curry, there was a significant quantity of it. Ayakanu's family packed it into large bags, some of which were simply discarded like spoiled restaurant food. Others were taken to various local churches in Changi, Singapore. Unbeknownst to the churchgoers, many of them consumed the human curry. During their investigation, the police spoke to a sanitation worker who had come across a tightly sealed bag filled with curry while cleaning a large dumpster. Intrigued by the pleasant smell and apparent freshness, he decided to taste it. 
However, the taste was so awful that he had to spit it out. As the police interviewed numerous churchgoers in the area, they uncovered the grim reality that many of them had unknowingly consumed the disturbing curry. In December 1984 and January 1985, the three brothers and Ramia were charged with murder, while Ramia's sister-in-law, Mary Mandui, and Mother Kamachi were charged with abetting the crime. The case garnered nationwide attention, making headlines all over the country. Jagajit Singh, the director of the Central Investigations Department, described the case as unusual because the victim's remains were never found and the murder had not been reported. The disposal of the body added to the bizarre nature of the crime. Here's where the story takes an even stranger twist. Three months later, all six suspects were brought to court, and Detective G and his dedicated team of officers were confident that the family would be convicted and sentenced to imprisonment. They had a suspect's partial confession, testimonies from various individuals who knew Ayakanu, and a reasonably clear theory to present to the judge. The trial drew a crowd of 200 people and garnered significant attention across Singapore. Facing the death penalty, all six suspects stood before the court as journalists from around the country anxiously awaited the verdict. However, the prosecutor, Cushion, declared that there was no way to proceed with the case. Firstly, Ayakanu's body had been disposed of meticulously, leaving no trace behind. The murder weapon was never found, and even Balakrishna's meat cleavers provided no substantial clues. It's possible that the police did not scrutinize them closely enough, or DNA analysis was not feasible with the technology available in 1987. Ayakanu's killers may never face full justice as the police only had an outrageous confession and reports of the bad curry. Consequently, all six suspects were discharged and released, and the case was dismissed. However, it's important to note that they were not acquitted and they could still face charges if sufficient evidence is presented in the future. The police promised to continue their investigations in hopes of gathering more evidence against the family. On the day of their release, the three brothers were arrested again under the Criminal Law Act. They were held in Changi Prison for four years. Yet, today, Ayakanu's killers roam free, potentially under aliases and protected from police scrutiny. However, Ayakanu's death is a complex story. Should Ramia face the death penalty? Does her husband's constant abuse justify her brother's decision? And to what extent should Ramia be held responsible if the murder was not premeditated? These are all questions that add layers of complexity to the case. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and before you go don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. See you next time. This is the story of how a murderer can avoid punishment for years, even though many facts point to his involvement. In a small town, a 13-year-old girl disappeared, and her disappearance was not noticed until 24 hours later. This case remained unsolved for over 10 years, and only in the summer of 2021 did it come to its conclusion. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dunn. The story took place in the American town of Colorado City, Texas. This place is a typical low-rise America with an area of 14 square kilometers. Only 4,000 people lived in the town. On Christmas Day 2010, the town had a New Year's atmosphere. Residents decorated their homes, participated in festive events, and had fun. 13-year-old Haley Dunn was no exception. For Christmas, she was given a new iPod, which made her very happy. Haley lived with her mom, Billy, her boyfriend, Scene, and her older brother, David. Her mother divorced her own father, named Clint, when the girl was 10 years old. However, they never stopped communicating. In fact, her father lived literally across the street from Haley's house so they saw each other almost every day. The girl was very close to her father and tried to spend time with him as often as possible. Family and friends described the girl as cheerful, funny, and energetic. She was a member of her school's cheerleading team, participated in athletics, and played the saxophone. Haley was also on three sports teams. On December 26, the girl spent most of Christmas at her father's house, unwrapping presents. Afterwards, she came home played video games, and went to bed. The next day, her stepfather and mother went to work as usual. Billy left her cell phone at home so the children could contact her. Before she left, she peeked into her daughter's bedroom while she was still asleep. Scene was working in another town, which was about a half-hour drive away. According to him, he had an argument with his boss that day, 
which resulted in him being fired and leaving work just 10 minutes after he arrived. He then drove to his mother's house, spent some time there, and returned to Colorado City about 3 p.m. in the evening. Scene went to pick up Billy from work, and when they arrived home, Billy noticed that her daughter wasn't home. Scene told her that the girl had gone into his room that afternoon and told him that she was going to her father's house. After that, she planned to go to a friend's house and spend the night. Haley often stayed overnight at her friend's houses, so her mother took this information calmly. Small towns like this often have the illusion of safety, so parents are less worried that something might happen to their child. The next day, December 28, Haley never came home. Billy decided to call the parents of a friend at whose house her daughter was supposed to spend the night. To her mother's surprise, they weren't even aware that Haley had planned to spend the night at their house. She hadn't shown up. It was further revealed that the girl hadn't even stopped by her father's house. Then, Billy got worried and decided to ask her neighbors if they had seen her daughter. She went door to door, and no one had seen the girl that day. Around 2 p.m., Billy went to the police, but they decided to take the easiest route. The police's main theory was that she had run away from home, which initially hindered the investigation. A voluntary escape is not investigated on the same level as a missing minor. They searched Billy and Clint's homes and brought search dogs to the scene. The next day, they picked up Haley's trail from the house to a local motel. It was very strange that none of the motel employees had seen this girl. She wasn't captured on any security cameras, and a full search of the building yielded no results. Trained dogs pointed to a motel, but the girl apparently never showed up there. As news of Haley's disappearance spread through the city, dozens of concerned people joined the search. Some looked around the area while others printed and handed out flyers. Here we come to another strange moment. Clint, the girl's own father, practically never left the street. He looked in every corner, every possible nook and cranny, even looked in dumpsters. According to him, he just couldn't sit at home and wait. Meanwhile, Billy and Seam were not so enthusiastic. The mother handed out flyers but refused to go around the neighborhood looking for her daughter. She explained that searching gave her the impression that they were already looking for her body and that there was no chance of finding the girl alive. As for Seen, he took absolutely no part. But that's not the strangest thing either. On December 31, four days after the girl went missing, Billy and Seen threw a New Year's Ed party. They had friends over, listening to music, drinking and partying, a behavior exhibited by a mother whose daughter had disappeared without a trace, seemed simply absurd. On January 3, a week after Haley's disappearance, the police finally declared her missing officially. This declaration allowed more serious agencies, such as the FBI and the Texas Rangers, to get involved. Representatives from these agencies arrived in Colorado City and began their investigation. Meanwhile, volunteers continued to calm the area, and over 100 billboards were posted throughout Texas and beyond, seeking information about the missing girl. Detectives completely ruled out the possibility of Haley escaping. Firstly, they couldn't find a reason why Haley would choose to take such a step. The day before her disappearance, she had been in a fine mood, and throughout the rest of the time, she showed no signs of a tendency to run away. Secondly, all of her belongings were left behind in her room. If she had decided to run away, she would have taken something with her. The detectives quickly realized they needed to take a closer look at Billy and Scene. Their passive attitude towards the girls' search and the New Year's Eve party raised serious questions about their concern for Haley. Further investigation revealed that on December 27, the same day Haley allegedly spent the night at a friend's house, Scene and Billy had withdrawn $140 from their bank cards. They admitted using the money to purchase illegal substances, which they consumed that evening while their children were away from home. On January 6, the police reported that Billy and Scene had been questioned using a polygraph. The results were very interesting. Billy failed on two attempts, the first while under the influence of substances, and the second result showed her lying. Scene also failed two interrogations and walked away before finishing the third round of questioning. Following this, Billy suspected Scene's involvement in her daughter's disappearance and demanded that he move out of her home. On January 12, the police officially announced that Scene was being treated as a suspect. Several facts contributed to this decision. Firstly, it became known that Scene and Billy's relationship had been strained, with Scene having previously threatened both Billy and her daughter with violence during arguments. 
Secondly, among Sin's belongings, numerous sheets containing information about serial killers were found. It later emerged that both Sin and Billy had taken an interest in similar topics. Additionally, the police examined Sin's phone's geolocation data, which revealed inconsistencies in his account of the day Haley disappeared. While he did arrive at work and stayed for 10 minutes, he did not go to his mother's house as he had claimed. Instead, he returned to Colorado City and headed to Billy's house. It was only later that he drove to his mother's house. It's important to note that the police tracked the phone's location via cell towers, which have a range of several miles, allowing for only a rough estimation of Sean's whereabouts. Moreover, interviews with Haley's friends and acquaintances uncovered even creepier details. Haley repeatedly expressed fear of Sean. She admitted to her best friend that she preferred spending time outside or at friends' houses because she didn't feel safe around him. She once confided in her grandmother that she often saw Sean standing in front of her bedroom door in the middle of the night, causing her to fear he would enter the room. Additionally, during a conversation about Haley's disappearance with her uncle, he expressed disbelief that anyone would harm a child. Sean's response was extremely strange, as he said, it's like killing a deer. Armed with this information, the detectives concluded that Haley had not lived in a prosperous family. Her mother and stepfather frequently drank, used illegal substances, and hosted parties. Sean's behavior raised significant suspicions, but there was no direct evidence against him. Eventually, the police contacted Child Welfare, who made the decision to remove Haley's older brother from the home. On February 24, the police searched the house where Sean lived with Billy and his mother. A shocking discovery awaited them, a removable drive and hard drive containing over 100,000 obscene images of minors were found. The police also seized Sean's laptop, but apparently did not have the opportunity to examine its contents. Sean's father came to the station and demanded the return of his son's equipment for reasons unknown, and the police complied. Surprisingly, Sean received no punishment for possessing such illegal material on his computer. On March 17, police officers went to Billy's house to question Sean. Although a woman initially claimed he wasn't home, the officer presented a prearranged warrant and entered the premises, discovering Sean hiding inside. Billy, who had been concealing him, received 90 days in jail and a year of correctional time. She was sent to a correctional facility in Travis County, where she stayed after her release. In 2012, however, the couple finally broke up as Billy seriously considered Sean's involvement in her daughter's disappearance. Since then, the case had effectively stalled, with no new evidence emerging and volunteers unable to find any trace of the missing girl. This continued until March 16, 2013, when a hiker discovered human remains. Near Lake J.B. Thomas in Scary County, experts conducted the necessary tests and determined that the remains belonged to Haley Dunn. Her body was found about 20 miles from her home. Police have not disclosed the cause of death, but sources say it could be blunt force trauma. After the discovery of the body, the investigation reignited. Authorities offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the culprit. Their focus turned back to scene, but nothing had changed since the girl disappeared. The police simply didn't have direct evidence against him, but they had circumstantial evidence. The girl's body had been found only a few miles from Sean's mother's house, which matched the geolocation data on his phone, given the short distance. Sean could have easily left the body in that area without anyone knowing. Moreover, he grew up in the area and would have known where it was best to hide the body. However, the investigators could not find any other clues, and the case was frozen again for many years. Despite this, the girl's family had to wait four years to bury her remains. A memorial service was held in January 2017. In 2018, Haley's father, Clint, expressed his belief that Sean and Billy were guilty. According to his version, Sean's mother either helped cover up the truth or was directly involved in the murder. That same year, Clint began giving numerous interviews and actively publicizing the case. He stated that in the early years of the investigation, he tried not to pester the police with constant questions, but his patience had run out. The detectives did little to investigate, and his last hope was to spread the word widely in an effort to bring the perpetrators to justice. In 2019, an unknown person wrote to Clint, claiming to have found several items that might have belonged to Haley in 2011. At that time, the person was in high school and was unaware of the missing girl, so they didn't report their findings to the police. 
The true information about the items has not yet been disclosed by the police. Sometime later, new information emerged from private investigator Erica Moore, who was handling the Haley case and kept in touch with Clint. In October 2019, she started receiving messages from various women in Texas, stating that they were being aggressively harassed online by a man registered under the name Casey. This man was not only sending lewd messages, but also explicit photos and videos of himself. Considering Scene had the same middle name, Erica asked the women to send her the photos and videos. Her theory was confirmed, as it was indeed Scene. Erica persuaded one woman to go to the police station and file a report on scene, but they refused to press charges and even accused the woman of falsifying the facts. Erica's plan to put a potentially dangerous criminal behind bars for stalking women on the internet did not work. The case went quiet again until an unexpected development in May 2021. Erica and Clint were invited to the district attorney's office for an urgent meeting. There, they received the long-awaited announcement that Haley's killer would be arrested in June. However, the specific information was kept secret until June 14, 2021. After 10 years of waiting, the police finally took Scene into custody and charged him with the murder of Haley. He is currently in jail awaiting trial, with a bail set at $20 million. The police have not disclosed the new evidence that led to his arrest, as it is being kept secret until the trial. Prior to the arrest, the police obtained permission to take a DNA sample from scene, which may have some connection to Haley's belongings found back in 2011. Upon learning of her ex-boyfriend's arrest, Billy made a very strange statement, expressing no surprise about scene's involvement in the murder. She also thanked God that he would now be punished for what he had done, even though she had actively obstructed justice during the early investigation by defending scene. The trial date is yet to be announced and it is uncertain whether a conviction will be obtained, depending on the significance of the evidence that the police are currently withholding. However, Scene remained at large for over 10 years, despite all the evidence pointing to his involvement in Haley's murder, including her complaints to friends and relatives, possession of forbidden materials involving children, and constant lies during interrogations. Clint, unlike Billy, put forth his best efforts and played a crucial role in the case's potential resolution. Erica Moore, in one interview, hinted that the case might not have been solved without his active participation. More details of this case and, most importantly, the court decision are expected to come in the near future. Currently, all indications suggest that Scene could face a conviction, and in Texas, that would mean a guaranteed death penalty for what he did to the child. Unfortunately, this cannot bring back Haley Dunn and give her a long and happy life. A 20-year-old student went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The whole country was watching for her, and the police could not find a single clue. The truth revealed through surveillance footage shocked all of America and sparked fierce controversy. Today, we will tell you the story of Molly Tibbetts and what her disappearance led to. Molly Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1988, in San Francisco, California. When she was in second grade, her parents divorced, and Molly moved to Gawa with her mother and two brothers. Her father, however, continued to maintain a close relationship with his children. After high school, she enrolled at Yawa State University as a psychology major. In her spare time, she worked at a day camp at the Regional Medical Center. She had an active lifestyle, played sports, and had many friends. She spent the summer of 2018 in a tiny town called Brooklyn, which is also in Yawa. It is barely over three kilometers in size and only has 1,400 people living there. It would seem that in such a quiet place where everyone knows each other, nothing terrible could happen. On July 18, 2018, Molly was going for a run. She was living in Brooklyn with her boyfriend, Dalton Jack, at his brother's house. On the evening of that day, she was in the house alone. Her boyfriend was away at work in another town 210 kilometers from Brooklyn. Molly sent him a picture on Snapchat and went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. The next day, Molly was supposed to go to work, but she never showed up. This seriously disturbed her family and boyfriend. They all knew that the girl was extremely responsible and never missed work without warning. In addition, she did not respond to calls and messages. As a result, the parents decided to contact the police, who began a search for Molly. From the early days, the case began to attract increased attention across America. As for the residents of Brooklyn, 
the disappearance of a young girl was a real shock. Nothing like this had ever happened in this quiet town before. People had never locked their doors and were sure of their own safety. Molly's father, Rob Tibbetts, came to Brooklyn from San Francisco and took an active part in the search. He handed out flyers with her photographs, questioned people, and tried in every way to help the investigation. The parents did not give up hope until the very last moment that their daughter would be found alive and unharmed. Three agencies got involved in the search for the girl, the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Powasheet County Police Department. Together, they worked on more than 2,000 leads and interviewed about 500 people. The search for Molly was scattered throughout Brooklyn's neighborhoods. At one point, law enforcement received a report that Molly had been spotted at a truck stop in Kearney, Missouri, 380 miles from Brooklyn. The police checked this information and could find no confirmation. The police, as is proper in such cases, checked the theory that her boyfriend was involved. Statistically, most crimes of this nature are committed by relatives or loved ones, but not this time. The boyfriend's alibi was ironclad. He really was in another city and physically couldn't have been in Brooklyn that night. Time passed, and the search for Molly yielded no results. The Criminal Investigation Division announced a cash reward for any information leading to the girl's return alive and unharmed. The amount grew steadily and eventually reached $366,000. This was a very substantial amount of money, even by U.S. standards, and for the state of Iowa, the reward was a record. At one point, the police said they were narrowing the search for Molly to a few locations around Brooklyn, her boyfriend's house, several local farms, a gas station, a truck stop, and a car wash. But none of it helped to locate Molly. The police received hundreds of leads, each of which led to a dead end. There was one episode, however, that struck me as odd. The owner of one of the pig farms where the police concentrated their search was extremely reluctant to contact law enforcement. He denied any involvement in Molly's disappearance but refused to take a polygraph examination. All this made him an excellent candidate for the role of suspect, but there was no evidence against him. This meant that the police could neither interrogate the man nor search his farm. The police tried to find some connection between the farmer and Molly's disappearance, but they were unsuccessful at least at that time. However, everything changed on August 21st. A few days earlier, a law enforcement source told reporters that the police had found the body of a young white woman. Of course, everyone immediately assumed it was Molly, and they were right. On August 21st, the police issued an official statement. Molly Tibbetts' body was found in Powshik County, where Brooklyn was located. The parents identified their daughter, and the investigators immediately noticed she was missing two items she always took with her, a smartphone and a fitness bracelet. Soon, the medical examiner made an official conclusion. The girl was attacked by several blows with a sharp object. This further shocked the residents of Brooklyn. They all knew each other and could not even think that there was a violent criminal among them. The newspapers also broke the story, making the whole of America talk about it. The solution to this gruesome crime was nor did the police have much hope in the case, given the complete lack of evidence. No one believed that the girl and child could be found. Compounding the situation was the fact that crucial time for the search had been lost in the first few days. 24 years had passed. Mark had started a new family and he had two daughters. He had long ago stopped believing that he would one day see Charlotte and Mark alive. But in 2001, the case took a new turn. Charlotte's daughter from her first marriage, Jennifer, flew to Hawaii and went to the police station. She convinced them to reopen the case of her mother's disappearance. The detectives agreed, put Charlotte and Mark's information into the missing persons database, and created a computer portrait of Mark growing up based on his childhood photo. The first thing the detectives decided to do was to interrogate Mark because his behavior in the early stages of the investigation seemed strange to them. There was no mention in the old documents that the man had called the police station by phone two days after the girl and child disappeared. It said he did not come to the police station until three weeks later. This led detectives to believe that Mark may have been involved in their disappearance. Even though 24 years had passed since then, the police tried to find any witnesses who lived near Mark and Charlotte's home. Of course, most of the residents had already changed, but the detectives were lucky enough to find one senior citizen who had lived there back then. He remembered Mark and Charlotte and told the detectives an interesting fact. 
According to the pensioner, the couple often quarreled, and he heard them shouting. The detectives then decided that the case was getting close to a solution, and Mark was indeed guilty. He was called in for questioning and told about the witness who had heard his regular arguments with Charlotte. Mark did not deny that there had indeed been verbal altercations between them. He also asked to see a married couple who would never fight. Detectives tried with all their might to prove his guilt and offered Mark to voluntarily undergo an interrogation with a polygraph. The results were ambiguous. The specialist who read the testimony could not give a clear answer whether the man was guilty or not. A polygraph is inherently an overrated instrument. It is not physically capable of showing whether a suspect is lying or not. Dozens of factors can affect its results, which can be mistaken for the truth and vice versa. If an innocent person is very nervous during an interrogation or withholds completely different information that is relevant to the questions, the polygraph can make him out to be a liar. In Mark's case, the polygraph was of no use either. But the detectives decided to approach it from a different angle. They obtained a warrant to examine the house where Charlotte and Mark lived in 1977. What interested them the most was the terrace built shortly after the girl and child went missing. They speculated that Charlotte might not have gone anywhere that day, but might have been hurt by her husband in another quarrel and ended up in the ground under the terrace. It is not clear how the police imagined the events of that day and how an infant fits into the story, but they had no other versions. Forensics dug through the backyard and examined the terrace, but they were unable to find any trace of anyone's remains there. It is not known if they compensated the new owners of the house for the two days of digging in the backyard. The detectives admitted they had nothing else to work with and set the case aside again. As a last resort, they took DNA samples from Jennifer and Mark, hoping it would someday help. The case went into a long, drawer again for a full 10 years. But after that time came the grand finale to this whole tangled story. Steve Carter, 35, of Philadelphia, had wondered about his past from an early age. He grew up in an orphanage, and at the age of four, he was adopted by a wealthy New Jersey couple. The U.S. Army officer and his wife loved the baby and cared for him as their own. Steve also loved his foster parents, but he always wondered how he ended up in the orphanage. In 2011, he stumbled upon an internet article that told the amazing story of Caroline White, who had been kidnapped from the hospital when she was just 19 days old. Decades later, Caroline was browsing missing children's websites and found her childhood photo there. She realized with horror that it was her current parents who had kidnapped her from the hospital. Steve Carter was inspired by the story and began researching the same sites. He entered his birth information on his certificate and was immediately speechless. The first result showed an adult photo of him taken by artists based on a baby picture. The resemblance was so strong that Carter could not even move in shock. He realized he was the same Max Barnes who had gone missing in Hawaii with his birth mother. After recovering from his shock, Steve made the decision to take a DNA test. Taking the opportunity through a missing child search service, their database contained DNA samples of Mark and Jennifer taken by the police 10 years earlier. After eight months of waiting, the test showed an exact match. Steve Carter turned out to be Mark's Barnes. Police instantly reopened the investigation. The missing infant found himself 34 years later, but the circumstances of his disappearance were still a mystery, but not for long. His birth certificate helped solve the mystery. First, the certificate was not issued until a year after the birth of the child. Second, his name was Tenzin Amia, and his mother's name was Jane Amia. That's what helped the police connect the two key strands because that name had already appeared in the reports not long after Charlotte and the child disappeared. The police received a strange call shortly after. A woman reported that a girl with an infant baby had knocked on her door and asked for milk to feed her. The police arrived on the scene believing that the girl was in an inadequate state. She was taken to a psychiatric clinic for evaluation and the infant was handed over to the guardianship authorities. This girl was Charlotte. After a few days in the hospital, she secretly escaped and was never seen again. The child remained in the care of the state because he did not even have a birth certificate, and it was impossible to identify his relatives. When the truth came out, everyone had a legitimate question. Why did the police not compare the disappearance of the girl and the baby to another situation, especially when the infant was left in the care of the state? Couldn't they have realized that they had the very same child in front of them? Now, 34 years later, it's hard to answer that question. 
Perhaps the police simply didn't know about the disappearance because the two cases were handled by two different precincts. Steve, who by then was working in a prestigious job and had a family of his own, decided to make contact with his half-sister and biological father. They were shocked when the man revealed his own disappearance. No one believed anymore that the infant might still be alive. Although we don't know what happened to Charlotte, the ending of this story can definitely be considered happy. Statistics tell us that the chances of finding missing children after so many years are zero, but the case of Marks Barnes was one of the rare exceptions. He grew up in a wonderful family, received a good upbringing, and became a successful man. Most likely, Charlotte was indeed suffering from a serious mental disorder. She knocked on the door of a stranger asking for milk to feed her son. Perhaps the call to the police saved the infant's life. Who knows how Charlotte's mental state would have changed in the future? It is still unknown what happened to her, and it is unlikely that the mystery will ever be solved. Considering that she never tried to contact her husband or find her son, the woman could have died a short time after escaping from the asylum. Perhaps a 16-year-old girl, Fawn Cox, lived with her parents and younger sisters in a small two-story house situated in a rough residential neighborhood. Despite their limited means, Fawn helped take care of her siblings, attended church regularly, and enjoyed swimming. At 16, she took on a part-time job at a local amusement park during her summer vacations in 1989. Welcome in a to Z Crime Stories. Before we start don't forget like video and subscribe for more. On July 26, after finishing her shift at around 10 p.m., Fawn's mother and younger sister picked her up by car since public transportation would have been time-consuming. Upon returning home, Fawn went straight to bed, as she had to work the following morning, sleeping alone on the second floor. Her sister Amber was babysitting for a neighbor, while Felicia chose to sleep on the cooler first floor where the only functioning air conditioner was located. The next morning, at around 9 o'clock, the family was awakened by the alarm clock in Fawn's room, which she failed to turn off. Concerned, her mother and younger sister went to her room, where they were met with a horrifying scene. Fawn lay lifeless on her bed, her neck visibly bruised, devoid of pulse. Despite calling for an ambulance, Fawn had already passed away several hours earlier. Medical experts determined that she had been strangled and also subjected to abuse prior to her death. The police faced a challenging investigation. Despite the murder occurring in a small house with poor soundproofing, Fawn's parents and sister heard nothing due to the loud air conditioner on the first floor. The only unusual occurrence was noticed by Fawn's sister, their anxious, barking poodle. However, they attributed the dog's behavior to pregnancy, unaware of its significance. Upon examining the crime scene, the police made several important discoveries. They theorized that the attacker or group entered the house through a second-story window overlooking the backyard. A nearby park trailer facilitated access to the window, which had been left open due to the lack of air conditioning on the second floor. In Fawn's room, investigators found crucial clues, short hairs, small blood stains, and traces of semen on her bedsheet, all sent for laboratory analysis. Several items were also missing from the house, while others were found discarded on the ground outside. Further inspection revealed that items had been taken from a closet in an adjoining room on the second floor. It appeared that the perpetrator had been hiding in the closet, waiting for the household to sleep. However, since Fawn's sister didn't sleep in that room that night, the missing items went unnoticed. Another peculiar clue emerged, an old army cap found in Fawn's room, which her relatives claimed to have never seen her wear. Detectives believed that the killer may have left the cap behind accidentally. Despite the substantial evidence, the police struggled to identify suspects quickly. In 1989, DNA forensics were underdeveloped, and genetic databases were not commonly available. Detective Benjamin Caldwell, in charge of the case, proposed the theory that multiple assailants, familiar with the house, were involved. They not only knew how to access the second floor through the backyard but were also acquainted with the room layout. The next step for the police was to seek witnesses. They interviewed neighbors, friends, and relatives of Fawn but obtained inconclusive information. Complicating matters was the impoverished neighborhood, home to various criminal gangs, making it challenging to bring potential perpetrators to justice. Before we continue don't forget like video and subscribe. One month after Fawn's murder, the case finally gained momentum. The police obtained a witness who provided crucial information that had not been made public, lending credibility to their account. This witness led the police to three teenage suspects, one of whom was in the same class as Fawn. 
The boys were arrested and questioned, but they vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. During a search of one of the suspect's homes, stolen items from Fawn's room were discovered. This evidence was sufficient to charge all three teenagers with murder. However, the detectives faced disappointment yet again. Firstly, the witness suddenly recanted their statement and ceased cooperating with the investigation. Secondly, DNA analysis conducted on blood, hair, and semen found at the crime scene did not definitively match the samples collected from the suspects. In those years, the technology for precise matching was not available, yielding inconclusive results. Nevertheless, one of the detainees provided valuable information during an interrogation. He confessed to breaking into Fawn's house that night with the company of other boys and stealing items. He described how he accessed the second floor through the canopy and revealed previously unknown details. According to his account, when he threw a tape recorder out of the window, the handle detached and fell. He hid it under a nearby bush, and the police indeed found the item in that exact location. However, the young man quickly recanted his confession and stopped cooperating with the investigation rendering it inadmissible in court. Consequently, the police had to release the suspects, and the investigation came to a halt once again. It is likely that the witnesses were intimidated, and without their testimony, the case had minimal prospects. One of the suspects did serve eight months in jail for stealing items from Fawn's house. The case remained dormant until the early 2000 seconds when the police reopened the investigation. The first step was uploading DNA samples from the crime scene to the CODIS database, which had been established several years earlier and contained DNA profiles of individuals involved in serious crimes. Unfortunately, no matches were found for the killer. The creation of this database was a result of significant scientific advancements in DNA analysis and allowed the police to reanalyze DNA samples from the original suspects using more advanced techniques. This time, experts conclusively determined that the hair, semen, and blood did not belong to any of the three individuals. This discrepancy was perplexing considering the suspects were found in possession of Fawn's belongings. Detectives speculated that the three boys had indeed burglarized her house that night but had an accomplice who perpetrated the abuse and murder. This raised further questions. Could it be that four criminals entered the house undetected, killed Fawn, and left without a trace? The police had no answers to this question and the case once again reached a standstill. As the years passed, the hope of solving Fawn's murder dwindled for her family. They remained convinced that the three initial suspects had been present in their house that night and might hold information about the killer but would never disclose it. The only possibility of uncovering the truth lay in a DNA sample stored in the police lab. Before we continue don't forget like video and subscribe. The authorities, their lack of resources and the sheer number of unsolved cases posed significant challenges. In 2018, an intriguing development occurred. Fawn's younger sister, Amber, disclosed previously unknown details about the crime on a well-known American forum dedicated to unsolved crimes. The forum had gained a reputation for reliability over its two decades of existence, and its participants had assisted the police in solving several high-profile cases. Amber's identity was verified, adding credibility to her post. She revealed that she worked as a nanny during the week and only stayed at home on weekends, sleeping in the same room on the second floor through which the burglars had entered. If criminals had indeed broken in, they would have been immediately noticed. Additionally, they would have needed to surveil the house and wait for Fawn's mother and younger sister to arrive to pick her up from work. Despite Amber's revelation, the case remained unsolved. However, it was now 2018, and advancements in DNA research had come a long way. New analysis tools were leading to the resolution of numerous long-forgotten cases. Fawn's relatives, aware of these advancements, questioned why the police were not reopening the murder investigation. They persisted in their conversations with the detectives, only to receive the same response each time. That extended DNA testing required funding and the police had numerous cases to prioritize. Thus, the relatives had to wait for their turn and for funding to become available. Taking matters into their own hands, the family launched a fundraiser in 2019. They aimed to cover the full cost of DNA samples and offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the perpetrators. The case received extensive media coverage, and through interviews and appeals, many caring individuals responded to the family's requests for assistance. The necessary funds were quickly raised. However, their hopes were dashed once again when the police department refused to initiate the investigation using the funds provided by the victim's relatives. The lead detective explained the challenges that would arise from such a situation. 
if the relatives of one victim could pay for tests and expedite the results, hundreds of other families who had been searching for years for the murderers of their loved ones would also expect the same right. Implementing such a system in practice would be impossible, as only a few laboratories worldwide conducted innovative DNA tests. With a simultaneous influx of requests, their resources would be insufficient. Paraben Nano Labs, a leading company in the field, had made significant advancements in DNA analysis, including identifying a person's relatives from minimal genetic samples and creating an approximate portrait of the DNA's owner. The family believed that this lab should take over the study of the samples from Fawn's bedroom on the night of her murder. Fawn's relatives suspected that the police were not actively pursuing the case due to their impoverished background and the neighborhood they lived in. Murder investigations were not prioritized for families like theirs. In an interview, Fawn's sister expressed her belief that if the murder had involved a wealthy or influential family, the investigations would have been conducted promptly. Unfortunately, the process could not be expedited, and it wasn't until late 2020 that a significant breakthrough occurred. However, the family was unprepared for the shocking truth that followed. With funding from the FBI, the police sent the samples from Fawn's room to a lab for detailed DNA analysis and a search for potential relatives of the DNA's owner. The semen sample found at the murder scene was primarily examined. In November 2020, they finally identified the individual to whom the DNA belonged, Fawn's cousin, Donald Cox. The revelation shook the entire family. At the time of Fawn's death, Donald was 21 years old, and his possible involvement had never been considered. Donald had a troubled history and had been frequently incarcerated for misdemeanors such as theft and drug possession. However, during those years, DNA samples were not collected from such criminals, which delayed the resolution of the case. Donald died of an overdose in 2006, and his death was investigated due to suspicious circumstances. A DNA sample was preserved during that investigation but was not entered into the FBI database since he was a victim not a perpetrator. Once the experts informed the police about this discovery, they matched the sample with the semen found at the murder scene, resulting in a 100% match. Despite the significance of this revelation, the police closed the case and did not file new charges against the three original suspects. Fawn's sister believed that there was no point in trying to obtain a confession from them. While the suspects had been present in the house that night, they may not have witnessed the actual murder. It was possible that Donald had been alone in the house and subsequently attacked Fawn. Felicia, another sister of Fawn, added that the three suspects had already faced consequences for their actions. Throughout the unsolved case, the entire neighborhood was convinced of their guilt, leading to negative treatment and consequences for them. Furthermore, after the case was closed, it was revealed that the police initially learned about the suspects from the family of one of them. The family members noticed a Nintendo console among his belongings and remembered that it had been stolen from Fawn's house. This information became public knowledge through news reports, and everyone in the neighborhood was aware of the details. In any case, proving the guilt of the three original suspects was impossible. The relatives of the victim finally knew the name of the killer, but he lived for 17 years without facing any punishment for his crime. During that time, he continued to have contact with his family, but his addiction to illegal substances ultimately led to his demise, rendering him no longer a threat to anyone. Like the video if they found it appealing and subscribe and channel. A 15-year-old girl disappeared from her bedroom under mysterious circumstances. Police, the FBI, and hundreds of volunteers searched for her, diving into the case. Detectives uncovered many eerie facts and eventually solved this disturbing case. In this video, we tell you what happened to Riley Grossman and why the public was outraged when they learned the bitter truth. Don't right, forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Riley Crossman was born on December 22, 2003, in the small American town of Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her parents divorced when she was young, and the girl moved with her mother and younger sister to Berkeley Springs, a town 40 kilometers from Martinsburg. After a while, her mother began dating another man, and they had two more children. However, Riley maintained a close relationship with her father and regularly went to visit him. The girl attended Berkeley Springs High School and took dance and singing lessons. She also had a boyfriend named Hayden Lacey. According to her parents, there was a great relationship between them. Riley was happy, and she and her boyfriend even had a joint Instagram account where they posted pictures together. Her mom, Chantel Oakley, worked two jobs. On May 7, 2019, she took off early from her morning shift because she wasn't feeling well. When she arrived home, she texted Riley that she was going to sleep in before her evening shift and asked her to wake her up when the girl returned from school. Riley came home at about 3.30pm, woke up her mother, and went to her room. 
Chantel's roommate's mother was also in the house with her that day, effectively replacing her grandmother and looking after the younger children. Chantel returned from work at about 10 p.m. As she walked past her daughter's room, she saw that her door was closed but the light was on behind it. Her mother thought Riley was getting ready for bed and went to bed herself. Almost immediately, she was still not feeling well and wanted to get a good night's sleep before her morning shift the next day. At about 7.15 a.m., Chantel peeked into her daughter's room before she left for work, but Riley wasn't there. She didn't see anything suspicious about that, though. School started at 7.45, and the girl could have gone there already. Riley's school was only a short walk away, so she got there on her own. About halfway through the day, her mother got a call from the school saying that Riley had missed some classes. This alarmed Chantel slightly, but she still didn't see it as a major concern. Her daughter could have just skipped a few classes and gone out with friends. At about 3.30 p.m., Riley's grandmother began to worry. The girl should have been home by now but still wasn't. Then she contacted Chantel, at which point her mother already suspected something was wrong. Riley was always calling or texting her to take time off to go out with friends after school. But that day she didn't get a single message from her daughter. Her mother had sent her several messages, and they had all failed to reach their destination. Then she tried calling her, but each time it went to voicemail. This indicated that Riley's phone was either dead or had been turned off for some reason. Chantel also called Riley's own father, hoping that the girl might have gone to him. However, he too did not contact his daughter that day. The mother asked her grandmother to go to the school and look for Riley there. The grandmother went there, but she was unable to locate the girl. None of the teachers knew where she could be either. Around 5 p.m., Chantel decided to take a day off from work and drove to the school, but she couldn't find her daughter either. She spotted her boyfriend in the parking lot and asked if he had seen Riley, but Hayden stated that he had spent the day on an out-of-town trip and had not even contacted her. Together, they went around the school grounds, looking in and around the building itself, but the girl was nowhere to be found. After a while, her mother decided to go home, hoping that Riley might have returned there. Alas, she was not there either. After waiting some more time, she decided to go to the police. By then, the girl's father had arrived in Berkeley Springs and went in search of his daughter. He drove around the small town asking people he met if they had seen Riley. With a population of just over 600, most of the residents knew each other. One of the local teenagers said he saw her walking down the street, but unfortunately, this information did nothing to help him find Riley and investigators thought the boy was just mistaken. The police quickly began a search, interviewing everyone the girl knew. None of her friends had seen Riley that day, nor had she shown up at school. At the same time, several teachers noted that she was present in their classes. This misled the detectives at first, but it soon became clear these teachers had simply failed to notice the girl's absence and flagged her down. From conversations with Riley's acquaintances, the police began to reconstruct the chronology of events. They found out that on the evening of May 7th, the girl was on the phone with her boyfriend until 10.30 p.m., and she answered her friend's messages on social media until midnight. What follows is something very strange. At 5.40 a.m., Riley called her boyfriend by video link, but he was asleep at the time and didn't answer. The detectives immediately suspected something was wrong. Why was Riley trying to contact him at such an early hour? The girl's mother assured her that Riley would never run away from home. She simply had no reason to, given that she was the eldest child in the family. Her mother treated her very gently, almost never forbade her to go out with friends or a boyfriend, allowed her to go to her father's house in another town at any time, and generally did not control her every move. The only thing was that Riley always informed her of her plans and asked permission. Considering that, the girl was only 15 years old at the time of her disappearance. She had no driver's license, so leaving town on her own in a car was not possible. This indicated that the theory of an escape seemed unlikely. Instead, the detectives considered kidnapping as the most likely theory. The same evening, Riley's mother contacted law enforcement, and they began a search for the girl. Police officers searched the school, surrounding area, and combed the town. Community volunteers who cared about Riley joined the search. Small town residents, thinking something like this could never happen to them, were shocked. Soon, the police decided to search Riley's bedroom. There, they found the first grisly piece of evidence, a pillow and sheets with small blood stains. They sent the items to a lab for DNA testing, which confirmed that the blood belonged to Riley. It became evident that something terrible had happened to the girl. After the discovery of the blood, it became clear that Riley had not gone somewhere on her own initiative. It was up to the police to figure out what had occurred. The fact that her mother had not noticed traces of blood earlier was explained by the bed being made, and she didn't think to lift the blanket. The blood trail indicated that the girl had likely been attacked in her house. The police needed to identify the perpetrator. The search escalated, with more volunteers and equipment being provided. Press conferences were held to spread the story to the public in the hopes that someone might have noticed or heard something useful. 
the local police were joined by the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and state police. Together, they continued the search, but with no results. Eventually, on May 15, law enforcement decided to bring in additional forces for a large-scale search. The next morning, they announced that Riley Crossman's body had been found about a 40-minute drive from Berkeley Springs, near a country road on a small mountain. It was clear that it was a murder, not an accident, as the body had been hidden away. Medical examiners couldn't determine the cause of death due to extensive decomposition, despite it only being just over a week since Riley's disappearance. Several other strange things were noticed, such as the girl wearing only one shoe and different clothing than what she was supposed to be wearing. Traces of whitewash or plaster were also found on her clothes. The case was reclassified as a homicide and the police had to find the perpetrator. During re-interviews of Riley's relatives and acquaintances, discrepancies arose in the testimony of Andy McCauley, Chantel's roommate. Andy initially claimed he didn't leave work on Riley's birthday, but a neighbor saw a different car parked in front of their house. Andy's driver's license had been revoked, making it suspicious. The neighbor shared this observation with the police, leading to further questioning. Detectives determined that the vehicle belonged to one of Andy's co-workers, who often picked him up for work. Andy changed his statement multiple times, initially denying involvement, then admitting to using the pickup truck to buy illegal substances. More strange discoveries awaited the detectives. Riley's mother was asked about any oddities in her roommate's behavior. She recalled something unusual, which she shared with the police. On May 8th, the day her daughter disappeared, Andy had indeed been acting suspiciously when he returned home that night. Chantel told him about Riley's disappearance. The man immediately said he would go looking for her, got on his bicycle, and rode off. However, when the woman returned home from her search, she found Andy asleep on the couch as if nothing had happened. This behavior was very strange. All of Riley's relatives had been combing the streets until late at night, helped by concerned townspeople, while Andy simply went to sleep as if nothing had happened. In addition, one day after the girl went missing, Chantel called Andy and recorded the conversation. Unfortunately, its full content was not disclosed. All we know is that Chantel was already suspicious of Andy at this point and linked it all to his addiction to illegal substances. The police then spoke to Andy's co-worker and found out that, in fact, the man had been absent from work from about 9 a.m. until about 2 p.m. The co-worker also stated that he believed Andy had banned substances with him to begin with, so there was no reason for him to go somewhere to get them. The detectives then searched for the green Dodge and found a large stain of dried plaster in the trunk. Forensics showed that it was the same substance found on Riley's clothing. Investigators also led service dogs to the pickup, which detected a deadly smell in the trunk. Two of the exact same bolts were found near Riley's body. The police soon found another inconsistency in Andy's statement. They examined camera footage from nearby communities and found that on May 8, the man was only a few miles from where Riley's body would later be found. He was caught on gas station store cameras and on several traffic cameras. It was all very strange. Andy didn't have a driver's license, was usually picked up by other people, and got around on his bike. But this day, for some reason, he took someone else's car and drove around for half a day on unfamiliar routes. Another co-worker told the police that on May 8th, Andy asked him for three construction bags. Detectives were also approached by Angie's former co-worker who told an even creepier story. He said that he and Andy had never gotten along, but between about 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on May 8th, Andy called him dozens of times and also sent a whole bunch of messages. He was in a panic and said he needed to hide with someone right away. Andy explained that he was in possession of illegal substances and was afraid of being caught. This former colleague did not let him in that night but later reported the story to the police. In his defense, the man stated that he had taken illegal substances at night after which he noticed a police car parked not far from his house and panicked. However, the police department checked this information and found that none of their cars were in that area. This meant that Andy's story was a common lie. All of the above was enough for the police to arrest Andy the day after the body was found and charge him with murder. The man denied guilt, so the case went to trial. The case then stalled for more than two years as the trial did not begin until September 27, 2021. This was due to the coronavirus and the limitations associated with it, as well as the peculiarities of the US court system where such delays are the norm. Nevertheless, even more gruesome details of the case emerged during the course of the trial. For starters, Chantel, in her speech, provided one disturbing detail about the evening of May 7. That afternoon, she returned from work at 10 p.m. and Andy was asleep on the couch. When she entered the room, the man immediately woke up. When she saw his eyes, Chantel immediately thought he had taken illegal substances. Andy had used powerful drugs before and even had a criminal record for possession, of which the woman was well aware. Further, the prosecution revealed information about disturbing messages sent from Riley's phone shortly before her disappearance. At 11 p.m. on May 7, the girl texted her boyfriend that Andy had just gone into her room. 
12 minutes later, she sent another text where she wrote that she was scared. She never contacted him again. Unfortunately, Hayden had already gone to bed at that time and did not see these messages. By morning, they had already been deleted. At trial, he also said that Andy had repeatedly entered Riley's room that night. The girl was video chatting with her boyfriend, and Hayden could hear him enter the room. Andy asked her to do the dishes and talked about some other mundane things, but Riley was unequivocally afraid of him. She asked the guy not to pass out while Andy was in her room. It also came out at trial that Andy had called Riley several times around 3 a.m., but she wouldn't pick up the phone, and on the third time, she blocked his number altogether. The whole thing was very creepy and incomprehensible. According to the prosecution's version, Andy made these calls to see if Riley was communicating with her boyfriend at the time. Later, the records of these calls were deleted from both phones, but the cell phone provider still had them. Despite all this, the prosecution had no evidence to indicate what had happened that night. They speculated that Andy killed Riley late that night, waited until morning, and drove to work. He then borrowed a co-worker's car, drove to the house, picked up the body, and took it to a secluded spot. He then cleared the message and call history from her phone and got rid of it. It also emerged at trial that Chantel and Andy's own mother not only knew about his addiction to illegal substances, but they also knew that under their influence, the man was becoming aggressive and dangerous. The final court hearing was held on October 5, 2021. Despite the fact that all available evidence was circumstantial and did not directly connect Andy to the murder, the jury reached a guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Further consideration was given to the possibility of parole. Andy's attorneys asked to give their client the option after 15 years, but the judge ultimately ruled for life without the possibility of parole. As the judge pronounced the sentence, Andy showed no emotion. He also seemed detached and uninterested at previous hearings. Apparently, he had resigned himself to the inevitable. But what about motive? Because of the degree of decomposition, the experts could not establish whether Riley had been abused. However, this is the most obvious option, even though the court could not prove it. This story was widely covered in the American media, and people's opinions were divided. Some put part of the blame on the girl's mother, who brought a convicted drug addict into her home and built a family with him. At the trial, she assured them that it had never even occurred to her that Andy might harm her children. Others defended the mother, believing that she could not have foreseen such an outcome. She worked two jobs most of the time to feed her family, and perhaps she didn't even have time to think about how her decisions might affect her children. What remains unclear is the moment of that 5.30 a.m. video call made from Riley Hayden's phone. Was the girl still alive at that moment, or did Andy make the call to throw off the investigation later? Do you think Chantel should be blamed for the situation? Tell us what you think and don't forget to like this video take care and thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video take care and thanks for watching. This mysterious story took place in early 2020. A 16-year-old girl disappeared under strange circumstances, but unraveling the case only made it more confusing. Even though the police have completed their investigation, the case is still one of the most mysterious in recent years. In this video, we will tell you about the gruesome story of Selena Shelley Fay and try to answer the big question, did the police really resolve the case, or did they cover up what really happened to her? Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. A Native American, Serena Shelley Fay, was born on June 18, 2003, on the Indian Reservation of Bighorn County, Montana, in a town called Harding. People she knew described her as a kind, cheerful, and very active girl. She loved to play basketball, had many friends, but her main hobby was horseback riding. Selena seriously considered opening her own farm when she graduated from high school, as well as participating in races at the professional level. Even with all the tragedy her family had endured, she kept a positive attitude. Originally a family of five children, Selena's 11-year-old twin sister committed suicide in 2014, leaving no hint as to what prompted her to complete such a tragic move. In 2017, Selena's brother was killed by a police officer, and that same year, Selena's older sister was killed under the wheels of a car. She was walking along the road when an unknown driver hit her and fled the scene. That left only two of the five children. It's hard to believe how much pain and suffering one family can endure. Alas, the tragedies in their lives did not end there. Selena spent New Year's Eve 2020 with friends. They went to a party at a country house where they stayed until the next day. On January 1st, Selena and five of her friends, which included four young men and one girl, drove back to Harding by car. Then, the story gets weird, to say the least. Nevertheless, this is the official data from the case file, and we will read it first. The car malfunctioned on its way into town. The driver parked it at a nearby stop and tried to fix the car. He managed to fix the problem temporarily, 
but he stated that the car could break down again at any time. For this reason, he asked Selena and her friend Orlando to wait at the stop until his mother drove up there to pick them up. Since she was just under 15 minutes away from the stop by car, the story sounds highly questionable. Why did the girl's friends decide to drive on, leaving them at a bus stop in the middle of nowhere? But that is exactly the way things were, according to the driver. There was also a version that after fixing the car, the driver had to leave immediately, otherwise, the car risked stalling again. And Selena and her friend at the time had gone too far, and the guys decided to leave without them, sending the mother of one of them after them. But this version is not reflected in the police documents but only cited by the local media. What follows is actually confirmed information. The driver's mother had indeed come to the bus stop to pick up the girls, but they were no longer there. Thinking they might have been walking around somewhere nearby, the woman began to look for them. At one point, she did come across Orlando, who was sitting in a ditch looking lost. Her shoes were missing, and all her feet were covered in scratches. Selena was nowhere near her. The shocked woman tried to ask Orlando what had happened, but she said she had absolutely no memory of how she got there and didn't even know where she was. Then, the woman contacted Selena's parents and told them she was missing, and they immediately contacted the police. The first thing the police did was talk to Orlando. She still couldn't remember the details of what had happened. She only told the detectives that she had seen Selena just walk off in the direction of the road into a field, and her friend never saw her again. Upon hearing this story, Selena's parents couldn't understand why their daughter would go off in some unknown direction for no apparent reason. The problem was that it was freezing outside, and the girl was clearly not dressed for the weather. She was wearing a light jacket, sweater, and jeans. I think you've already realized how strange this whole story is, but that was just the beginning. On the same day, police organized a large-scale search within a radius of about 6 kilometers of the place where the girl was last seen. Hundreds of people, including service dogs, mounted police, helicopters, ATVs, and even drones with heat sensors, were involved. The FBI also became involved very quickly. The case may have taken on such proportions because of a sad statistic, Native Americans in Montana go missing far more often than other segments of the population. Most of the time, police are as reluctant as possible to investigate these cases and sometimes refuse to do so at all. Locals regularly come out in protests and try to reach out to the federal government, but Native Americans continue to go missing. In addition, Selena's relatives immediately turn to news outlets for help in making the story public and speeding up police work. News of Selena's disappearance quickly spread throughout the city, and hundreds of volunteers joined the search for her. Most were also Native Americans, including students from her school. Adults helped scour the area, and teenagers posted flyers and distributed information about their classmates' disappearance throughout the city. But the search yielded no results. Of course, police examined the car in which Selena and her friends drove home and also questioned all her friends who had been with her that day. And here are things that are just as strange, investigators have not released any information related to this. The friends may not have told them anything useful, but the public was waiting for at least some details. Then, the police decided to pursue another theory, what if Selena had been kidnapped from that bus stop? This theory ran counter to the story of a friend who claimed Selena had gone into the field, but the kidnapping theory received some support as well. A witness reported seeing a green car with Wyoming plates near the bus stop. As the days went by, the search yielded no results, so most people began to consider the kidnapping version as the main one. Reports poured into the police that people had seen the girl in various places, but all these leads proved useless. The police also tried to track the location of the girl's smartphone, but they were unsuccessful. It was turned off. The investigation continued in such ignorance until January 20th. On that day, three weeks after Selena's disappearance, the most mysterious event in the whole story happened, the girl's body was finally found. It was found just a mile from that very bus stop. The body was discovered by the Bighorn County Sheriff, who went by the Indian name Big Hair. Let's refresh your memory on key points, hundreds of volunteers on foot, dozens of horseback riders, service dogs, a helicopter, drones with heat sensors, and a search radius of about 6 kilometers. For all that, the body is found within a kilometer of the bus stop. At this point, everyone had one question, how could they not notice? Of particular note is the fact that the place where Selena was found is practically a bare field. The Bighorn County Sheriff's Office said the preliminary version is that death was due to natural causes. On February 28, more than a month after the body was found, the results of the medical examination came back. The report, signed by four doctors, cited hypothermia as the cause of death. All of this raised even more questions and distrust on the part of the public. Not only were search parties unable to locate Selena in an open field for 20 days, but she also allegedly died of hypothermia a kilometer from the road. Let's take a look at what the temperature was that day. According to a local news site that publishes daily weather information, it was about 8 degrees outside in the afternoon. 
January 1st, Selena was wearing a light jacket and sweater, although it was not enough for a long and comfortable stay outside. Is it possible for a healthy 16-year-old girl to freeze to death? After all, there was a highway just a kilometer away from her where cars passed by regularly, and she could call for help. How should events have developed so that the girl deliberately waited to die in one place and managed to freeze to death at 8 degrees Celsius? Of course, all these questions fell on the police. Investigators said that drones and a helicopter were obstructed by poor visibility that day due to heavy fog, and that foot and other units simply did not notice Selena, even though they were passing within a few hundred meters of her. As for the dogs, they were service dogs but not search dogs. In addition, they were kept on a leash because many strangers were involved in the search, and the police were afraid to let the dogs go so that they would not attack those present. To Selena's family, as well as the entire Native American community, these excuses seemed utterly unconvincing, and they demanded a thorough investigation into her murder. To them, it looked as if the girl's body had been placed there after the first wave of the search ended. But there was one big problem here, the Bighorn County Sheriff who led the police in this case and personally discovered Selena's body had a very murky history behind him. In 1995, when he was still a simple officer, a Native American woman accused him of violence, but the man denied the charges and was not convicted. Two years later, his service weapon was used in a murder and the would-be sheriff was put on trial again. There, he claimed his weapon had been stolen and had nothing to do with the case. All charges were dropped again, but here's the strange thing, he paid the victim's family a portion of the amount they demanded in the lawsuit. Later, he went to court again for assault and battery, but here too, he received no serious punishment. Not surprisingly, the community was slow to take this man at his word. Despite the FBI's involvement in the case, relatives and acquaintances of Selena began to suspect that the sheriff himself might have something to do with the murder of the girl and the further cover-up of this fact. But here, another question arises, even if we imagine that the sheriff grabbed Selena that day and took her to an undisclosed location, what next? The four medical examiners signed a report that clearly stated there were no marks on the girl's body indicating a violent death. They could only confirm death from hypothermia. Given the FBI's involvement, could the sheriff have gotten the four doctors to cover something up? Or could he have kept Selena outside until she actually died of hypothermia? It sounds doubtful. There is another version of what happened. The teens were drinking on New Year's Eve, as the initial toxicology report indicates, but no one knows what they did the next day. They may have continued drinking or taken some kind of illegal substance. As for alcohol, it is unlikely to be relevant. A person would need to drink a lot to just go into a field, lie on the ground, and stay there long enough to die of hypothermia. Even taking into account the fact that Selena was only 16 years old, this theory is somehow not believable. But the version about banned substances could explain a lot. First, let's remember Selena's friend who was sitting in a ditch with no shoes and scratched feet. Then, let's remember the extremely strange story about the broken down car and the unclear reasons why the boys left the girls at a deserted bus stop. Perhaps the teens did take something, but it was too much for the bodies of the two girls. The boys could have gotten scared and just left them at the bus stop, but this theory is greatly undermined by the fact that the driver did call his mother who came to pick up the girls just 15 minutes later. Would he have done so if the girls were in an inadequate condition? Most likely, teenagers would not have involved their parents in such a situation. But there are a few odd things about their company. First, Selena's friend posted several short videos on Snapchat from that trip. One of the moments shows someone standing in front of the open hood of the car, trying to fix something. At the same time, near the back passenger seat, two guys are arguing aggressively about something. What was going on there is still unknown. All the people who were with Selena that day are silent. What's more, two of them have moved to other states, and Orlando has deleted her Facebook page. It's all very strange. It's been over a year, and none of them have responded to the questions that are still troubling the local Native American community and other concerned people. Nor have the police made any comment about the other teenagers. There is a persistent impression that something is being carefully hidden in this story. As a result, we have a closed case where the official version seems too dubious because, according to it, Selena just went into the field, walked for a few hours, and then just lay on the ground. After all, the police were already on the scene a few hours later, and if she had continued to walk around, she would definitely have been spotted. Furthermore, she could not be found by hundreds of people with modern technology, and 20 days later, her body appeared a kilometer down the road. It looked as if she had been placed there after the active phase of the search was over, although the police assure us that there were no tire tracks or other evidence that the body might have been moved near this spot. One can't trust the police in this case, given the history of the sheriff. One seriously doubts that the police investigation can be considered objective. However, the FBI was involved in the case, and they certainly wouldn't cover up some provincial sheriff. 
As we can see, each version faces its own contradictions. Now, one and a half years later, the girl's family is still trying to find answers. Out of five children, they have only one son left. They are asking to spread the story about their daughter so they can have a chance at a new, honest investigation. What do you think happened to Selena after all? Share your opinion in the comments and support the video with a if you liked it. Thanks for watching and thank you for. An 11 year old girl vanished from school, leaving no trace, and remained missing for years, making it an eerie and bewildering case in California. With numerous unexpected turns and peculiar facts, this perplexing investigation held the attention of millions worldwide. After 45 years, the truth was finally unearthed, but the story didn't conclude there. In this video, we'll delve into Linda O'Keefe's journey and explore why this inquiry captivated countless individuals globally. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe. Linda O'Keefe born on May 24, 1962, in Newport Beach, California, USA. Linda O'Keefe grew up in a tight-knit family. Her father worked as a machinist, while her mother was a seamstress. Linda had two sisters, an older and a younger one. Fond of drawing, playing the piano, and cherishing nature and animals, Linda embraced life with enthusiasm. Whenever warm summer days arrived, she seized the opportunity to visit the beach, a mere 800 meters from her home. Additionally, she actively participated in the Girl Scouts and attended summer school. In July 1973, Linda, then 11 years old, attended school nearly every day. Typically, she rode her bicycle to school. However, on the morning of July 6, her piano teacher, residing a few houses away from the O'Keefe family, kindly offered to give her a ride home after classes ended around 1.30 p.m. In need of her bicycle that day, Linda used the school phone to call her mother and requested a pickup. Unfortunately, her mother was preoccupied with work and preferred not to be interrupted, advising Linda to walk instead. Despite the distance between school and home being just over two kilometers, Linda hesitated after talking to her mother. She even shed tears, prompting the school secretary to consider giving her a ride. Regrettably, the secretary needed to travel in the opposite direction, relinquishing the idea. Shortly after leaving the school premises, Linda lingered outside the building for a while before embarking on her journey homeward. The route typically required no more than half an hour, yet the girl experienced a noticeable delay. Initially, her mother dismissed it, assuming Linda had met friends and decided to take a stroll. However, as the hours passed, her concern grew exponentially. By 6 p.m., overcome by worry, Linda's mother began reaching out to acquaintances whose children lived nearby, inquiring if they had seen her daughter. Unfortunately, none of them had encountered Linda that day. When Linda's father returned from work, the family initiated a search. They scoured the neighborhood, including the path Linda would have taken from school. Initially, they presumed that the girl, resentful of her mother's refusal to pick her up, intentionally delayed her return home. However, as darkness encroached and Linda remained unfound, they decided to involve the police. Officers filed a missing person report and commenced their investigation. Simultaneously, Linda's father and older sister traversed the neighborhood in two cars, attempting to reassure residents, while her mother remained at home, contacting numerous individuals who might have caught a glimpse of Linda. The search persisted throughout the night with law enforcement scouring the streets and parks utilizing search dogs and helicopters, yet the outcome remained inconclusive. The following morning, more officers joined the search, and local newspapers reported on the extensive efforts to locate the missing 11-year-old girl. Around 10.30 a.m., a bicyclist, accompanied by a friend and their son, ventured into a park approximately 9 kilometers away from Linda's residence. They visited the park as part of the botanical circle, observing local fauna. As the father and child approached the ditches to observe frogs, they stumbled upon something unexpected. Intrigued by a light object in the grass, the man approached and discovered a partially submerged human body. Having read about the ongoing search for a missing girl in the morning newspaper, he immediately suspected that the body belonged to Linda. 
Urgently, the man and his companions hurried out of the park, heading to the nearest payphone to report their discovery. En route, they encountered a police officer who had been involved in the search for Linda. Sharing their account, they informed the officer and proceeded toward the location together. The investigators swiftly confirmed that the deceased individual was indeed Linda O'Keefe. She was attired in the same clothing she had worn to school, with her backpack lying nearby. Remarkably, the dress she wore had been handmade by her mother. However, Linda was barefoot, and her shoes were nowhere to be found near the body. Detectives meticulously examined the crime scene, discovering tire tracks in close proximity to the body but no other significant clues. The medical examiners determined that Linda had died from strangulation, estimating the time of death to be between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. It became apparent to the investigators that Linda had likely been abducted shortly after leaving school, implying that the perpetrator had held her captive for approximately 12 hours. Furthermore, the victim had endured abuse, and traces of DNA were discovered on her body, which were preserved in the laboratory as DNA analysis was not yet available during that time. With limited substantial leads, the detectives focused on locating witnesses. They interviewed Linda's friends, school staff, and residents along the route she would have taken home. Their efforts soon yielded results. One of Linda's friends had spotted something unusual while the girl was walking home. A turquoise van approached Linda, slowed down, and continued driving alongside her. Unfortunately, the friend lost sight of Linda and the van shortly after. Two additional witnesses came forward. A 19-year-old girl and her mother were driving in a car around 100 yards from Linda's school when they noticed the girl engaged in conversation with the driver of a turquoise van that had stopped beside her. This encounter occurred around 1.15 p.m. Given their proximity to the O'Keefe family and their familiarity with Linda, they found it surprising that she was conversing with an unknown adult male. Intrigued, they decided to observe the situation. The passenger door of the van remained open, and Linda stood in front of it, engaged in conversation with the driver. Eventually, she entered the vehicle. Subsequently, the van departed, and the witnesses did not pay significant attention, assuming Linda had been picked up by a relative or acquaintance, given their belief that she would not willingly enter a vehicle with a stranger. Following these accounts, Investigators obtained a rough description of the driver, a white man between the ages of 24 and 30, with curly blonde hair and an elongated face. Unfortunately, the witnesses could not recall the license plate number or make of the car. Nonetheless, this testimony provided the most substantial lead in the case, prompting investigators to issue an all-points bulletin, APB, on the suspect and his vehicle. The APB circulated throughout California but it proved futile in apprehending the perpetrator. Detectives maintained regular communication with the witnesses, hoping they would recollect additional details. Hypnosis sessions were even conducted, partially aiding their memory recall. Although the witnesses managed to provide some supplementary information about the suspect's vehicle, the details were too insignificant to lead to the killer's identification. Another witness emerged, a woman residing near the area where Linda's body was discovered. At approximately 10.30 p.m., the witness heard a woman screaming, with words like, stop hurting me, abruptly cut off. Given the proximity and timing, it was likely connected to the time of Linda's death. Detectives also received an intriguing tip. On the morning of Linda's body being found, an artist was painting in the park. Noticing the multitude of police cars, he grew curious and observed the situation. At one point, he noticed something peculiar, a young man lurking in the bushes, close to his location. Inquisitive, the artist approached the man and inquired about the commotion. The young man appeared deeply concerned and revealed that the police had discovered the girl's body. Despite being positioned far from where the body was found and unable to discern any specific details, the man's foreknowledge of the situation raised questions. The artist described him as a slim white male between 18 and 24 years old, approximately 180 centimeters tall, with blonde hair and sideburns. 
The description closely matched the accounts of the van's driver provided by the previous witnesses. Consequently, investigators deduced that this individual was the killer and had chosen to monitor the police activity that morning. Despite having a detailed description of the killer's appearance, locating him in the vast city proved challenging for the police. However, two days later, an unexpected turn of events occurred. Peter Wooden, an 18-year-old who lived near the O'Keefe family and was in the same class as Linda's older sister, came forward and confessed to the murder. The news spread rapidly, shocking the community. The police interrogated Peter for seven hours and searched his parents' home, where he resided. He was formally charged with murder. However, three days later, another surprising twist unfolded. The investigators announced that Peter had been exonerated of all charges and released. His confession contained numerous inconsistencies, with the only coincidences aligning with information already publicized in the newspapers. Moreover, he deliberately provided false testimony that contradicted the actual evidence. Furthermore, the two witnesses who had seen Linda with the van driver unequivocally stated that Peter was not the individual they encountered. Their familiarity with Peter, as he lived nearby, made it clear that he was not the same person. Consequently, the police concluded that Peter had fabricated the confession as an attempt to draw attention to himself. While it was possible that he may have had mental health issues, he had no connection to the murder. Following this turn of events, the detectives were left without any solid leads. The search for the van and its driver continued throughout the town, with the entire community, including Linda's classmates, actively participating despite objections from the police. However, these efforts yielded no results. In the initial month of the investigation, 175 individuals were questioned, and every inch of the route from school to home was meticulously searched. The police appealed to the public for assistance. Weeks later, a rough sketch of the van's driver was released, yet it failed to generate any substantial leads. Detectives initially hesitated to release the sketch, fearing that the man might flee the town. However, the urgency to solve the case prompted them to employ additional resources each passing day. Two months later, a new lead emerged when another girl was assaulted in the same neighborhood. An unidentified man had forcibly taken her into his van, transported her to an isolated location, and subsequently released her after committing the crime. Investigators speculated that Linda's killer might be responsible for this new incident, but inconsistencies arose. The assailant drove a white van, and the description of his appearance did not match the information provided by witnesses in Linda's case. Eventually, detectives identified a suspect, a 32-year-old trucker, and his guilt was proven. Witness testimonies confirmed that he bore no resemblance to the man Linda had been seen conversing with. Consequently, investigators concluded that this man had no involvement in her murder. Since then, no significant evidence has emerged in the case, although detectives have continued working on it throughout the years. In 2001, 28 years after the murder, DNA samples from Linda's body were sent to a laboratory to extract the killer's DNA profile. Although they successfully obtained the profile, the man was not found in the FBI database. This indicated that the killer had not been previously convicted in other criminal cases or that the offenses occurred before DNA collection became commonplace. Years later, advancements in DNA analysis technology allowed investigators in Linda's case to turn to a private lab called Parabon in 2018. Utilizing DNA phenotyping, which reveals various traits of a person's appearance based on their DNA sample, Specialists created two portraits of what the perpetrator might have looked like at the ages of 20 and 60. Remarkably, these portraits closely resembled the descriptions provided by witnesses who had seen the suspect 45 years earlier. Typically, police would release these portraits in the media to garner public attention and seek information from individuals who may have known the man. However, the investigators took an unprecedented approach. On July 6, 2018, Precisely 45 years after the murder, they took to Twitter and posted a series of messages in the name of the victim herself. The 68-tweet series detailed Linda's final day, 
portraying her perspective and recounting the events of July 6, 1973. Each message was meticulously selected by the detectives to construct an accurate representation of that fateful day. The Twitter narrative concluded by stating that the search for Linda's killer had remained unsuccessful, followed by the release of the perpetrator's portrait on behalf of the girl. Now, 45 years later, I can speak again, and there is something important I have to tell you. There is a new lead in my case, a face obtained thanks to the DNA of the killer, which he left behind. This technology didn't exist in 1973, but now it can change everything. This innovative approach instantly captured the attention of a vast global audience. While police had previously shared information on old unsolved cases via social media, a narrative presented from the victim's perspective was unprecedented. Although the portrait of the killer alone could not solve the case unless someone recognized him and reported to the police, the investigators aimed to generate as much attention as possible. In total, over 7 million people viewed the series of tweets. The police received numerous tips and potential identifications of the perpetrator, prompting the detectives to spend several months investigating each lead. Unfortunately, they were unable to find a suitable suspect among the information provided. Nonetheless, the investigators remained resolute, particularly with the immense public interest that Linda's case had garnered. Once again, they turned to Parabon, requesting assistance in identifying the killer's relatives through his DNA. A similar endeavor had been attempted by forensic scientists in the early 2000s, but the necessary tools were not yet available. However, almost two decades later, the situation had changed. Parabon's experts successfully located individuals related to the DNA's owner, providing investigators with crucial information that could lead to the identification of the perpetrator. After months of extensive research and utilizing private DNA databases, investigators in Linda's case were able to identify the killer's third cousin, bringing them one step closer to solving the case. However, their breakthrough took an unexpected turn when they discovered that the killer's own DNA was present in one of the private databases. James Allen Neal, a 72-year-old man living in another state, emerged as the prime suspect. In January 2019, detectives visited Neal's residence to gather a sample of his DNA, a necessary step for legal proceedings. They set up surveillance and collected items from his garbage, which were sent to the lab for analysis. Although initial attempts to obtain a DNA sample failed, they successfully retrieved one when Neil discarded a cigarette butt during a parking lot encounter. The DNA from the sample matched the DNA found on Linda's body, conclusively linking James Neal to the crime that had remained unsolved for almost half a century. A few days later, a press conference was held to announce the arrest of James Neal. Born in 1946 in Chicago, Neal's family later relocated to California. Throughout his childhood, he experienced regular abuse and humiliation from his parents, which led to aggressive behavior from an early age. As a teenager, he engaged in various petty offenses, including burglary. After dropping out of school, he pursued short-lived jobs but never maintained stability for more than a few months. James Neal had an extensive criminal history, having been arrested over 12 times for crimes ranging from theft to robbery. However, he often received minimal punishments and swiftly returned to his old ways. At the age of 25, he married for the first time, and the couple settled in the Los Angeles suburbs, a short distance from where Linda lived. It was two years into their marriage that he committed the heinous act of killing Linda. During this time, James's wife was pregnant, and he was already on probation for lesser crimes in another state. In the subsequent years, Neil was cited multiple times for theft and counterfeit activities, and he briefly served time in prison for violating probation terms. After his release, he encountered further legal trouble for traffic violations. He divorced his first wife, with whom he had two daughters. He later lived in different states before returning to Colorado, where he married another woman in 1997. They had a daughter together, joining her child from a previous marriage. 
Further investigation into Neil's background revealed potential involvement in numerous cases of child abuse, although he had never been held accountable for these actions. In 1995 and 2004, he allegedly kidnapped two girls, subjected them to abuse, and then released them. However, he was never proven guilty in these instances, leaving him free to continue his activities. Police suspected him of being involved in at least five additional similar cases where unidentified men in cars abducted girls from the streets. In 2010, a girl from the same church as Neil accused him of molesting her when he was 63 years old. The victim provided accounts of several similar incidents, and Neil eventually confessed. However, the case inexplicably ended up being suppressed, with the victim retracting her accusations, and James Neal went unpunished. He resumed his regular life, remaining off the police's radar for the next nine years until his arrest for Linda's murder. During the trial, Neal consistently denied any involvement, claiming he had never abducted any girls. When shown a photo of Linda, he stated he had never seen her with a man and suggested she resembled one of his daughters. Despite his denials, the presence of his DNA on the victim's body left little room for doubt, making his guilt apparent to investigators. Additional evidence was gathered to strengthen the case, including attempts to ascertain if Neil owned a turquoise van. However, no confirmation of this fact was found, which was explained by his employment at the time as a worker in an apartment complex, providing access to a service van. During the search of Neil's residence, Investigators discovered several hard drives containing illegal materials, along with similar photos and videos on his smartphone. Notably, his computer revealed an interest in the history of violent criminals apprehended through DNA analysis, suggesting his awareness of the potential link between DNA and crime solving. Another chilling revelation occurred during the examination of Neil before his placement in a cell. A tattoo bearing Linda's name was discovered on his wrist. However, it was later confirmed to be an eerie coincidence, as James had acquired the tattoo long before the murder. The trial, originally scheduled for February 2020, was postponed due to the pandemic. Throughout the proceedings, James Neal maintained his innocence, but the overwhelming evidence against him left little doubt about his role in Linda's murder. However, the case never reached trial, as in May, Neil was hospitalized and succumbed to lung cancer two days later. Unaware of his illness at the time of his arrest, it was too late for medical intervention. Finally, the case that had haunted investigators for half a century found closure. Detectives continue to believe that Neil may have had numerous additional victims, and they remain committed to investigating in that direction. Linda's parents, who had long since passed away, carried the burden of guilt throughout their lives, particularly Linda's mother, who blamed herself for not picking her daughter up from school. Linda's sisters expressed gratitude to the investigators for their unwavering commitment to solving the case, although they regretted that their parents did not live to witness the day justice was served. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this clip if you liked it thanks for watching. This monstrous story will not leave anyone indifferent. A 14-year-old girl went out for a walk and disappeared without a trace. She was searched for more than a month, and this investigation was the largest in nine years. Thanks to hundreds of police officers and surveillance types, the mystery was solved, but the truth was far more confusing and shocking. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Alice Gross. Before we start don't forget like video and subscribe for more. Alice Gross was born on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2000, in London. She grew up in a full loving family. She also had an older sister. From an early age, the girl showed an affinity for creativity. She loved to draw and play the piano and violin. Later, Alice began to write her own gorgeous songs and perform them to her own music. In addition, the girl was fond of clothes design, and at age 11, she even made herself a dress which she planned to wear at a school graduation. When the girl was 13 years old, doctors diagnosed her with anorexia and depression. Despite all of this, Alice continued to pursue creativity and had every chance of achieving tremendous success in the future. On August 28, 2014, Alice told her mother that she was going on an outing. She had school vacations and plenty of free time, so the girl loved to walk along a small water canal and river near her home. 
The family lived in a suburb of London called Hanwell, and her usual route was 4.5 kilometers. The girl went out at about 3 p.m., promising her parents she would return around 6 p.m. She later texted her father that she would be home soon, but Alice did not return at the appointed time. When it was already 7 p.m. on the clock, her parents began to worry. They tried calling her, but her phone was off. The fact that Alice suffered from anorexia and depression only added to their anxiety. Her parents feared something might have happened to her because of her physical condition. She was constantly weak and could faint. Her parents called some of her friends in the hope that Alice might be with them, but no one had seen the girl that day. Her mother and father decided to call the police. They immediately began a search, and the first thing they did was to investigate the route Alice usually took. Her relatives and friends of the family also joined the search. Alas, they could not find any trace of the girl, but detectives were able to find several witnesses. Thanks to their testimony about the places where Alice had passed, the police were able to determine her route more accurately, which, in turn, allowed them to narrow the search area and select several street cameras that could have captured her. After examining the footage, detectives did locate Alice. Almost immediately after leaving the house, she was caught on the first camera heading along the Grand Union Canal. A short time later, she was spotted in the Bryan Ford area, which was further down the canal. The last time the camera captured her was on her way back near her home. The girl was walking near the Trampers Way Bridge. The police also reported the missing teenager to the media, and they broke the news about the case all over London. In the first hours after her disappearance, thanks to that, detectives received several calls from witnesses who had seen Alice. Unfortunately, none of this brought the police any closer to finding the girl. Based on camera footage and witness accounts, she disappeared on her way home, having traveled most of her usual route. But what happened to her remained a mystery. Three days went by as police continued to examine camera footage in nearby neighborhoods and surveyed local parks and other secluded areas. At the same time, patrol. Officers went door to door to homes along Alice's route and asked questions of local residents. On September 1st, the girl's relatives recorded a video message begging her to return home. They also asked anyone who had any information about her whereabouts to contact the police. At the time, investigators were considering several theories. The first and most troubling was the kidnapping version. Despite the fact that most of Alice's route was along city streets, there were many remote and hidden areas where the girl might have been attacked. In addition, the London police often encountered situations where people were kidnapped right in the center, let alone in the suburbs. The second was a theory about running away from home. Alice's parents feared that the pressure might have driven her to such a decision. They also didn't rule out the possibility that the girl might have taken her own life because of her illness. But to the police, this version seemed unlikely. At 14, Alice was unlikely to be able to run away and hide, especially without help. And if she had taken her own life, she would very likely have been found by now. The case attracted more and more public attention every day, and on September 3rd, it was handed over to a special unit of Scotland Yard. Although they usually only worked on homicides, the detectives rated the chance of getting the girl home as high. Scotland Yard organized a large-scale search, which was immediately joined by hundreds of volunteers. After seeing the heartbreaking appeal of her parents and sister in the news, concerned Londoners combed the area from early morning until late at night. And the next day, detectives announced the discovery of the first tangible clue. They managed to find Alice's backpack, which contained her shoes worn that day. It was relatively close to her home. This find allowed the police to narrow their search, focusing on a small area near the canal. Investigators realized it was unlikely the girl had taken off her shoes herself, thrown them in with her backpack, and fled. She did not have a change of shoes with her, so the situation became more and more complicated. Scotland Yard decided to release all available surveillance footage of Alice. The backpack with the shoes indicated that the girl might be in serious danger. The main version was still an abduction, but the investigators did not completely rule out the possibility that the girl might have committed suicide. For that reason, they tried to use all available resources to locate her. The publication of the recordings might draw more attention among the public, and someone might remember seeing Alice that day. Along with that, several hundred more people from various agencies were involved in the search, and there were already 600 people working on the case. The investigation was thus the largest since 2005 in terms of the number of police officers involved. Some of them were directly surveying the area, while others were examining footage from hundreds of cameras that could have captured Alice. Scotland Yard also offered a £20,000 reward for any information that could help find the girl. Although police were unable to locate her phone, they asked the cell phone company for details of its last known location. It turned out that Alice had sent a message to her father from practically the same place where they would later find her backpack. Everything indicated that the investigators needed to focus on that particular location. 
the decision was made to conduct a thorough inspection of an area of several square kilometers. Every meter of land and water was examined manually. Police teams literally probed the river and canal bottoms for any evidence. Two days after the discovery of the backpack, it became known that the police arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of Alice's murder. The next day, they arrested another man but refused to comment on the situation until all the details were clarified. However, soon both suspects were released and Scotland Yard stated that they were unable to establish the involvement of these two people in Alice's disappearance. More than a week passed, and during all that time, there was no progress in the case. It was only on September 16th that the police made another statement. They said they were looking for a 41-year-old man named Arnie Salkins in connection with Alice's disappearance. He moved to England from Latvia seven years ago, lived in the area, and worked as a construction worker. Scotland Yard became interested in him for two reasons that, at first glance, seemed unrelated. First, Arnie's co-worker reported him to the police about his disappearance as early as September 3rd. The man did not show up for work, did not answer his phone, and was not at home. It seemed as if he had simply vanished. Second, detectives found that Salkins's route from home to work was roughly the same route that the girl had taken the day she disappeared. All of this was not yet enough to draw any conclusions about the man's involvement in the girl's disappearance, but detectives soon discovered something really disturbing. In one of the camera recordings, they saw a middle-aged man riding his bicycle across the bridge where Alice had passed just a few minutes before. This man turned out to be Salkins. A short time later, he came to the next camera and the detectives noticed a very strange moment. The journey between these cameras should have taken only a few minutes, and it took the man on the bicycle practically a whole hour to ride down this road. A reasonable question arose, what was he doing all that time on such a short stretch? The police investigated the area and concluded that he could not have taken the longer route to the next cell because there simply was none. Even more disturbing was the fact that all this was taking place in the very area where Alice's path was allegedly cut short. The cops also concluded that the man's clothes were wet when he pulled onto the road. Continuing to study the cameras, detectives noticed Salkins on his bicycle returning to the same location two hours later after riding back out 50 minutes later. In doing so, he was not caught on the camera located on the bridge. This indicated that the man had spent all that time inside a small blind spot. Besides, he was already wearing different clothes. About an hour later, he was caught on a camera at a local store buying beer. The next morning, the situation repeated itself. Salkins returned to the same spot between the cameras at about 7 o'clock and also returned there again in the evening. All this was enough to get a search warrant for his house. It turned out that the man was living there with his girlfriend and their two daughters. Together, his roommate also had no idea where Salkins had gone. When she learned that he was suspected of killing the girl, she stated that Arnie's could never do something like that. She described him as a caring and loving father. Along with this, Scotland Yard examined the man's biography and discovered a truly creepy moment. It turned out that Salkins had a rich criminal past. In 1998, being in Latvia, he killed his wife in cold blood and calculatedly, having dug a grave for her in the woods. For this, he got only seven years in prison. After serving his sentence, he moved to England, and the local law enforcement agencies did not even know about his criminal record in his home country. Police officers searched Salkins's home and found a recently excavated plot of land on his property. They did not disclose whether they found any evidence there, but a significant find awaited them in the basement of their house. A broken back panel from a white iPhone 4S was found there. Alice had the exact same phone. After examining the contents of his computer, the police also discovered that the man had searched the internet for information about Alice Gross's disappearance a few days after the incident. Based on all this, Arnie Salkins was put on the wanted list. Scotland Yard feared that the man might have fled back to Latvia or another European country, so they searched all over the EU, but law enforcement authorities were unable to find a single trace of the suspect. Meanwhile, a month had passed since Alice's disappearance, and on September 30th, the police issued a depressing statement. A human body was found in a river near the girl's disappearance. At the time, the identity was not yet known, but the police shared one eerie fact, someone had gone to great lengths to arrange for the body to remain underwater and not resurface. Only the next day, law enforcement authorities confirmed that the deceased was Alice Gross. Though no one doubted it anymore, the scene was in the exact spot where she had disappeared. The cause of death was asphyxiation. It turned out that Alice's body had been wrapped in construction bags and tied to a large tree stump. In addition, the perpetrator made a whole structure out of a bicycle wheel and bricks, which also prevented the body from surfacing. She also had no clothes on except for one sock. Detectives paid a visit to the setup where Salkins worked and discovered that the same bags used to hide Alice's body were the same ones used at his construction site. After the discovery of the body, 
Police continued to search for Salkins, working closely with Interpol and local European intelligence agencies, but they were still unable to find any trace of him. This went on until October 4 when investigators made an unexpected discovery. They discovered the man's suspended body in a park just one kilometer from where Alice was murdered. Two days later, experts confirmed that the deceased was Arnie Salkins. No one expected such a turn of events. The main version of Scotland Yard was the escape of the suspect to Europe. Well, in fact, it turned out that all this time he was under their noses. Medical experts concluded that the man had committed suicide on the day of his disappearance, September 3rd, and that he could not be found for a month. Nothing surprising here, however. Salkins had chosen a very remote and hard-to-reach location where he was extremely difficult to spot. With Salkins' DNA in hand, investigators had even more evidence. Near where Alice's body was found, police found a cigarette butt, which was sent to a lab. Experts extracted DNA from the filter, which matched the Salkin sample. In addition, the lab said that it was highly likely that the perpetrator's DNA was found on the victim's body. They could not assert this with 100% certainty due to how long the body had been in the water. His DNA was also found on the girl's backpack and shoes. By that time, the police had discovered another gruesome fact. It turned out that two years after moving to England, Salkins had molested a 14-year-old girl just a kilometer away from where Alice's body was found. A man attempted some indecent act, but the victim survived, and the man was arrested. This is where the fun part begins. The girl did not press formal charges, and the perpetrator was simply released. It is not entirely clear how this could have happened, but the fact remains, an adult man molested a girl, fell into the hands of the police, and escaped punishment. Moreover, information about this case surfaced after the perpetrator's body was found in the park. Despite all this, the police continued to investigate, and it took them some time to put together a picture of what had happened. According to their version, on an unfortunate day, August 28, Salkins was riding his bicycle along the same route where Alice was walking. Having noticed her in a secluded area hidden from prying eyes, he attacked her in order to commit depraved acts. How events unfolded next, we shall never know, but the outcome was tragic. Salkins killed Alice and then hid her body in several approaches, constantly returning to the place. We will also never know why he decided to take his own life after what he had done. Whether this can be called a manifestation of conscience is very debatable. Alice's parents, who survived such a terrible tragedy, were outraged by the government's actions. They were perplexed how the British authorities allowed a convicted murderer to enter the country and stay here to live. They had spent years fighting for the government to increase its control over migrants and keep criminals out. Unfortunately, to this day, they have been unable to make any serious changes. A month after the discovery of Salkins's body, another interesting event occurred. The medical examiner in charge of the investigation left a folder of case documents on the train. The 30 pages contained important information about the murder, including medical information and undisclosed details. The public, the media, and Alice's parents harshly criticized the police, but there was nothing they could do about it. However, no one tried to judge the deceased perpetrator anyway. The investigator said that if he were alive, they would have had enough evidence to bring the case to court, but there was no guarantee of a conviction. The problem was that all the evidence against Salkins was circumstantial, and he had a small chance of getting away with it. Instead, a hearing was held in court in which the jury admitted an already obvious fact, Alice had been murdered. Her death was not an accident. The procedure was formal and played no role. Alice's funeral was held on October 23rd. Thousands of people came out to the memorial that day, and at the end of the ceremony, a beautiful song that the girl wrote and sang herself was shown on the big screen. Like the video if they found it appealing and subscribe and channel. In a foreign, tranquil American town, a horrific incident sent shockwaves through the community. A young girl vanished from her own residence, leaving behind her personal belongings, phone and car, without a single clue. As time went on, the investigation of this puzzling case started mirroring a conventional detective series. With one stark distinction, this was all unfolding in reality. The small town became immersed in an ambience of fear and suspicion, for the girl's disappearance potentially implicated any of its residents. However, it took a staggering 12 years for the chilling truth to be unveiled, reverberating throughout the entire world. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Tara Grinstead was born in 1974 in Hawkinsville, USA. During her high school years, she actively participated in beauty contests, winning prizes. From an early age, Tara set a goal to obtain a quality education, so she saved the money earned from competitions to pay for her studies. After college, Tara earned a master's degree in education and landed her dream job as a high school history teacher in Asilla, Georgia. Asilla was a tiny town, typical of low-rise America, with a population of no more than 4,000 people who mostly knew each other well. Life in Asilla was quiet and predictable, with no one suspecting that any serious crime could occur there. 
Tara Grinstead had worked at the local school for several years and had built strong relationships with both staff and students. She was known as a kind and outgoing person, always supportive and helpful. In October 2005, her help became valuable to her students who were preparing for a local beauty pageant. The girls were thrilled to have Tara's support. On Saturday, October 22, Tara assisted the students with their final preparations for the pageant. Afterward, she attended a picnic with her high school friends and didn't return home until 11 p.m. She parked her car outside under a carport and from that point on, Tara ceased all contact. Her mother, who lived in another city, grew increasingly worried as Tara always picked up the phone or returned calls. However, this time, there was no answer. On Monday, October 24, Tara's anxiety peaked when she didn't show up for work. This behavior was highly unusual for her as she took her job seriously and would have informed her superiors if she needed time off. Concerned acquaintances contacted police chief Billy Hancock and asked him to check on her well-being. At 10 a.m., he went to her address, initially assuming her phone was dead or that she was sick and had overslept. When Chief Hancock arrived at Tara's house, he found her car in its usual spot with unlocked doors, which was not surprising in such a small town where car theft wasn't a concern. He noticed an envelope on the dashboard containing $100 in cash, which was already strange, considering Tara's responsible nature. Billy knocked on the door, but there was no answer. Deciding to investigate further, he explored the house. At first glance, everything seemed perfectly ordinary with no signs of struggle or break-in. However, in Tara's bedroom, he discovered a real mess, highly uncharacteristic for her. Her belongings, including the clothes she had last been seen in, were strewn on the floor. Her cell phone was on the nightstand, charging, indicating that Tara had left the house briefly, but she was nowhere to be found. Outside the house, the police found a latex glove, a potential piece of evidence suggesting foul play. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the equivalent of the FBI at the state level, became involved in the case. The primary focus of the investigation was kidnapping, with little evidence beyond the latex glove. Detectives found two more curious items, Tara's torn chain on the bedroom floor and her alarm clock out of place. However, these findings did not provide much help in solving the mystery of her disappearance. For the small town, that Monday was a truly dreadful day. Tara's house was cordoned off, and the school held a meeting where Sarah's co-workers and students rallied to support the search effort. Volunteers formed a group, printing out flyers with Tara's picture and information about her disappearance. Within hours, the flyers were posted throughout the city. Volunteers stayed home until 1 a.m., while agents from the Bureau of Investigation interviewed Tara's neighbors and thoroughly investigated the neighborhood. Sniffer dogs were brought in to aid the search, hoping to pick up Tara's trail if she had left on foot. Simultaneously, the latex glove was handed over to experts to collect as much data as possible. The investigators clung to the hope that they would find Tara and unravel the mystery behind her sudden vanishing. Despite the efforts to find a match in the FBI database, investigators obtained a DNA sample from the scene of Tara's disappearance, but it did not yield any matches. All they knew was that the sample belonged to a man. Frustratingly, this led to no breakthroughs and Tara seemed to have vanished as if into thin air from her own home. In a new direction, investigators delved into Tara's personal life and past, a common approach when a woman goes missing. Often, someone from her inner circle is implicated. After scrutinizing Tara's romantic relationships, detectives focused on Marcus Harper, a former policeman and military officer, with whom Tara had been in a relationship. However, no solid suspects emerged during the investigation. Tara had initiated the breakup about a year before her disappearance, desiring to build a family while Marcus was not ready for that commitment. Despite their separation, they maintained a cordial relationship, communicating via calls and texts. Detectives later unearthed an intriguing detail, Marcus had visited Uzola three weeks prior to Tara's disappearance, but he had not informed her. Learning about Marcus's visit through mutual acquaintances deeply upset Tara, prompting her repeated calls to him in an attempt to understand why he had kept it a secret. Tara's emotional state escalated into hysteria, causing great concern among her relatives, who worried she might act recklessly. However, she eventually regained composure and the police did not consider Marcus a suspect. Their relationship had ended and no apparent motive for the crime could be established. The investigation took another twist when it was revealed that Tara had received threats from a former student. On March 30, 2005, seven months prior to her disappearance, the student had gone to Tara's house and displayed extremely aggressive behavior. When Tara refused to let him in, he began banging on the door, prompting neighbors to call the police. It was discovered that the young man had been infatuated with Tara since high school, and according to acquaintances, he exhibited emotional instability and peculiar, even alarming behavior. Tara had tried to assist him with his problems for a while, but his mental state only deteriorated. After the incident of him attempting to break into her house, Tara filed a report against him, genuinely fearing for her safety. 
The investigation continued with these new leads, as detectives explored the possibilities surrounding the troubled former student and his potential involvement in Tara's disappearance. After Tara's disappearance, the police tracked down the young man who had previously threatened her. He was working in a neighboring town approximately 150 kilometers away from Masilla. The young man provided detectives with an alibi for the nights surrounding Tara's disappearance, making it difficult to establish his involvement in the case. Additionally, a business card belonging to a police officer was found in Tara's house. It was discovered that Tara had been dating this officer for some time, but at the time of her disappearance, he had already relocated to another city. The policeman also provided an alibi for the time period in question, effectively removing him from the list of suspects. With no solid leads at hand, the police made the decision to organize a search for Tara two weeks after she went missing. This delayed response raised questions, as it was evident from the beginning that Tara had not left her home willingly. Hundreds of volunteers were called upon to search the surrounding area, combing through forests, ditches, and rivers. Unfortunately, not a single trace of Tara was found during the search. During this time, there was also a report of a housing car burning down near Tara's residence. The locals, almost unanimously, believed that the incident was connected to her disappearance. Speculation arose, suggesting that the perpetrator may have been attempting to cover their tracks, or the residents, deeply shocked and frightened, found every event suspicious in light of Tara's mysterious vanishing. Despite the exhaustive search efforts, the police faced the harsh reality that they had run out of leads. The following years brought no closer to solving the mystery surrounding Tara's disappearance. However, in 2009, an unexpected event thrust Tara Grinstead back into the spotlight. A YouTube channel was created by an unidentified user, featuring an eerie video. The video depicted a man whose face was obscured and voice altered, claiming involvement in the disappearances of 16 girls, including Tara Grinstead. The man further stated that he had securely hidden the bodies and would provide clues about their burial sites in subsequent videos. The police swiftly investigated the video and confirmed that all 16 names mentioned did indeed belong to missing women. The FBI managed to track down the creator of the video, a 27-year-old man named Andrew Haley. Upon his arrest, Andrew claimed that it was all a joke. The police, however, could not establish any connection between Andrew and the missing girls. Nevertheless, Andrew faced charges of perjury and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to two years of forced labor and 13 years of probation. The momentary hopes of solving this cold case faded once again, leaving the police without any viable leads. In December 2010, Tara Grinstead was officially declared dead due to the lack of evidence. As the years went by, the townspeople retained vivid memories of Tara's disappearance, but the discussion of her case became increasingly infrequent, confined behind closed doors. The impact of Tara's disappearance had forever altered the town, leaving behind a lingering atmosphere of fear and mistrust for years to come. In 2016, journalist Payne Lindsay from Atlanta created a podcast dedicated to unsolved mysteries, with the Tara Grinstead case as its first focus. Alongside private investigator Morris Godwin, they traveled to Asilla and started working on the case with limited access to police records. Their main source of information became the townspeople. Initially, they could only speak to Tara's friends and relatives as outsiders avoided discussing the missing girl. However, Lindsay's enthusiasm reignited interest in the case, prompting discussions throughout Asilla. Lindsay and Godwin painstakingly explored every lead, considering three possible suspects, Tara's ex-boyfriends and the students who had attempted to break into her house. Along the way, they interviewed anyone who might have valuable information. The duo's passion for the case led them to believe that a breakthrough was just within reach on several occasions. One day, Lindsay received an anonymous call suggesting they search Tara's property for remains. The police followed the tip, but the discovered bones were determined to be of animal origin. Despite the excitement and renewed interest generated by the podcast, no significant progress was made in solving the case during its creation. However, the amateur investigation proved crucial for the eventual breakthrough. In early 2017, Brooke Sheridan approached the police with a shocking story. She revealed that her ex-boyfriend, Bo Dukes, had confessed to helping his friend dispose of Tara Grinstead's body. Initially skeptical due to the recent surge in attention surrounding the case, the detectives cautiously approached the matter. They equipped Brooke with a wire and instructed her to seek a confession from Bo Dukes. To their surprise, Bo did not deny his involvement when confronted by Brooke wearing the wire. This provided the police with probable cause to arrest him. Bo cooperated fully with the investigation, revealing the truth behind Tara's disappearance. According to Bo's account, his friend and former classmate, Ryan Duke, had called him late one night, requesting to borrow a truck for an undisclosed task. Ryan then disclosed that he had broken into Tara Grinstead's house to steal money but something had gone wrong, leading to her death. Ryan claimed that after a party, while under the influence of drugs, he decided to break into a house to find money, ultimately choosing Tara's residence. A struggle ensued between Tara and Ryan, resulting in her death. 
Bo arrived at Tara's house with a truck, and together they loaded her body into it before driving her to a wooded area where they disposed of her remains. The shocking nature of this revelation rocked the residents of Asilla. Bo Dukes and Ryan Duke had never been considered suspects, as there was no apparent motive or evidence linking them to Tara's disappearance. Despite Bo's full confession, he chose not to testify against himself in court. During the trial, he expressed remorse and apologized to Tara's relatives for his actions, shedding tears for what he had done. Bo Dukes, who had an extensive military background with numerous decorations, was found guilty of helping cover up Tara Grinstead's murder. His sentencing included 25 years in prison. Ryan Dukes' murder trial for Tara Grinstead was initially scheduled for April 1, 2019, but it was postponed on March 28, 2019, by the Georgia Supreme Court due to the alleged denial of funding for expert witnesses on Dukes' behalf. The trial finally commenced on May 9, 2022. During the trial, Ryan Duke pleaded not guilty to murder, while Bo Dukes was charged with murder. On May 20, 2022, the jury found Ryan Duke not guilty of murder and aggravated assault but guilty of concealment of death. Ryan Duke testified in court, stating that his previous confessions to the murder were false, claiming that he had made them under the influence of drugs and out of fear of the actual killer, a friend with a similar last name. Bo Dukes. Ryan Duke testified that Bo Dukes woke him up in their shared mobile home in 2005 and confessed to killing Tara Grinstead, showing him her purse and wallet as evidence. Although Tara's body was never found, investigators matched her DNA to bone fragments discovered in the location Ryan Duke had mentioned. On May 23, 2022, Ryan Duke was sentenced by the judge in Irwin County Superior Court to 10 years in prison for concealing the body. This was the maximum penalty allowed. By the time of his sentencing, Ryan Duke had already served approximately half of that sentence. Throughout the trial, prosecutors argued that Duke's confession contained details that only the actual killer could have known, such as the phone call he claimed to have made from a payphone to Tara Grinstead's home after running away and returning to find her gone. Duke's DNA was also found on a latex glove discovered in Grinstead's yard. However, his testimony created enough doubt in the minds of the jury, leading to his acquittal on all charges except concealing her death. Bo Dukes was subpoenaed to testify but invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and refused to answer the court's questions. When the truth about this high-profile case was revealed, Tara Grinstead's friends and relatives finally found some relief from the burden of uncertainty. Tara's mother admitted that she had secretly hoped for a miracle all these years, hoping that her daughter would return alive. Unfortunately, reality proved to be cruel, senseless, and devoid of miracles. At least now, the entire world knows the truth about what happened in that small town back in 2005. If you like this video write your opinion about it and give it a like take care and thanks for watching thank you. When we think of cartel violence, we usually think of the Medellin cartel, Pablo Escobar's ruthless and bloody empire. However, there is an even more violent cartel in Mexico. Up until 2010, Mexican cartels fought over authority and territory, but extreme violence wasn't the norm. Declaring war on police officers and civilians certainly wasn't the norm either. However, when La Cita split from the Gulf Cartel, they brought an unprecedented level of brutality to Mexico. Kidnappings, bombings, beheadings, and civilian murders started plaguing the country on a daily basis. It was a decade of sheer terror and panic before Las Zetas finally started succumbing to the government's efforts and the growing power of rival cartels. Trigger warning. The following video discusses topics of extreme violence. This is your chance to turn back. This is the full story of the Las Zetas cartel. On New Year's Day, 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement saw a new level of collaboration between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. The cartels hated this. An extremist group called the Zapatista Army of National Liberation launched an armed rebellion in southern Mexico. But this only prompted the Mexican army to take arms as well. And this time the US got involved too, training the Mexican army's special forces. The United States had a school where it trained many military officers from Latin America inside its own borders. In 1997, Ozil Cardenas Gillen took control of the Gulf Cartel and found himself in the middle of a brutal turf war. To strengthen his position, he employed a retired army lieutenant, Arturo Guzman de Sina, to recruit dozens of army deserters from the Mexican Army's special forces. They were to become Cardenas' personal bodyguards, known as Zetas or Zs in Spanish. This is how the Gulf Cartel's army became known as Las Zetas. From the very beginning, their primary goal was to destroy any enemies of the cartel, from rival gangs to the police. There was a noticeable change in the way Las Zetas fought. 
it was no longer just gang members with shaved heads and tattoos fighting with pistols and knives. They adopted a militarized style of fighting, resembling military units. This approach spread across every cartel in Mexico. Within the Gulf Cartel, violence was just a means to an end. Cartel bosses would order the assassination of rival kingpins to secure more power, and violent shootouts would ensure turf victories. However, with La Zetas, it was a completely different story. These former specially trained soldiers already had a knack for senseless brutality and organized attacks. Now, they were encouraged to be as brutal as they could be. They were even rewarded with honor medals if they outdid their peers in terms of violence or kill count. This really upped the ant of violence in their conflict. They used terror as a weapon, drawing on their military background and the anti-insurgency training they had received, which originated in the United States. Cardinals were now pressured to grow their armies and strategize more as the Gulf Cartel threatened to take over. However, until the war on drugs began in the early 2000s, the violence remained contained within the cartel world. La Zetas were still contained within the Gulf Cartel, but it would soon escalate beyond anything imaginable. In 2002, Mexican authorities killed Arturo Guzman de Sina as part of their kingpin strategy to dissolve cartels by removing their leaders. Just a few months later, they arrested Oziel Cardenas Yu. For a few years, he continued to lead the Gulf Cartel from prison, similar to Escobar's situation in the early 1990s. But in 2007, Cardenas was extradited to the US, the Gulf Cartel was left in the hands of whoever was ruthless enough to grab it, and who else but its own army, La Zetas? However, La Zetas didn't take control of the Gulf Cartel. They broke away and formed their own cartel in February 2010. Needless to say, this started a terrible war between the Gulf Cartel and Las Zetas, which escalated further in August 2010. The Mexican military stumbled upon a mass grave and, as they began examining it, they were shocked to discover the bodies of 72 undocumented immigrants whom Las Zetas had intercepted and killed. This was due to their fear that the immigrants would be recruited by the Gulf Cartel. In April 2011, Las Zetas intercepted several buses heading towards two towns bordering Texas. They kidnapped hundreds of innocent people and executed 193 individuals on a San Fernando ranch. The brutality was horrific, with women being violated and men enduring hours of mutilation before their deaths. Some men were even forced to fight each other to the death, all for Las Zetas' amusement. The few survivors were recruited by Las Zetas based on the suspicion that they might be Gulf Cartel recruits. These attacks were not based on factual information. Later that year, in August, La Zetas set fire to a casino in Monterey, resulting in the death of 52 civilians. Their motive was the casino's refusal to pay protection money. Less than a year later, the Monterey police discovered 49 decapitated bodies dumped on the highway by La Zetas after a clash with the Sinaloa Cartel. In 2014, La Zeta suspected two men of stealing money from the cartel. In response, they rushed to their hometown of Allende and reduced 80 homes to ashes, resulting in the loss of between 300 and 500 lives. These were unprecedented numbers, even for the most ruthless cartel kingpins globally. La Zeta also engaged in the horrifying practice of preparing geysos, which involved taking a family member, placing them in a pig boiler, pouring gasoline on them, and setting them on fire. La Zetas ruled through fear, not money, power, or respect. They were not interested in the typical cartel business of controlling trade routes into the US. Instead, they aimed to seize territory by holding people hostage, killing, and maiming until they gained control. La Zetas had become more of an invading army than a traditional cartel. Their activities expanded beyond narcotics trafficking to include local drug sales, extortion, kidnapping, car theft, selling pirated goods, and corrupting labor unions. In 2010, La Zetas targeted Pemex, the national Mexican oil company, and engaged in large-scale theft using tanker trucks. They stole large quantities of oil by attaching hoses to unload the tanks and load the stolen gas into their own trucks. This oil theft proved more profitable than the complex process involved in the white powder trade, which includes production and smuggling. Shockingly, several U.S. companies were discovered to be buying stolen oil from Las Zetas. Legal actions were taken against five Texas companies involved in this illicit trade. With their militarized power, 
Las Zetas operated with impunity, leaving the authorities powerless. Harassment, intimidation, and theft from Pemex staff were common occurrences. Innocent people often found themselves caught in the crossfire as cartels fought against each other, with the Pemex staff becoming unwitting victims. Living in constant fear, people had to be ready to run at a moment's notice. However, for La Zetas, this was just an everyday part of doing business. The DEA declared La Zetas the most aggressive and technologically advanced Mexican organized group. They appeared invincible, striking terror into the hearts of everyone. However, Mexican authorities never ceased their fight against them. Foreign authorities continued their kingpin strategy within the war on drugs. In October 2012, the Mexican Navy killed La Zeta's commander, Heriberto Lascano. His right-hand man, Miguel Angel Trevito Morales, took charge. Morales, though lacking a military background, exhibited extreme brutality, even towards his own soldiers. He engaged in horrific acts such as boiling and burning. Victims alive. Under Morales' leadership, La Zetas transformed into a gang of monsters and thugs. As Mexican authorities relentlessly targeted the top leaders of La Zetas, the group became increasingly fragmented, unreliable, and less profitable. Oil theft decreased, and the drug trade was secured by the notorious Sinaloa cartel, led by El Chapo and El Mayo, who possessed the necessary international connections and logistics. La Zetas shifted their focus to kidnappings and extortions, but these activities rarely generated significant profits and caused immense pain and suffering. The Mexican army was hot on their trail. In an ironic twist, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel drew inspiration from La Zeta's extreme violence and military-style fighting. They emulated and surpassed them, slowly reducing La Zeta's to ashes alongside the Sinaloa Cartel. Morales was arrested, and the remaining members either joined the CJNG, were killed, or captured. Unfortunately, the extreme brutality initiated by La Zetas only served to inspire further violence within other cartels. The CJNG, in particular, has taken violence to new heights utilizing explosive tactics and attacking police officers and civilians with militarized drones. They continue to terrorize Mexican communities, perpetuating a cycle of violence. The thirst for revenge fuels these cartels, and many members derive pleasure from spreading terror and taking lives. The question remains, how will the violence ever end if cartels keep recruiting new members and exposing them to a world where fear reigns as the only currency? The dissolution of the violent Mexican cartels remains an ongoing challenge for the authorities. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and before you go don't forget to like and subscribe. In 1999, a mysterious disappearance occurred in the United States that still haunts people's minds today. An 11-year-old girl was left alone for 90 seconds and literally vanished. Years later, police would find a bill with I am alive written on it in the girl's name. In this video, we've compiled all the information we have on what happened to Michaela Biggs on January 2, 1999, in the American city of Mesa, Arizona. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Two sisters, 11-year-old Michaela and 9-year-old Kimber, were walking close to home. It was a chilly evening, and it was just beginning to get dark outside. Despite the height of winter, Arizona is a warm southern state, so Michaela brought her bike and rode alongside her sister. At one point, the girls thought they heard the sound of an approaching ice cream truck. They put speakers on them and turned on music to alert children to the approach of a favorite treat. The girls hurried home to ask their mother and change for ice cream, then returned to the street. However, the ice cream truck was nowhere to be found, and the girls began to wait. At some point, Kimber got cold. She told her sister that she would run inside to get a jacket and come back. When she arrived back, Michaela was no longer there. The bike was lying on the road with its wheels still spinning. Beside it lay the two coins the girls had prepared to buy ice cream. Kimber came home and told her mother that Michaela was missing. Neither she nor her mother had yet allowed even the thought that anything could have happened to the girl. The mother thought that Michaela had gone to a neighbor with whom the family was friendly, but the girl was not there and the mother realized that something terrible might have happened to her daughter. Immediately thereafter, she went to the police. It is worth noting that the police response was very fast. Already in 30 minutes, a helicopter was in the air. The law enforcers stopped all suspicious cars, bypassed the surrounding houses, 
That day, volunteers from the girls' school handed out imposted flyers with her picture. Those pictures would later appear in storefronts and on billboards along roads throughout Arizona. Police searched dumpsters and inspected hundreds of homes. Detective Butch Gates and Jerry Giselle were assigned to the case. The cops questioned every ice cream vendor in the state and could not establish that at least one of them was in that area at the time of the girl's disappearance. Detectives reconstructed the chronology of events and came to an eerie conclusion, the girl disappeared in just 90 seconds. That's how long Kimber had been missing. The spinning wheel on the bicycle confirmed the fact that the abduction had taken place extremely quickly. Search dogs, the help of which was used by the investigation, could not get a trace of the girl. And when they did, they took only a few steps in the direction of the road. The fact that the dog takes the mark of the person only when the missing person left on their feet only reinforced the main version of the police. The girl was put in a car, taken away, and it all happened in a matter of seconds. The situation was complicated by the complete lack of witnesses. Despite the fact that the girls were playing in a street filled with houses, none of the neighbors saw them that night. Later, there was information that a man tried to kidnap the two girls right out of school. The children were 10 and 11 years old at the time. Police checked the information for a connection to the disappearance of Michaela, who was just 11, but the kidnapping turned out to be a failed prank. There was less and less evidence, so police began working out the standard theories. When a child goes missing, parents and other relatives are always checked, given that Michaela's mother was at home. At the time of the kidnapping, investigators took on the girl's father, Darian Biggs. From the beginning, no one really believed in his involvement. Why would a father kidnap his own daughter, especially in such a way, in the middle of the street, in a short period of time when his other daughter was running home? However, it soon became clear that the man had lied about his alibi. During the first interrogation, he stated that he was at work at the time of the abduction, which turned out to be untrue. In reality, he was spending time with his mistress. What happened next was even more interesting. The man failed the polygraph questioning, and his wife admitted that she knew about the cheating. Darian himself had told her about it a month before it happened. The couple thought about divorce. Despite the fake alibi, the police eventually stopped considering the father as a suspect. Even in the event of a divorce, his wife had no plans to forbid him from seeing his children. He simply had no motive. In addition, the detectives acknowledged that the lie detector results may have been influenced by the emotional state of the father, whose daughter had just been abducted. He may even have laid some of the blame on himself and thought that if he had been home with his family, the tragedy could have been avoided. Detectives also tracked Darian's movements that evening and determined that he simply would not have had time to hide Michaela. The man showed up at home very quickly after his spouse called him to report his daughter missing. Detective Giselle later stated that Michaela most likely did not know her abductor. If it had been the father, she would not have thrown the bicycle and change on the ground. The girl tried to run away from the stranger but simply did not make it. During the investigation, police regularly had leads that led nowhere. An anonymous man called detectives and reported that Michaela's body was in an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Police combed the area but found nothing. Later, they received an email from an anonymous man claiming that he was the one who had kidnapped the girl. The FBI fairly quickly traced the sender's IP address and sent a SWAT team to his home in the city of Phoenix. It turned out that the sender was a 12-year-old boy who had just decided to make a joke. Meanwhile, the police had reached a stalemate, beginning to process even the most incomprehensible theories. They combed through 35 abandoned gold mines in the county and then even questioned nearly 500 psychics who could supposedly help the investigation. Of course, this went nowhere. One witness was found who had seen a mint-colored jeep shortly before Michaela was kidnapped. The driver was quickly found and proved innocent. After that, the police were already desperate to find the girl because there was literally not a single clue left in front of them. This went on until September 27, 1999, when the quiet county was shocked by another event. A woman living near Biggs returned home and walked into the kitchen to find a middle-aged man with his pants unbuttoned. Without uttering a word, he jumped on the woman and began strangling and abusing her. The perpetrator then set fire to the house and left. Apparently, the attacker thought his victim was dead, but the woman survived. Her neck was broken, but she was able to reach the phone and call an ambulance. Already on her way to the hospital, she whispered to the doctors from her last breath, Michaela Biggs, the girl who is missing, he took her, you must save her. The whole town was shocked again, and events swirled rapidly. The police took up the case and arrested the assailant. He turned out to be D. Bullock, a well-known alcoholic in the area who lived with his wife and three children, repaired wrecked cars, and occasionally disrupted public order. His house was only two blocks from Biggs. D. was one of the first to volunteer to help find Michaela and willingly let the police into the house to search, but not into the trailer in the backyard. For the trailer, he demanded a warrant. This behavior was extremely bizarre. A man with a bad reputation volunteering to help find a missing girl, 
giving the police a look around his house without any questions and suddenly forbidding them to look in the trailer. From then on, Bullock became the prime suspect, even though his wife provided him with an alibi for the time Michaela was kidnapped. No one believed her story, and most likely she was just afraid of her husband. Detectives began digging into Bullock's past and discovered that he had been tried three times for violence and molestation, as well as for kidnapping minors. He didn't get out of prison until 1995, and at that time, none of the neighbors had any idea what kind of monster lived next door. Several times a week, Michaela took private piano lessons from a neighbor who lived across the street from Bullock's house. This suggested that the man may have known the girl long before she disappeared. After Bullock was arrested for assaulting the woman, the police searched his house again and planned to investigate the trailer he had kept them out of earlier. But they were disappointed. The trailer had disappeared without a trace. This was a major blow to Michaela's parents. They were sure their daughter was there, alive or not, but she had disappeared and the police were unable to trace her location. Bullock was sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison for the September 27, 1999 attack on the woman. He categorically denied any involvement in Michaela's disappearance. This was not surprising for the attack on his neighbor and the atrocities he committed. 15 years in prison would be a lenient sentence by U.S. standards. A confession to kidnapping an 11-year-old girl, on the other hand, could have landed him straight in the electric chair. The parents could not accept that their only hope for the truth was gone. The mother and father wrote Bullock a letter directly to the prison, asking the ultimate question, whether he had anything to do with Michaela's disappearance. No one hoped to get a confession, but the criminal's answer took them by surprise. He wrote that the conversation was too personal and suggested that her parents visit him in prison. At that moment, hope rekindled in the hearts of the parents. The Bullock would confess, but they were greatly disappointed sitting across from the perpetrator. The father asked if he had anything to do with his daughter's disappearance. Bullock simply replied that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. The conversation continued in this vein for several more minutes, after which the perpetrator simply picked up and left accompanied by security. It looked as if he was just teasing the parents, giving them false hope and destroying it by looking them in the eye. For a sadist like Bullock, the suffering of others can bring unsurpassed pleasure. This is apparently why he arranged the meeting with the grief-stricken parents. Afterwards, Michaela's father confessed that he was convinced that Bullock was involved. He stated, I was sitting a few feet away from the guy who killed my daughter and there was nothing I could do about it. At this point, even the most staunch hopes of solving the case were abandoned. Absolutely everyone believed that no new leads would ever emerge. Years later, they would realize that they were wrong, but more on that later. On the fifth anniversary of Michaela's disappearance, the parents buried an empty coffin, finally saying goodbye to their daughter. During this time, their marriage broke up. They changed residence and were reluctant to contact journalists. Until 2018, the case went into a long drawer. The police simply had nothing to work with. But out of the blue, an event occurred that stirred up all of America. On March 14, 2018, a dollar bill was accidentally dropped at a police station in Nina, Wisconsin. On it was written in stubby handwriting, My name is Michaela Biggs, kidnapped from Mass, I am alive. The bill was found by a local resident who was collecting coins and dollar bills in a jar. He was the one who came across the dollar, after which he reported the find to the police and they instantly reopened the investigation. Michaela's mother rushed nearly 2,000 miles away to look at the handwriting and see if the message was actually written by her daughter. Other relatives also came to the station, but they all made a disappointing statement. The handwriting looked nothing like Michaela's, and the name was misspelled. The mother suggested that the bill might be someone's extremely unfortunate prank. The other relatives also supported this theory. Despite this, the police attempted to trace the bill's path. Alas, it was almost impossible to do so. Paper money changes owners so many times that it was impossible to find the author of this inscription. Experts who studied the bill suggested that the inscription was made by an adult man who was trying to imitate the handwriting of a child. Despite all this, the message on the paper bill seems highly suspicious. Could it have been someone's prank? The chance of police and relatives finding out about the bill are extremely slim. It could have been passed around for years, or it could have settled in a bank vault and no one would have noticed it. The fact that it ended up in the hands of a concerned person who reported it to the police is more of a miracle than inevitability. As for the handwriting, the most obvious version cannot be ruled out. Michaela may have written in a hurry for fear of being caught. Besides, she had been missing for nine years before the bill appeared. Assuming someone held her captive, did they give her something to write all that time? In nine years without practice, handwriting can change beyond recognition. There is another question no one knows the answer to. How long ago was this writing made? The bill could have been in circulation for years, or it could have appeared shortly before it was discovered. It's worth remembering about Bullock, who was supposed to be released from prison in 2017. Perhaps this evil prank is his doing, suffice it to recall how he tormented unhappy parents by giving them false hope.
perhaps we will never know the answer to all these questions again, or this case will once again shake the world with unexpected details. Kimber, who was the last person to see her older sister before she was kidnapped, still can't forget that gruesome January night. For a long time, she blamed herself for going home to get her jacket. But now she realizes against an adult kidnapper, she would have been helpless. Kimber raises her young son, to whom she constantly talks about his aunt Michaela. She calls her an angel who looks out for him. The girl, as well as the rest of her family, are sure that Michaela was kidnapped by Bullock. But without evidence, it can never be proved unless the criminal himself decides to confess in order to deal another blow to the missing girl's family. Do you think there's any hope that the writing on the bill was done by Michaela herself and she is still alive? Write your thoughts in the comments below the video also don't forget to like the video if you like it take care of yourself and your loved ones thank you for watching. A 24 year old girl disappeared from the store where she worked the evening shift. Police found traces of blood in the back room and signs of a struggle, but it was definitely not a robbery. The unknown perpetrator had left a full cash register. A few days later, the girl's body was found 5 kilometers from the store. The investigation of this terrible case dragged on for nearly 25 years. It was not until a quarter of a century later that it became known what had happened to Lisa Seeger. Before we start don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Lisa Marie Seeger was born on March 24, 1968, in Holyoke, Massachusetts. She grew up in a close-knit family with three other children besides her and they lived in a town called Agawam. From an early age, the girl loved music and learned to play several instruments. For a while, she was even a member of the school music group. After high school, Lisa went to Westfield State University, where she received her teaching degree in 1990. As an intern, she worked several shifts as a counselor at a children's camp and also taught Sunday school at her church. After that, she took a job as a teacher's aide at Agawam High School, where she had once studied herself. She spent most of her time working with a group of children with special needs. At the age of 24, she understood her students better than any other teacher. At the same time, she was very professional and tried to ensure that each of her students received the best education possible. She also worked part-time at the local card and gift store in the evenings. On Wednesday, April 15, 1992, she finished her shift at school at about half past five and went to the store where she worked until 9 p.m. At about 5.30 p.m., her sister Lynn briefly came in to work with her. According to her recollection, Lisa was in a good mood that evening, and nothing foretold trouble. The next morning, saleswoman Sophia Maynard arrived at the store and was scheduled to begin her shift at 9 o'clock. To her surprise, Lisa's car was in the parking lot. It was strange because the girl worked at school in the mornings and was not supposed to be in the store. In the place of classes, there was a light on inside and a sign on the door that was open. Sophia thought that Lisa might have been out for the morning shift due to the approaching Easter. They were planning to inflate balloons for sale for that holiday. Sophia walked into the store and called Lisa by name, but there was no response. When she approached the counter, she saw Lisa's things there, including her wallet and car keys. It all looked very strange, so Sophia decided to call the police. A squad arrived at the store and began their inspection. Everything looked normal in the main part of the premises, but there was a creepy opening in the back. The officer saw several crushed boxes with traces of blood on them. Later, they found several cards scattered on the floor, which also had blood on them. They also found a small dent in the door, which they thought might have been left by a heel strike. Despite all this, they were unable to find any useful leads on the store premises. It soon became known that Lisa had also failed to show up at school that morning. The principal even called her mother to ask if everything was okay, but her mother did not know where her daughter was either. The news of Lisa's disappearance quickly spread through the small town, and within hours, all of her friends, relatives, and acquaintances were on the case. The first thing the police did was to work up a theory of robbery, but that theory immediately fell away. No one had touched the money in Lisa's cash register or wallet, and all the merchandise was also there. Subsequently, detectives began to reconstruct the chronology of events that evening. They learned that Lisa's sister had left the store at about 6 p.m. After talking to employees at neighboring stores, they obtained more information. At about 7.20 p.m., Lisa spoke with the owner of the carpet store next door. They discussed a pressing problem with the local parking lot, which was being occupied by bowling alley customers. The owner told her that he himself would not risk voicing his displeasure with the drivers who parked in front of their stores because many of them, he said, were crazy and dangerous. He and Lisa talked for about 15 minutes, after which he went home. After examining the cash register, police determined that the last time money had been deposited into it was at 8.20 p.m. Detectives also found a woman who entered the store around 9.05 p.m. The door was open, but the clerk never came out. The woman thought she heard some noise from the back room but decided to leave. Thus, the police established the approximate window of Lisa's disappearance at 8.20 p.m. 
she served her last customer, and by 9 o'clock, something had happened to her. The detectives were determined to find out what had happened in those 40 minutes. Local investigators were assisted by the FBI and state police. Together, they organized a massive search effort. Foot squads combed the area surrounding the store, helicopters searched the more distant terrain, and police dogs were brought to the store in the hope of picking up Lisa's trail. Unfortunately, none of these efforts yielded any results. Investigators understood that Lisa had clearly not left the store of her own free will. On April 17th, two days after her disappearance, the head of the local police announced a reclassification of the case. It was now being investigated as a kidnapping. On Sunday morning, April 19th, all local churches prayed for Lisa to be found alive and unharmed. It was Easter, but there was no holiday spirit at all. At around 2 p.m., the police received a call. A man walking his dog on the outskirts of town near Highway 75 noticed a woman's body while walking along a wooded area. He immediately contacted law enforcement officers, who arrived on the scene and identified Lisa Seeger. They found multiple wounds on her body from a sharp object. Later, medical experts determined that the girl had also been abused. Her body was found approximately 5 kilometers from the store, suggesting that the perpetrator likely drove her there in a car. Detectives immediately cordoned off the area and proceeded with caution to avoid compromising potential evidence. It had been raining in those days, leaving several tire tracks on the soaked dirt road. Unfortunately, the police were unable to find any guns or other tangible evidence. The news that Lisa was the victim of an unknown brutal killer quickly spread throughout the city. A farewell service was held at the church where Lisa taught on Sundays, attended by nearly a thousand people. Residents of the small town, accustomed to a quiet and safe life, fell into a state close to panic. Many shopkeepers eliminated single shifts, and colleagues walked each other to their cars. Self-defense classes became overcrowded, and about 300 women applied for permits to own firearms. The whole town feared that the unknown criminal might strike again. The police and FBI worked on the case almost around the clock. They managed to obtain a DNA sample from the crime scene that might belong to the killer. They explored the theory that Lisa's boyfriend was involved but he had an alibi and his DNA did not match the sample. DNA testing was conducted on friends, co-workers, and relatives of the girl, again with no matches. The police received numerous tips from local residents, some reporting sightings of a suspicious car on the night of Lisa's murder. Others claimed to know the name of the culprit. However, all these leads led nowhere, and detectives sifted through them. From the tire tracks on the road near where the body was found, the police determined that they had been left by a van or large SUV. Detectives questioned all drivers of similar vehicles but were no closer to catching the perpetrator. However, they did find a witness who may have seen the same vehicle. An employee of a store near where Lisa worked was driving home at around 9.15 p.m. While standing at a traffic light, she saw a large SUV pulling off the road and heading toward the place where Lisa's body would later be found. The woman could not provide a detailed description of the car due to the darkness but noted that she believed there was a man and a woman in the car. She also mentioned the odd fact that when the car pulled into the dirt road, the woman's head was twitching unnaturally, as if she were asleep or unconscious. Unfortunately, this information also did not lead to a suspect, have since come to an end. The police continued to work on the case, but with each passing month, hope of solving this macabre mystery faded. A year and a half passed before Lisa's family and friends were given a new chance to discover the truth. In October 1993, national television aired an episode devoted to the caves. The popular program filmed stories about unsolved cases, which drew enormous attention to them. Sometimes, this led to new witnesses coming forward to the police, and the case got a second wind. Lisa's case was no exception. Within an hour of the broadcast, the police received several hundred calls from people who had some kind of information. As is usually the case, most of these leads led nowhere, but the police worked through each and every one of them. According to the detective, they were able to identify a few valuable leads, but they did not specify which ones. Unfortunately, it also went nowhere. As the years went by, the chances of solving the case steadily declined. Lisa's family went to great lengths to ensure that her legacy was not forgotten. Although her teaching career was cut short early on, Lisa's relatives made a major contribution to the Agawam education system. In 1995, her parents donated $11,000 to the science division of the school where Lisa worked. These funds went to buy equipment and support genetics classes. The parents also set up a fund to help gifted students, which distributed about $35,000 in awards. Ten years had passed since Lisa's murder. Her mother had not given up hope that the case would ever be solved. She went to great lengths to support the memory of her daughter. 
her mother took part in every interview, answered reporters' questions, and every year she gathered hundreds of people to honor Lisa's memory and light candles. Meanwhile, the police had only one piece of significant evidence on their hands, a DNA sample from the alleged killer. They kept checking it against known criminal databases, hoping that the right person would turn up sooner or later. But year after year, it didn't. In September 2016, 24 years after Lisa's murder, investigators decided to try a new method, DNA phenotyping. Its essence is the following, based on the information embedded in a person's DNA, experts determine the features of their appearance and build an assumed portrait. Using DNA, specialists can find out the sex, approximate age, eye and hair color. The portrait generated from this data is not always accurate, but sometimes the coincidence with the face of a real person is amazing. Based on the DNA of Lisa's alleged killer, experts presented two portraits of the suspect, one at age 25 and another at age 50. When the police department published these portraits, they received more than 170 calls. These people reported seeing a similar man, but most of these leads also led nowhere. Only a year later, on September 18, 2017, the police suddenly made a high-profile announcement the perpetrator had been arrested. He turned out to be a 49-year-old man named Gary Shara. The news instantly went viral throughout the American media. Cases where the police find the killer after a quarter of a century are very rare, so such stories immediately attract a huge amount of public attention. Immediately after Shara's arrest, investigators revealed how they had managed to track him down. It turned out that the man had been considered a suspect back in 1993, a year after Lisa's murder. Remember that program on national television after which the police received hundreds of calls with potential leads. One of the callers was a lawyer from Seattle. He told detectives that his client might have information about Lisa's murder. She was a woman who was in the process of divorcing her husband. They lived in a town called Longmeadow, which was near Agawam. According to the woman, her husband was showing increased attention to Lisa Seedert's case. If this murder was on television, he would run into the room and stare blankly at the screen, totally unresponsive to those around him. As you may have realized, this man was Gary Shara. He was 24 years old at the time. He was in a very troubled marriage and had a one-year-old son. He and his wife were constantly fighting and had already begun divorce proceedings shortly after the birth of their child. According to the police statement, they had worked out the theory that Gary was involved back in 1993 but found no evidence to support it. On the contrary, his ex-wife, as a source of information, raised doubts. The fact is that she had a whole list of mental disorders as well as a long history of alcohol abuse. Moreover, during the divorce, Gary obtained custody of their son through the courts, but his wife secretly removed the child to another state. Another important fact to add here is that this was by no means the first time that former or current wives had called the police, saying that their husbands might be involved in Lisa's murder. Surprisingly, there were indeed many such calls. So, the detectives thought that Gary's case was just one of those. Even so, they questioned him, but the man denied his involvement and refused to give a DNA sample. No one could legally force him to give a sample, so the police essentially had no other options. Later, detectives compiled a list of all the men questioned in the case who refused to give a DNA sample. Gary was among them, and the police called him in for questioning several more times. During the third interview in 2008, it was apparent that Gary was trying not to touch anything, not even the table. He was offered a bottle of water, but he refused. He looked as if he had only one thing on his mind, how the cops wouldn't get his DNA sample. By 2017, detectives had a list of 11 suspects on their hands, including Gary. All of them had been interviewed at various stages of the investigation and refused to voluntarily submit to DNA testing. In fact, there were many more suspects on that list, but through DNA phenotyping, investigators were able to weed out unsuitable candidates. They did not match some of the characteristics that experts determined from the DNA sample of Lisa's killer. In August 2017, detectives gathered all available information and went to court. They asked for an order compelling all the list members to provide DNA samples, and the court agreed. On September 13th of that same year, police went to Gary's apartment to notify him of this obligation, but the man was not home. The door was opened by his neighbor, with whom they shared an apartment. The detectives left him their business card and asked him to give the information to Gary urgently. The very next day, something unexpected happened. Gary's current girlfriend came to the police station and reported that he had left three letters in her apartment. To the researcher's surprise, among them was an apology to the Seedert family and a detailed confession of Lisa's murder on two sheets. Gary wrote that he had had violent and uncontrollable desires in him since childhood. He was obsessed with thoughts of kidnapping and abuse. That evening, as he drove past Lisa, Gary, as he himself articulated in a letter, allowed himself to do something horrible. The man specified that he did not plan to kill Lisa, but events allegedly got out of his control. Gary wrote that he wanted to surrender to the police hundreds of times but could not do so because of cowardice. 
he stated that he had lived with self-loathing all these years. At the end of the letter, he stated that he planned to end his life. Police immediately began searching for Gary, and soon his car was spotted in the parking lot of a hospital in Stafford Springs. There was another suicide note on the windshield. It turned out the man had ingested some powerful drugs but got in his car immediately afterwards and rushed to the nearest hospital, where he was pumped out. As soon as the doctors were finished helping him, the police arrested Gary and took him to the station. At the same time, a judge issued a search warrant for his apartment as well as his girlfriend's apartment. There, the police seized several objects containing his DNA. The result of the analysis surprised no one, a complete match with the sample of the killer. Along with that, detectives uncovered several other potentially significant leads. Gary's wife, who had reported suspicions about him back in 1993, passed away in 2014. However, investigators were able to find documents drafted by her lawyer where the woman revealed many gruesome details. One day, Gary told her in plain language that he could not engage in intimacy with her unless he had a knife in his hand. The day after Lisa's murder, the woman called her sister and told her that Gary had come home late at night, was extremely disturbed, and his body was covered with scratches. He also gave his wife a music box and said that he had bought it at the very store where Lisa worked, except, according to Gary himself, it was an older woman with gray hair who sold it to him. The problem is that no such employee has ever been there. It is not clear why all these details were not reported to the police in 1993, and it is impossible to find out now. While in custody, Gary suddenly proclaimed his innocence and refused to confess to what he had done. In all likelihood, he was driven by simple fear. But with that kind of evidence, there was no chance of getting away with it. The only thing he was able to achieve was a postponement of his sentence. The trial was not to begin until two years later, but Gary, who had been in a cell the whole time, suddenly decided to confess. On September 21, 2019, he appeared before a judge and pleaded guilty to the murder of Lisa Seeger. This charge qualified as first-degree murder, and in Massachusetts, a defendant on such a sentence faces life in prison without parole. Lisa's family was present in the courtroom. Her mother, who had hoped for 25 years to learn the truth, spoke. She thanked everyone involved in the investigation, as well as the ordinary concerned people who had supported her family all this time. As a result, the killer went to live out the rest of his life behind bars. One of the state's longest-running criminal cases was officially closed. Despite the fact that it took a quarter of a century, the bitter truth in such a case is anything better than endless ignorance. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe. Click on one of the two videos on your screen for more content like this.